Lethal Trade, an original crime thriller story, set in the underbelly of Detroit, by the author, Declan Connor. Chapter 1 The First Night of Seven Who would have thought that a flip of the coin decision would have led me to find out who I really was? I couldn't even tell you the name of the diner where I ended up. All I knew was that I was on the outskirts of Midtown, Detroit. I dodged inside to get out of the rain which was now bucketing it down. A guy who I assumed was the owner, he walked from the kitchen area to the till. With the scowl he sent my way, it was obvious the guy behind the counter didn't like the look of me. Maybe he thought I was out to rob him at that late hour. The guy picked up a baseball bat from under the counter, moved it to a shelf near the till. People always telegraphed that they were alert when I was around. In daylight, they'd shuffle around me like I was dog crap. At night, they'd cross the street. It's like I had killer branded on my forehead. I pulled the hut of my sweatshirt off of my head and eased onto a bench at the table near to the door. Pushed over to the window with my arm over the seat. It was better for me positioned that way. Sitting sideways, I could keep one eye on the door. Maybe I should have been at home in bed. Or maybe I should have been sat on my couch, watching football and downing a can of beer. Except, I didn't own a bed or a couch. Hell, I didn't have a roof over my head to call my own anymore. At least not now the cops had me pegged for a double homicide back at Fort Bragg. That problem would have to wait. Right there and then, I had other priorities, with a job in Detroit that needed putting to bed. What can I get you? The server asked. Just a coffee, black, no sugar. The server was attractive. Dressed to garner tips, wearing a short miniskirt and a white blouse with the top buttons unfastened, displaying her ample cleavage. It clung to her breasts, showing the outline of her nipples on her bra, and I averted my gaze. The place stunk of grease with the sort of thick smell that you just know will cling to your clothes. She wiggled her backside over to the counter for all she was worth. I could have saved her the trouble. I was a bad tipper. The only other customer in the diner slammed a slider down his throat. His stare fixed on the server's ass. You could see the lech in his eyes. More coffee, he called out. She walked to his table and poured him his coffee. You doing anything later, doll? He asked, and patted her ass cheek, then gave it a squeeze. Her cheeks reddened. She sent him a false smile and pushed away his hand, then edged away as he tried to put his arm around her waist. Yeah, I have to get home to my kids, she said, like a diplomat probably protecting her tip. He was balding, fat, and ugly. I knew the type from the way he tried to grope her. The type that made my blood boil. Fat guy said a supercilious grin at her, then rolled his tongue over his top lip. Hey, where's my coffee? I called out. Sorry, coming right up. An expression of relief rolled over her face. She smiled at me. My eyes drifted to her name tag. There was no surname, just her first name, Maria. Fat guy huffed and said, Who gave you permission to butt in, fella? I sent him a get lost stare, but otherwise I didn't respond. The last thing I wanted was to draw attention from the cops. She stepped between us and blocked my view. The guy just wouldn't let it pass. Fat guy called out, You deaf fella, or just pig ignorant interrupting me? I wasn't deaf, but maybe he had poor eyesight, or he was drunk. She interrupted. I guess she was hoping I'd let it go. Not seen you around here before. Where are you from? She asked, setting down a mug, then poured my coffee. Just a minute. Step aside, I said, and shuffled my backside to the edge of the seat and fixed the guy's stinky-eyed glare. Carry on bad-mouthing me and disrespecting the lady and I'll tear your head from your shoulders, then shove your head up your ass. Got it, fella? Whatever, he said. The guy behind the counter picked up his baseball bat. Slammed it on the counter. Hey, play nice, boys. Fat guy chicken first. He lowered his gaze and grunted, then gripped his coffee mug. I glanced at the server. Now then, what were you saying? You live around here, Maria asked me, and sent me a disarming smile. Just passing through, I said. We close in ten minutes. You're lucky. It's almost stopped raining. Lucky. That was the last word I'd considered hanging on a tag around my neck as to where I was at. I picked up my drink and took a sip. 
How long have you been in Detroit? Maria asked. Just arrived, I said. You staying near here? The questions were grating. I guessed I was lucky after all as I looked out of the window over my shoulder. The rain had stopped. Five minutes, and I'd be out of there before the grease did permanent damage to the only clothes I had with me. Yeah, I'm staying near here, I lied. Can I have the check? I need to get going. Sure. Truth was, it was too late to find my ex-army buddy's home. By the time I downed my coffee, she dropped the check on the table. That's it, we're closing, the guy behind the counter called out. You can go home, Maria. I'll lock up. I need you to work a double shift tomorrow. Claire's just phoned in sick. Maria nodded. I pulled out some bills and loose change from my pocket. It could have been Maria mentioning her kids to fat guy. Anyways, I left a decent tip. I shuffled my butt off of the bench seat and then walked outside. There was still some drizzle, so I pulled my hood over my head. Across the street I saw a doorway with an alcove on a boarded up building and trotted across. Looking up and down the street, all the shops were boarded up or shuttered and covered in graffiti. Not one street light worked. The diner was the last business standing in the street and the only one providing any light. I hunkered down to a crouch. Fat guy walked out first and climbed into a two-tone pinto. Maria walked out, popping her umbrella, then set off walking. Call it sixth sense, but fat guy not starting his engine set me in alert mode. I glanced down the street. Maria had arrived at a bus stop a block down. The lights extinguished in the diner. A roller shutter closed. A short while later a car door slammed. An SUV set off from the parking lot with its headlights briefly illuminating the Pinto. No sign of fat guy through the windshield. He must have ducked. The SUV drove off in the opposite direction to where Maria waited. Some boss. She must have been desperate to have worked in the greasy diner. I wouldn't have let any woman of mine work in a rundown area. Not in Detroit. Not anywhere. Not that I had a woman. Women and me didn't mix. Only for mutual gratification. Especially not in my situation. I had nothing to offer long term. The Pinto engine started, then drove out of the lot with side lights glowing. I guessed his game. He crawled along the block. Pulled over to the bus stop. I saw the driver's door open. Maria stood back and retracted her umbrella. Both her hands held it like a broad sword, and she backed off from his car. Fat guy climbed out of the driver's side. I couldn't hear what he said, but he swayed his hand as a signal for her to get into the car. He looked up the street away from me, and I ducked into the alcove. When I looked out again in their direction, he threw his hands in the air as if annoyed. He charged at her like a linebacker, brushing the umbrella aside, then pushed her into an alley. I set off at a sprint. By the time I arrived, he had her pinned against the wall under a fire ladder, choking her with one hand and punching her with his other fist. She raked his face with her nails. Bitch. Fat guy head butted her. Hey, slimeball. It was all the words he was going to get from me. He let go of her. She slid down the wall, whimpering. I was already on him, sinking my fist into his belly. Didn't want to knock him out. I wanted him to feel every blow of the anger I felt inside. He doubled over, winded. I grabbed his head with both hands. Forced it down and dug my knee into his chin in one movement. Stepped back. He collapsed to the ground. I sidestepped around him. For good measure, I sank my boot into his flab around his upper leg. Dead leg, he wasn't going to be running away anytime soon. Covering his face with his hands, he curled up in a defensive ball. Please, you can have her. She's been teasing me for weeks. His pathetic excuse only inflamed me more. I rolled him over. Straddled his chest and pulled his hands from his face, then pinned his arms with my knees. Pounded his face with my fists in a flurry, like a cage fighter. Light from a cell phone illuminated his face. His features were mashed in red raw, covered in blood, like the inside of a squashed melon. I jumped off of him and glanced at Maria. Don't go phoning the police. Not until I'm gone. I. I'm not. 
The police won't come around here. They don't give a damn since the city went bankrupt. I'm phoning my babysitter. The bankruptcy explained why the street lights were out. Fat guy wasn't out of it. He was groaning. I helped her to her feet. Save the call until you're on the bus. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I can't thank you enough. She didn't look fine. Maria was pumped up, shaking from head to toe. Listen, if you phone the police later, don't give them my description. I doubt this guy will bother you again if you decide not to call them. She was unsteady on her feet. I helped her out of the alley. Her lip was split, and she was still shaking. Me? I wasn't even breaking a sweat. The bus lights dazzled. It screeched to a halt, and the door sucked open. Hi. I don't know your name, she said, as she climbed onto the bus. It's best you don't know. The door sucked to a close. I watched as the bus pulled away, and it disappeared around a corner at the bottom of the street. I heard shuffling behind me, and turned. Fat guy was at the entrance to the alley. He was propped upright. One hand against the wall. His other hand held a hunting knife. You're dead meat now, fella, he said. He'd made my day. Now I wouldn't feel so guilty. Not that it was anything I'd ever experienced. He lunged at me, striking downward. I caught his wrist, twisted, then brought his arm up his back. I slammed his face against the brick wall, at the same time bending his wrist. He dropped the knife. Stooping, I picked up the knife. Span him around. The guy grabbed my neck in a vice-like grip. He was strong. Too strong. I felt as though I'd pass out. Call it instinct in training, or self-preservation if you like, but the blade ended up to the hilt just below his rib cage. His eyes bulged as I thrust the blade upward, then twisted on the handle. He folded, his fingers slipping from my neck as his life deserted him. It wasn't exactly stand-your-ground territory with my skills, but that would be my story if I needed one. I dragged him into the alley. Dropped him behind a dumpster with the rest of the trash. Using his shirt flap, I wiped the handle. Stuck it back in his wound. Wrapped his hand around the knife handle. The dumpster was overflowing and stunk like it was abandoned. I covered his body with trash, then set off walking to his car. I stopped at a broken drain pipe and rinsed my hand under a trickle of water. With luck I hoped the rats would eat away at any DNA I'd left behind that the drizzle didn't wash away. The keys were in the ignition. I slid onto the seat. Fired up the engine, then drove off along the street. Twenty blocks on, I turned into a driveway to an abandoned mill and drove around back, then parked. I flicked the switch for the vanity light. Down in the foot space my foot caught something. Looking down, I saw handcuffs and a roll of duct tape. Fat guy attacking Maria didn't look as though it was spur-of-the-moment lust. I pulled my sleeve over my hand and wiped around, paying attention to the steering wheel and gear shift. In no particular hurry, I locked the door. Launched the keys into some bushes. Burying my cut knuckles in my pockets, I set off walking. I'd only walked maybe ten blocks, when I had one of those oh crap sinking feelings. Red and blue lights flashed in the reflection of the store window. I carried on walking, when I heard the car stop behind me to a short sharp blast of the siren, and the car door clunked open. Police, hands out of pockets where I can see them. Face the wall if you know what's good for you. It was looking as though when Maria said I was lucky back at the diner, that my good fortune had just run out. Chapter 2 I carried on walking along the sidewalk a few steps. Police! You heard me. Face the wall. Real slow, with hands out of pockets. I turned sideways. Those extra steps placed me at some advantage. The store window in front of me was behind a metal grill. It wasn't exactly a wall. Maybe the cop hadn't noticed. I reached up and grabbed at the diamond-shaped wrought ironwork with the fingers of both hands. He didn't need to give me any orders. I knew the drill and spread my legs apart. Pearls of raindrops on the glass lit up like fairy lights in the glare of his headlights. It didn't stop me seeing his reflection as he stalked up behind me. He approached, pointing his weapon two-handed. If he was a rookie, 
He'd read the textbook and then added some. I glanced at his patrol car. He didn't have a partner. As he stepped to one side, I got a better look. He had some age. Maybe in his late forties. The cop didn't look as though he'd succumbed to having a donut belly that most of them suffer in middle age. He was lean, with around a six-inch height advantage. Whatcha doing around here at this time of night? I'm lost. He pulled the hood off of my head. You're white. He'd sounded surprised. It didn't need an answer. He frisked me, shoulders to ankles. What's your name? Joyce. I could feel the barrel of his gun between my shoulder blades. He thrust his hand up between my legs and tugged at my crotch, feeling around for a concealed weapon. You don't feel like no Joyce. Yeah, well you don't act like no cop I've ever known, drawing a gun and searching me without probable cause, I should add. Why'd you stop me? He ignored my question. It was just my luck to get a smart-ass cop on a power trip. Maybe he was thinking about the article I'd read that Detroit City Hall were reducing all public employee wages. Got anything in your pockets I should know about? Needles, that kind of stuff? No, just some money, a bus ticket, and the address where I'm staying. His fingers slipped into my jeans pockets. I felt violated. He teased out the contents. Don't move. He stepped back, holstered his gun, flicked on his flashlight. I could have taken him down. But what good would that have done? It was no good worrying about the body I'd left behind the dumpster twenty or so blocks down. No one had seen me take out Fat Guy, and he hadn't mentioned a homicide. At least not yet he hadn't. The time to make a move was if the cuffs came out. The cop said, Fort Bragg, North Carolina to here. One way. Explain to me why you lost. You can also tell me where you got those cuts from on your knuckles. I didn't owe him an explanation, but it was game on to spin him a yarn. I'm visiting a buddy. He was meant to collect me. The bus broke down, so I arrived late. Four hours late. Some guys at the end of the line gave me directions to my buddy's address. You should have his address there on a folded note. One of the guys said it was only a walk. They jumped me. Took my wallet with all my credit cards and military ID. He looked down at my boots. You are me? Yeah. Why didn't you report the incident? No time. Besides, they won't be messing with anyone else tonight. I was sure I heard him snicker. I guess that explains the cuts on your knuckles, he said. Turn around and relax. He passed me my things. He'd answered his own question. There was no point in me putting him straight. Do you want to report the mugging? Nah, it's only paperwork. I can replace the ID and credit cards. The cards are maxed out anyways. His brow furrowed. I could tell he was chewing over what I'd said. I didn't like to have mentioned the military, but I thought it might sweeten matters. I heard it before I saw it in my peripheral vision. Another patrol car appeared, lights flashing, siren blazing. I wondered if someone had seen me take out Fat Guy, or the cops in Fort Bragg had a fix on me. The patrol car stopped and the cop leaned out of the window to speak to the other officer. Why call in a code for and go it alone? You should have waited for me, the cop in the car said. No need, false alarm. This guy's white. The cop who stopped me turned to face in my direction. Yeah, paperwork, bane of my freaking life, he said, as if we had a connection. His lips curled into a lopsided smile. The heavens opened. It's not safe to be walking unarmed around here. If you give me the punk's descriptions, I can look out for them. I glanced up to the sky, the rain pepper spraying my face, then looked back at him. I doubt they'll be on the streets in this. Besides, it happened way back in the city, I said. I noticed you didn't have a cell on you. Did they take it? he asked, when he was interrupted. His radio crackled to life, followed by the dispatcher's metallic voice. Cars in Midtown, a 1030 audible and visual from 708B Veteran Avenue. The Carter residence. He stepped forward next to me and turned, standing with his back to the grill to avoid the rain. The cop tugged at the radio microphone fastened to his lapel. Pulled it to his lips. Car 93, check, he said, 
Then the dispatcher replied. Priority 1. Car 93, and cars responding to Veteran Avenue. The responsible is the same as before, described as a BM, about 35 years old, 5'11", 180, wearing a dark blue sweatshirt with hood, and blue jeans. That's our guy, said the cop in the patrol car. No code for this time. We'll tackle the run together. The cop in the car picked up his microphone. Car 82, check. Priority 1 with 93, he said to an immediate response from the dispatcher. Copy that. The guy's details from the dispatcher explained why he'd stopped me, gun drawn. Apart from their suspect being a black male, his height, weight, and clothing were similar to my description. The cop turned to face me and lifted his collar. Stay safe, he said, and scuttled back to his car, mumbling into his radio. I watched as they did U-turns in their patrol cars, lights flashing. The rain was now pounding the asphalt, which was doing its best to bounce it back, but it was losing. Maria from the diner was right. I was lucky. Only this time, I was soaked through to the skin and lucky. I pulled the hood over my head. The cop could have taken me in to check out my ID. He have found out my name wasn't Joyce, and I wasn't in the army. At least, not now I wasn't, unofficially. I noticed a derelict house across the road. A realtor's for sale sign was nailed to the boards over one of the windows. I'd been wondering where I could bed down. The rain had made the decision for me. Head down, I ran across the road and up to the front door. A deluge was draining off the canopy, so I sidestepped to make my way around back. There was no need to kick in the back door. Someone had beaten me to it and busted the lock. I pushed the door open, stepped inside, and listened. The stench of damp was overpowering. I had to remind myself that it was better to be there and free rather than spending the night in a cell, waiting for them to find out who I was. My eyes adjusted to the dark. I was standing in what could have been the kitchen. There were telltale signs where cupboards had been removed, leaving marks on the wall, and a drainage pipe where the sink would have been. The room was stripped cleaner than a leg of chicken down to the bone. I opened a door to a corridor. It was pitch black inside. Anyone here? Only my own words called back to me. I couldn't see the point of looking around the place. I had an exit, and some modicum of light. There was a stool with a leg missing on the floor. I picked it up and leaned it against the door. Stepping over to a corner, I dropped to a crouch, my eyes fixed on the entrance. It was soon clear that I didn't have company and so I lay on the floorboards in the fetal position. I'd slept in worse conditions. Sleep was hard to come by with my clothing damp. It was also bugging me that I'd written Greg's telephone number down wrong for my cell before I'd sent it on a bus ride in the opposite direction to where I was going. I prayed that he wouldn't open the crate in front of his wife that I'd had shipped to his address. I should have told him what I had in mind. Worse, I hoped that he wouldn't do anything illegal that would have the authorities find what was inside. Chapter 3 Cracking open one eye, then the other, I stirred. Shivering from head to toe, I hauled myself up to my feet. Wiped the dust from my jeans and sweatshirt, then stepped over to the door. Removed the stool and pulled on the handle. Outside, the air was sweet in contrast to the dank odor of the room I'd just left. Dawn had broken and the sky was clear of clouds. I was peeved at Greg not waiting for me at the bus terminal. We're not supposed to leave our buddies behind. That's the code we're meant to live by, unless the success of the mission dictates otherwise. To say my visit was to help him in his hour of need. Him not being there at the terminal didn't bode well for what I thought wasn't exactly a friendship, but an understanding. Friends were someone to mourn over. We're all expendable. Passing onto your maker was an ill-timed flick of an eyelid in my line of work. Mourning wasn't in my repertoire. Neither was garnering friends a pastime of mine. But then I still needed his sanctuary. Besides, he had something of mine. Something I couldn't afford to get into the wrong hands. Not only that, he might have information tucked away in his brain as to why two of our old unit could have turned up in their apartments that was now a homicide investigation. Ten dollars and thirty-five cents, I counted out from the contents of my pockets. It was enough to buy breakfast, but not enough for a taxi to the outskirts. Once I had directions, I'd have to hump it to Greg's home. 
At least I was traveling light and wouldn't have the burden of a ruck on my back. My mouth tasted like the inside of a sewer. I walked around the front of the house and onto the street. It would have been better to put some mileage between me and the alley where I'd left the stiff. Call it stupid, but the need for a coffee and directions had me heading along the sidewalk toward the greasy diner. The streets were deserted, just the odd car passing by. If the area looked desolate at night, it was depressing by day. Not only had the street lights been out of action, but now I could see litter strewn around. The city really was in a downward spiral. A homeless bum appeared from an alley. The old man pushed a cart along the sidewalk. He crossed over the road as if his head was on a pivot, with his eyes glued to me. He was talking, but not to me. Maybe his vision was saying to me, change your lifestyle, or this is what you'll end up as. At least that's what ran through my mind. It wasn't just the scenery that had a dark cloud shrouding me. I was in a fix that needed to be resolved. I wasn't the type to run away from situations, but I had a mission. Maybe it was the psychopath in me. I was good at toughing things out by lying and cheating. Not through practice. It was a trait that came naturally. But when you only have the truth for protection, it was damn frustrating. Greg had given me a way to sidestep the problem for now. But it wasn't going to go away. The problem would have to be faced, but on my terms. The diner came into view. I stopped at the parking lot entrance. There was an SUV, two pickup trucks, and a police car out front. Scenarios raced through my mind. I wondered if Maria had reported the incident. Maybe they found Fat Guy's corpse and they were making inquiries. There again, maybe they simply needed a caffeine fix. The door to the diner opened and two cops walked outside. My questions remained unanswered as I bent down. Pretended to fasten my boot lace. They would have the answers, but I wasn't about to walk up to them and ask them outright. There was nowhere to hide. If they had my description, they'd seen me for sure. I decided to hide in plain sight, so I stood, eyes front, and walked right on past them. I heard their car move out of the lot as I opened the door. Standing in the vestibule, I caught sight of Maria clearing a table. It was some surprise that she turned in early after last night's fiasco. She glanced my way and I signaled her to join me. Hi, why don't you come inside, she said, holding the door open. I stood my ground. About last night. Have you reported it to the cops? No, why? Doesn't matter. What about your boss? Not had time. I've only just arrived. He's busy cooking breakfasts. Her lipstick left a ridge on her top lip where it was cut. She looked presentable apart from a red lump on her forehead. I'll have a coffee, I said, and Maria stepped aside as I walked on through. I'd at least like a name on a second date, she said. Tom, Dick, or Harry crossed my mind, but it wasn't worth lying. You know the drill, best you don't know. In fact, best you forget that last night happened. Tell your boss that you fell down the stairway. Your call. The coffee's on me. No trouble. I'll pay my way. I took a seat at the table by the door and picked up the menu. Maybe I should have accepted her offer. I was a dollar short of what I wanted, counting her tip. She poured me a coffee. Anything else? Yeah, I'll have bacon and egg in a burger bun. Over easy for the egg, but cremate the bacon. Oh, yeah, and ask your boss if he has a local map. Sure. Her talking as if last night was a kind of first date got me to thinking. She was the type I'd go for in the right circumstances. Now wasn't the right time. I watched her lift the counter and walk through to the kitchen. Her boss looked through the kitchen hatch at me and smiled. By his actions last night, in his mind, I had been the bum thinking of robbing his till. Today... I was his regular customer putting gas in his tank. I have a map behind the counter. Maria will get it for you. I tipped him a one-fingered salute, tapping my forehead. What I'd like to have done was to slap the smile from his face for not giving Maria a ride home yesterday. Maria hurried back from the kitchen carrying two plates and set them down on the next table to me. The food was steaming and piled high. I watched one of the guys dig in with his fork. He stuffed some hash brown with egg yolk dripping from the hash into his crumb catcher. 
It's what I would have ordered if I had the money. I had to look away as he swiped his tongue across his lips. The wall clock afforded some distraction. The battery had almost died. The minute hand was struggling in an uphill battle to leave the 45 position and kept jettering back. Maria dropped the map on the table. She looked as though she'd learned a lesson. She was dressed classy if you ignored the iron shine on her black skirt, with the hem below her knees. Her plain maroon blouse was buttoned to her neck. Her beauty was natural. There was no need to flaunt it by flashing her jugs. If the tight-ass owner supplied pinafores it would have helped. You look like you've slept on a park bench, she said. Sort of. Your clothes are damp. Look, if you don't have anywhere to stay, I have a long Davenport at my apartment. Davenport? Sorry, I forgot, you're not from around here. It's what you'd call a sofa. I'd not given my clothes a second thought. She was right. I could smell the damp. Her offer was appreciated, and I could understand her being grateful. But really, she was naive. I might have been her white knight yesterday evening, but for all she knew, I could be her kiss of the Grim Reaper. Hell, I was a guy who wouldn't even give her my name. Thanks, but last night I was caught out. I have somewhere to stay today. Besides, I don't think your kids would appreciate waking up to a stranger in their home. Thanks for considering my kids. All the same, the offer's there. I'm sure Anna and Roberto would be okay with a visitor. A customer called her over. She stepped over to his table and poured him more coffee, then returned to my table. She appeared concerned. Do you want band-aids for those cuts on your knuckles? She asked me. They'll be fine. Best they get some air. She scurried off behind the counter. I unfolded the map. Looked up Greg's address. Found the location. One bacon and egg sandwich, said Maria. I lifted the map and she placed the plate on the table. She leaned forward and whispered. Listen, if you get caught out again, here's my number. She placed a folded note next to the plate and smiled. Thanks. I returned a faint smile and noticed her cheeks blush as I slipped the note into my pocket. She walked away to serve another table. I lifted the bun, with a fork ready poised to stab at the yolk. Damned egg was fried over well. I would have sent it back, but my stomach outvoted me. The sandwich was gone in a beat, and I drained the last of my coffee. I'll have the check, Maria. Maria eased off of a stool at the counter and walked over. I took the check from her. More coffee here, someone said, and she walked over to the table. The temptation was there to get to know her, to stay a while longer. I edged out of the seat, and standing, I dug deep in my pocket. I pulled out all my bills and change and left it with the check. Her back was facing me as she poured the guy's coffee. Goodbyes weren't my style. It was better I left the way I arrived, without ceremony. Besides, Greg not turning up was bugging me. I needed to get to his house for an explanation as to why he had me travel a distance only for him not to be there. Chapter 4 Head down, I set off walking toward Highland Park, not looking back. At the end of a two-hour hump along Woodward Avenue and approaching my destination, I decided Greg was a few cents short of a dollar. What had possessed him to buy a house around there defied belief. Every other house was a pile of arsonist's ash, or had been smashed down to the foundations with a wrecker's ball, leaving only vacant lots. A young African-American woman sat on the grass at the corner of his street. She was matchstick thin. The kind of look that gave the impression her arms would snap if she used them for purchase to stand. Her gaze stared straight through me as if I was in another dimension. I got the stuff. Want some, she said, flapping her arm and shaking a plastic bag. Digging my hands into my pockets, I quickened my pace and turned the corner. Freaking snowflake rang in my ears. You're missing good stuff, matchstick woman called out. The red brick Victorian house was set back off the street on its own. Greg's idea of renovation wasn't what I was expecting. Either side of stone steps leading to a central doorway, the bottom windows were boarded. It looked as though someone had used the house for target practice, raking rapid fire across the entire front with heavy rounds. In the driveway was a burned-out van. I could just about make out King Security Services sign written on the side. 
I knew he had problems, but it was looking like he was under siege with the hatches battened down. I hoped this wasn't going to be the third corpse of our old team that turned up, and I let out a sigh, not sure of what I'd find in there. Chapter 5 Knocking lightly on his door was getting me nowhere. Greg, you in there? I called out, pounding the bullet-splintered door with the side of my bald fist. I waited for him to answer, hoping he was still alive so I could return the favor I'd promised him. There again, if he was dead, it would save me the trouble, but add to my problems. He'd saved my life on a mission in Somalia to free hostages, taking a bullet in his leg for the trouble. I wouldn't normally give a crap. But when someone deliberately lays their life on the line to save your sorry ass, it's not something that you can forget. I guess it was a frailty of mine. Carrying that kind of a debt was a burden. Greg and my boss knew how I felt on the subject from the time we'd worked together. He'd called in his marker knowing I wouldn't refuse. I had a need to pay him back so the subject could be closed. I heard what sounded like footsteps tripping down a stairway. Yeah, yeah, man. Keep your shirt on. Chains rattled and hit the floor behind the door. Then I heard bolts sliding. The door opened. Get the hell inside, he said, while glancing nervously either side of the street. Greg grabbed hold of my sweatshirt and tugged me over the threshold. He had a pistol tucked into his waistband and an AK-47 on a strap around his shoulder. He slammed the door, bolted it, and fumbled around, securing a heavy chain to retainers bolted to the frame. The door was lined with a steel sheet. You could see the ridges where the metal had stopped the bullets. It wasn't the welcome from him I'd expected. What the hell's happening here? I'll tell you when we're safe upstairs. Is Rose up there? No, I've sent her to stay at her mom's home until this is all over. Sorry I missed your wedding, I said. Is that meant as sarcasm? Sorry you weren't invited, but we didn't have the money for a reception. No problem. When did all this happen, I asked, as I followed his fat ass up the stairway. Three months a civilian and he'd gained a good thirty pounds. The drive-by happened yesterday afternoon. They burned the van out last night. That's why I couldn't meet you. What's in the crate that arrived yesterday? Clothes, money, oh, and some assets to put an end to this. Where is it? The living room. Too heavy for me to carry it up here. He walked through into the bedroom and turned to me. Sorry to drag you into this man. He took my hand and we shared awkward manly shoulder nudges. I sat on the corner of the bed. His face looked gaunt, with his eyes bloodshot. It ain't no trouble. You gonna brief me? Your message was short and sweet. He dropped his backside on the mattress. Yeah, sure. He rolled his eyes and looked up at the ceiling. I'd never seen him look so dejected, even in some of the tight scrapes we'd encountered on missions. There was an edgy nervousness about him. In your own time. He sighed. I know you said I was mad to move here, but I thought living with my black ass among my own kind had fit better. I mean, where else could you buy a house for $5,500? Less of the like my kind. As I always say, there's always a reason for cheap prices. Yeah, don't remind me. Anyways, everything was fine. We set about refurbishing, and I set up my security business. It was tough, but it was all going great until last month. I eyeballed a robbery at one of the warehouses I was inspecting for clients down at the docks. Called in the police. They arrested the guys. The punks must have seen my van. That's when it all started. The intimidation and threats I told you about. Then two women stopped Rose in a shopping mall the day before the drive-by, just after I'd phoned you. Said if I turned up as a witness next week, she'd die. I sent her straight to her mom's and then all this crap happened. I chewed on my bottom lip. What about the cops? Police! In their words, they're dealing with it, but they haven't even responded to yesterday's arson attack. I must have telephoned them thirty times over the last four weeks. I think they're sick of me calling. It didn't surprise me. A local magazine article I'd read at the bus terminal said it all. The report complained about the city abandoning their run-down areas, with police and other services concentrating services on the better of the bad neighborhoods. Do you have the punk's coordinates? He tucked his fingers into his shirt pocket, 
then handed me a piece of paper with some addresses, a name, and some photographs. Yeah, this is where the gang hangs out. They also have a warehouse down near the river on Atwater. I followed them down there one night and took some photos. Leroy Gibson, a.k.a. Handbag. Where did the handbag name come from? Made some inquiries. He's their leader. The only rap sheet he has is for distributing fake designer handbags and purses. So he's the one we need to be paying a visit? Yeah, he's the one in on the photo with the Rasta locks. There were six of them in the photo. All of them had pistols tucked into their waistbands, and they were cradling or shouldering AK-47s. Each one was wearing some serious body armor. It didn't look as though it would be as simple as paying them a visit to warn them off like I'd thought. The cops allow this, I asked. Uniformed cops won't go near them. Don't be fooled by the handbag handle. From what I've heard, they're into extortion, stealing and cloning cars, and carrying out hits. They're also rumored to have some cops in their pocket. I was just hoping you could act as a bodyguard until after the trial. I shook my head. With a background like handbags, I doubted the cops would waste too much energy trying to find his killer if I put a bullet between his eyes. You're joking, right? He'd gone soft. I couldn't believe his strategy was to let them come to us and to strike a defensive pose. He knew the script. It had turned serious and they were calling the shots. Greg should have known that if you take the head off of the snake, its body will wriggle a little while longer until it finally dies out. It had been drilled into us enough times over the years by Lone Wolf, our commander. You know we need to take the fight to them? Yeah, but this isn't a rock where it's in and out with no questions asked, whatever the body count. He was fooling me saying it was nothing like the caliphate. Leastways, not with what I'd witnessed on the way there, and on the photos. Can't sit back and do nothing, I said. Yeah, but I've got a wife to think about now, remember? I'll be no good to Rose locked up. I'd seen that expression of weakness before that rolled over his face. It usually started with a serious relationship and intensified as they had kids. If it wasn't that, it was worrying about some guy poking your other half while you were on a mission. Crap happened like that, more often than we'd like to think. When that happened, the guys would usually go out for a revenge screw, and it would be all downhill from there. No worries. I'll work solo. You can go and stay at your mom-in-law's home for an alibi. I'll make sure nothing can come back to you. You want to think about moving to the in-laws permanently. Greg threw me a look. No chance, when everything I have is tied up here. What's the latest you have to be back at Sockham? he asked. Not sure I want to, or if I can go back. What does that mean? Come on, help me to empty the crate and I'll tell you. I followed him down the stairway and into the living room. He'd covered the crate with a cloth and added ornaments which gave it the appearance of a coffee table. You got a claw hammer? Yeah, give me five minutes, bro. It's under the sink. I looked around. He'd done the room proud with his decorating skills. It was a shame that the windows were smashed and the glass scattered around on the carpet. I moved the ornaments onto the sofa. Removed the cloth. The security tape hadn't been tampered with. Here, he said, and passed me the hammer. I pried open the lid. Greg peered over my shoulder. Holy crap, C4. How did you get that out? I threw him a sideways glance. Greg showed me his palms. I lifted my automatic rifle out of the crate and assembled it, then located the ammunition mag in place. Anyways, more to the point, as it turns out, I can't go back to Sockham. I'm in a heap of serious trouble. Don't josh me. What can be more serious than is happening here? I'm not joshing. They want to question me about Hank and Craig getting terminated. They arrested me at the scene. What? How? When? Quick succession after you'd phoned. They found Hank in his apartment, and they say they have a witness seeing someone of my description leaving after the last time he was seen alive. He was alive when I left. I'd been bunking down at Craig's apartment. When I returned home, the place was ransacked. Found Craig sat on the crapper. The door was open. One close quarter tapped to the chest and one to the head. Cops surrounded the place and arrested me. The gun was discarded on the floor in front of him. 
I didn't touch the gun, but then it was probably a burner they couldn't trace, and wiped clean. Then how in the hell did you get out? I never got to the police station. I'd phoned the base from Craig's apartment before they arrested me. Sockham pulled strings citing national security. Think about it. It's not every day two operators from the unit get tapped on home soil, and on the same day. Sent two cherry greenhorn MPs to pick me up. They'll have a headache and injured pride, that's all. Jesus. Terminated. Why would anyone have done that? I shrugged my shoulders, thinking it could be someone from the service, and I could be a target. The signatures they worked on them both were our style. It had to be someone they knew. Leastways, I had to use my key at Craig's. No sign of a forced entry. And I doubted someone would get the jump on Hank unless he knew them. The cops said there was no sign of a break-in at Hank's apartment, but his place was ransacked, same as at Craig's. Nothing of value was taken from either apartment. What do you think they were looking for? Beats me. I'm no cop. What are you gonna do? Get this mission over with and worry about it later. Although, it doesn't look as though a few loud bangs I had in mind are going to cut it to end all this. I doubt a few Fourth of July fireworks will frighten off the trash into not giving you any more crap. What do you think? Chapter 6 Greg shook his head, rose to his feet, then paced around the room. They'll suspect me for sure if you start World War III against them. Maybe you're right and I should pack my bags and just leave all this behind. Rose took all that she could carry in her car. It wouldn't be so bad if the VA had sorted out my disability claim. What I have left in the bank won't last for long, he said. If he hadn't taken the bullet for me, he could have carried on his term for his pension. He deserved better from the government. I was the nearest thing to government help he was going to get. Damn, if I didn't think he was playing me like a well-tuned violin. Maybe I should have told him that I cut my heartstrings long ago. He didn't need the sob story. How long will it take you to get to see Rose? Greg chewed on his lip. Two hours on the bus, he said. Good, keep the bus ticket. Make sure you talk with the driver. Take her for a meal tonight. Talk with the server. Use a card to pay the check. Around four in the morning, phone the police and report a break-in at your mom's. He gave a sideways glance in my direction. Is that when you're thinking of making a move? I raised an eyebrow. What do you think? I'm gonna need some transport, I said. There's a Harley in the basement, but I ain't got no title. Previous owners left it in the basement in pieces. I've fixed it up and it runs. Keys in the ignition and there's gas in the tank. That'll do. Greg sucked air through the gap in his bottom front teeth. You sure about this? Sure, I'm sure. The police will think it's gang-related. I'll abort if it gets out of hand and you can stay at the in-laws. One thing. After all this, don't attempt to get in contact. It'll be you and me all square. Now give me a hand to empty the crate. I dragged up my rucksack and the rest of the contents. What's in this box, he said, and gave it a shake. Improvisation. Couldn't get a hold of a real one. Open it. Greg tugged at the cardboard. A toy helicopter. No, it's a drone, you fool. Or it will be when you've added your expertise and fixed the night vision camera. Just make sure you wipe your prints when you've finished. I passed him the box with the mini camera. I'll add an explosive charge when you've finished for if I need to destroy it mid-flight. Leaving the ruck where it was, we carried the rest of the contents up to the bedroom. Greg twitched his nose. You need a shower, bro. You stink to high hell. Time for that later, I said. No, I mean you really honk. Do it now. A vision of Maria passed through my mind. Maybe that's what she would have said back at the diner if she'd have known me better. You didn't mind me smelling on exercises, I said. Yeah, well, there are all sorts of things you notice differently on the outside. How are you adjusting? I asked. It's difficult. I think it's worse for Rose. She doesn't understand sometimes when I crawl out of bed in the middle of the night and sleep on the floorboards. Or the times when I wander off on my own for hours on end. The worst thing is the disrespect out on the streets. All kids should do time in the services, 
he said. The last thing I expected Greg to suffer from was PTSD. We were whittled down to a specific breed at selection. Likely we had abnormal DNA that didn't allow for that crap to happen. I don't know about the disrespect, but, yeah, I used to get that with Renee before the unit plucked me out of the Rangers. Only I'd live things out in my sleep, like lying on the floor at the side of the bed trying to jack up a deuce and a half to change the tire. Greg laughed. Thank God you didn't act up giving her one up the ass when we were sleeping together in a trench. Seriously, do you wish things could have been different with her? He touched on a sore spot. Maybe when I'd packed the crate, I was reminded of that day seven years ago when I had left her and moved the stuff from my man cave into the storage locker. It was the insane jealousy I couldn't cope with on missions when we were apart. It was like a cancer eating away at my brain cells. I was right to have left. I was right to be jealous. I was right to have cut out the cancer. She moved her lover into our home the day after. Say lovey, she had said. Thank God we didn't have any kids. But she was right, that's life. I shrugged my shoulders. It was better in my line of work not to be responsible for anyone. The only person I had to worry about was me. Greg must have seen my pained expression. Hey, I was only joking. You okay? What, oh yeah. You're right, good thing I didn't stick it up your ass, or you'd never have married Rose. Now stick to business. Are you on the net? Yeah, I have an old laptop with a net stick. It's on its last legs though. Battery keeps overheating. That's okay, as long as I can get ten minutes out of it, cause I'll have to destroy the hard drive after I've used it. I'll take a shower first. Do you have a towel I can use? Down the hallway, second door on the right. You'll find a towel and a safety razor on the shelves. I unzipped my overnight bag and took out a change of clothes and my money belt. Tugging at the Velcro flap on the belt, I opened the pouch, flicked through the stack of bills, then pulled out some IDs. Edward Joyce, I said aloud, reading from the out-of-state driver's license. Isn't it the name you were given when we were dropped into Columbia? Yeah, I thought it might come in handy one day. Pity I handed in the passport, or I could head for South America after all this. As it is, whatever I do, don't expect ever seeing me in Detroit again. If you want to find out what happens down here, read the newspapers. If there's nothing in the news, you'll know I failed, and it's not safe to come back until the trial. Better write down your cell number for me and give me your mom's address though, just in case of a dire emergency. Oh, and leave me your basement and back door keys. I'll leave them under a stone around back near the door when I'm done. Don't attempt to phone my old number or they might trace it. I have a new cell in the crate. I grabbed my clothes and rifle, then headed for the restroom. Reaching into the cubicle, I turned the faucet, then stripped. Picking up a towel, I flung it over the partition. A vision of Craig sat on the crapper passed through my mind, his pants around his ankles. I locked the door, then hung the rifle strap on a hook inside the cubicle, and then stepped under the water. There was no way anyone would catch me with my pants down. Both their homicides had been a warning. Showered, shaved, and dressed, I made my way back to the bedroom. Greg pointed to the chopper on the bed cover. It's all done. You'll need to fix the explosive on the tail to balance it out or it won't get off the ground. I've marked it where you need to have the fulcrum for balance, he said. I turned to him with a question fermenting I needed to ask. Thanks. Listen. About Hank and Craig. Did they ever talk to you about any problems they could have been mixed up and that put them out of their depth? I asked him. Greg stroked his chin, giving it some thought. Hell no, just the usual banter. Ain't seen either of them since the chopper flew me back to the carrier after I took that bullet in Somalia. Then they shipped me right away to a Saudi army hospital. How are you getting on with my replacement? He's fine, I said. Do you think what's happened to them could be something that you're working on at the horror factory? Dunno, but yeah, it's a possibility. Still, if I told you what we were training for, I'd have to kill you, I said, then laughed in all seriousness. You suck sometimes, do you know that? I didn't mean I wanted to know, but I can guess. I watched the news. I'm just wondering if it could be connected to whatever exercise you're training for. The thought lingered for all of a second. I doubted our target would have the capability. 
Nah, whatever we're working on, there's always Beta Team as a backup. According to the Greenhorns who had me in custody, they said the new guy in our team had been spirited back to base with the others. I didn't like to dwell on that event and change the subject. Shame that mission in Somalia went belly up. Never did hear your side of what went down. What happened? I asked Greg, but he let the question fly over his head. He looked distant then replied with his own question. What about the CIA guy with the ransom money? Did he make it out? Greg asked. He was getting annoying. It was a habit of his, answering a question with one of his own. Yeah, he made it out, but not with us in the second chopper. They extracted him close to him passing away from Kenya a few weeks later. Made a quick recovery though. Last I heard he was back in Iraq. What about the hostages? Greg asked. Beta team went in and took out their pirate base, but the hostages were already dead, I said. So now you've told me, do you have to kill me, he said, and laughed. I ignored him. I thought he'd said that he watched the news. It was reported. They just didn't mention any hostage money. The boss wasn't pleased about the first mission going wrong. Said it reflected badly on the unit and we needed to up our game. God knows what he expected. The total tally was 38 pirates dead to Greg getting wounded. Not sure how many terrorists Beta Team tapped when they went back in. They never recovered the ransom money. So, what the hell happened for it to go belly up, I asked. Greg sighed at having to brief me. It was the CIA guy who messed up. He reacted to one of them raising his AK-47. The pirate's finger was on the trigger guard and his safety was on. I had him covered. It was all smooth until then. Did you see anything? He asked me. No, I was covering our rear on the right flank, with Hank over on the left, when the gunfire erupted. Next I knew was when he jumped into the ditch in front of me and took the bullet. Greg grabbed at his calf muscle and winced. How's the leg? Good days and bad days. Today's a bad day. Anyways, forget that, I'll get you the laptop and pack my case. All I wanted was Greg gone. There was a need to transform my mind to combat mode. I had plans to make. Things needed checking out. It was easier said than done. My mind was churning over why I didn't phone the cops as soon as I found Craig's body. I would have looked less of a suspect. Self-preservation came to mind as I recall checking all the rooms with nothing but a kitchen knife for defense. I should have known the killer had left the scene with the murder weapon on the crapper floor. That's what the detective said at the scene. Except, he said if I was the killer, maybe I didn't have time to leave before the patrol cars arrived. Craig's computer was in sleep mode in his bedroom. When I'd pressed the enter key, it had sprung to life on a browser page, listing searches for blood diamonds. A message scribbled on the notepad next to Craig's telephone had bugged me. The phone stand was next to his apartment door. It could have been the last note he'd written before he'd opened the door to his fate. It could have been a cryptic clue. It could have been nothing. His pastime was a love of crosswords. He was a man of many words, but one who didn't like to express them in banter. As I recall, it started with the word Barnal, then Felon. That was followed by oil rags to riches. And finally, Barter Kings. Goodness knows what he meant by that. Chapter 7 With Greg gone, I could relax. I put my feet up on the sofa, fired up his laptop and searched for Google Maps. It wasn't exactly what I was used to using for scouting areas before and during missions. Normally, we could view the terrain down to a dung beetle rolling camel dung in real time from drones, or sometimes a satellite feed. At least I wouldn't leave my footprint in searchable data from our service's satellite feed. The last thing I needed was for an agency to find my position. Improvisation, that's what we had drilled into us. Give me a roll of piano wire, a ballpoint pen, and a tight corner, and I could take out a room full of terrorist scum. Google would have to suffice for the task in hand. Handbag Street popped up on the screen with an orange marker. Their location was around a 30-minute hump as the crow flies across the fields. Maybe it would take five minutes on the streets driving the Harley. Changing to satellite view, I zoomed in. The gang's hideout was the only property in the street. There were telltale signs of foundations on overgrown lots along the street, 
of what must have been a busy neighborhood at one time. For now it gave the punks a good vantage point. With the flat terrain devoid of housing, they could see patrol cars arriving from a good distance away. Clicking and dragging the little orange guy to go to Street View, I went in for a stroll around. The front of the property was open to a veranda. At the side of the house was an entrance to the backyard, with an eight-foot fence. Taking no chances of uninvited guests, the gateway and fence were topped with razor wire. Parked up front were two custom muscle cars. There wasn't much in the way of cover across the street. On the far side of the lot opposite the front yard there were scattered bushes. Further back was a house with a burned-out roof around 200 yards away. Clicking satellite view, I looked over their property. The backyard was fully fenced. There was a large outbuilding. It was probably a workshop by the look of it. A Ford Mustang poked out of the door, it stood missing, and an engine lift straddling the frame. The rest of the yard was stuffed with rusting cars. I'd seen all I needed, but it wasn't enough. They could have family living there. I needed a closer look. Taking on the gang was one thing, innocent family was another. I typed in the address for the warehouse on the docks. It wasn't what I expected, as I zoomed in on the property. I thought they'd have a lockup unit with a small office. The complex covered a good few acres, stacked with shipping containers. CTM import and export, it said on a large sign over double truck entrance doors. The office section ran to three floors. This wasn't some two-cent operation. Likely they'd have some serious overnight security. Putting the laptop to one side, I eased my legs off of the sofa. Setting off a couple of explosions, and a phone call to warn them off Greg could make matters worse. There had to be a Mr. Big behind an operation of that size. Somewhere at the top of the crap heap would be a suit guy. Someone who looked the part to head a legit operation in front of bankers and their like. Handbag wasn't the businessman type from what I'd seen. His head might not be the one I needed to sever from the snake's body. The clock was ticking. I had decisions and plans to make. Rules of engagement and a possible abort plan for if I decided to walk away. Can't say that I was happy stuck in the house. From a defensive point of view, it was a rat trap. I felt the need to clear my head and to get some air. I removed my sweatshirt. Rummaging in the crate, I pulled out my body vest and slipped it on, then wriggled back into my sweatshirt. At the front door, I tapped the outline of my pistol tucked into my waistband. With the flat terrain I couldn't see any vehicles approaching, so I strolled across the yard and onto the street. Walking up and down the length of the yard, I couldn't see any shells in the road. AKs eject their casings forward and to the right at 45 degrees to a distance of around 8 feet. You need to lean out of the window of a car on a drive-by to prevent peppering the back of the driver's head. I imagine the driver would be ticked off if they didn't. Although thinking that, it would depend on which way they were driving. Still, there should have been shell casings. Looking at the rake of fire across Greg's house, they had to have had it on auto. The scene didn't make sense. Greg would have spotted them if they came back to collect the casings. Maybe not. He'd not seen them set fire to his van. Something wasn't right. At least that's what my gut told me. There again, maybe Greg had collected the casings to hand over to the police. Greg's house smelled more like a rat trap as every second passed by. I walked back to the house. With the exception of a few essentials stacked in my ruck, I stowed everything back in the crate, replaced the cover and repositioned the ornaments. Wandering around the house, Rose must have picked it clean. There wasn't even any cutlery in the drawers. Unpacking the pay-as-you-go cell phone I'd bought, I put it on charge next to my satellite phone and pulled over the sofa to hide them. It was time to make a move. Walk away. Go back to base. Sort your crap out. Let the civilian authorities sort it out. Those thoughts crossed my mind. But then I had my orders to stay there out of sight until told to return. Unofficial orders. Deniable orders. And I was the only sucker to carry them out. Chapter 8 For hours of hiding behind a clump of tall grass with your body hugging the dirt would drive most people mad. It didn't bother me. For hours surveillance when set against the longest stint I'd done on one mission, with the sun burning my ass in the desert for three weeks, seemed like small change by comparison. 
I'd marked the position as my territory, sharing it with the birds and critters. They were no longer alarmed at the intrusion, accepting I was there. Ignoring me, they carried on with whatever it is that critters do to get through the day. I gave the area one last scan with my binoculars. It was time to make a move with the light fading, so I hurried across the road. Set a covert microphone bug on the veranda, then moved quickly around to the backyard fence. I'd already loosened three planks earlier, removing the nails at the bottom, and leaving the top nails intact. Hinging them out of the way, I ducked, then I was inside. Once the gang returned, I'd planned to get them into the open up front. What happened after that was down to them. It would be their choice if they wanted to live or to die. With that in mind, I scurried around, setting explosives with remote detonators and C4 on the junk cars. Then, for good measure, I set one near the back door. If the explosions didn't have them crapping in their pants enough to get the message to leave Greg and Rose alone, I couldn't see what more I could do. The attack would be near enough in time to them raking Greg's house with gunfire, and the threats on Rose's life for them to make a connection. At least that was the plan. One last look around and I satisfied myself all was prepared. Then I hung a miniature relay trigger device on the razor wire on the top of the fence. I ducked back under the planks, then set them back in position. It was dark now. I hurried the 100 yards to the position I'd chosen. I didn't care for the trek back to Greg's house, and wished I'd driven there with the Harley. I'd changed my mind when I'd fired up the engine. You'd expect the exhaust to rumble, but man it was throaty. If only I would have known they weren't at home. Still, everything was prepared. Setting off back to Greg's, I walked in a direct line across the old lots with my hands in my pockets and caressing my pistol. If I saw a cop car and they spotted me, I knew that I could always drop the pistol in the grass and keep on walking, just in case they stopped me. Not sure how they would have taken it if they found I was wearing a vest under my sweatshirt. I needn't have bothered as I cut left and onto Greg's street. The stick woman hustler was stumbling past his house. Hey, Snowflake. If you don't want my stuff, how about a rumble? Ten dollars for a hand job, twenty for a blow. Get a real job, I called back. Stuff you, she said, and gave me a one-fingered salute. Does he live here, Hustler said, hardly able to lift her arm to point at Greg's house. Somehow she managed it, then her arm dropped to her side. Only I could do with a leak. Yeah, well, stuff you too, I said. Go and squat somewhere else. I carried on walking to the end of the street, turned around the corner, then waited for her to stumble on out of sight. Tired of waiting, I cut across the empty lots to his backyard and entered his house through the rear door. It felt as though I was naked without Betsy, as I had christened my rifle. All I needed was my cell phone, whatever was left in the crate, the Harley, and I would be out of there with no intention of ever returning to Greg's house. A roaring sound outside caught my attention. It had the gravelly rumble of a big block. I grabbed Betsy and tripped up the stairs to glance out of the window, but couldn't see a vehicle. If it was a muscle car engine, chances were that they had it in mind to return to do more damage. Cursing under my breath, I ran down the stairway and out of the back door, taking up a position behind the engine block of the burned-out van. Thankful to be out of the rat trap, clutching Betsy, and aiming at the gate, I was expecting game on. The shape of a Mustang cruised on by, then I heard it stop further down the road. Working my way along the hedgerow, I could see the vehicle parked around a hundred yards along the road next to the Hustler. The driver climbed out of the vehicle, opened his passenger door, and looked to force Hustler inside. The guy quickly jumped back in the driver's side, and burning rubber, he sped off. I doubted it was one of her tricks. Probably it was her pimp. I headed back inside. After a struggle, I managed to get the Harley outside, and collected my belongings. Firing up the engine, I churned up some dirt, spinning the back wheel, then hit the road. With wind in my hair, I felt as though I was free as a bird, only I wasn't. Not while there was still a job to be done. A thought struck me as I headed back to Handbag's home. An image of one of the muscle cars I'd seen parked outside his home that I saw on Google, and the one in the backyard with the engine missing, they were both Mustangs. The outline of the car that picked her up looked like a Mustang. Her acting the hustler could have been just that, an act. I'd been compromised once before with a blind beggar who we'd ignored at the corner of our unit's safe house in Fallujah. Hell, 
We even dropped coins in his tin. We were lucky to get out of that one with our sorry butts intact. I began to think I was right and Greg's house had been a rat trap. I'd never thought to look for bugs. I hoped to hell that they hadn't heard Greg and me discussing that it would go down in the early hours tomorrow, or they may just be waiting for me over at Handbag's house. Chapter 9 The Second Night My body hugged the conchos of the dip in the ground. Three hours laying in the dark opposite the front of the gang's house, and the four hours earlier, had me aching in every limb. I switched over onto my back, then scanned around once more through the night scope on my rifle. The only movement I saw was a critter the size of a rat scurrying into the burnout building to my right at the rear. What I'd like to have done was to get up and walk around to get the circulation going. I'd also have liked to have opened a can of beer and relaxed, but neither was an option. Not on surveillance duty. No matter how we were trained to suck it up, it was always a battle not to get distracted and to let down your guard. I briefly pressed the light button on my wristwatch. There was ten minutes to go, but I had it in mind to set the sparks flying early. They were bound to be in unconscious deep sleep mode. Ten more minutes was unlikely to make much of a difference. A light came on in a room at the front of the house. The thought struck me that maybe I was right and they had bugged Greg's house. Either way, if they were up for a fight, I was ready for them. The porch door opened, light flooding the front of the veranda. The skinny hustler was pushed backwards through the door, landing on her backside. Some guy came out after her, sinking his boot into her butt, then hauled her to her feet by her hair. The punk dragged her to the back of a car, then popped the trunk. The girl was fighting crazy, planting her feet on the bumper to stop him pushing her inside. The guy sank his fist into the side of her head, then bundled her into the trunk like a rag doll. All the time that I feathered my trigger, I wondered if this was all part of a diversion to flush out my position. I slid my finger from the trigger to the stock of my rifle where I taped the detonator transmitter. A voice reverberated in my earpiece as someone else appeared at the doorway. There was no mistaking the dreadlock mop on his head. It had to be handbag. Stop her screaming. Kill the bitch. The guy at the trunk pulled out a machete. I had him in my sights. In one fluid movement, I pressed the detonator transmitter, then feathered the trigger. It all happened in a split second. Don't. His arm was raised as he made to slice her. I squeezed the trigger in unison with the sound of the explosives roaring. Blinding flames plumed into the night sky and sucked the oxygen from around the house, the shockwaves rolling the grass. A car wreck landed at the roof, crashing through the tiles. The rest of the gang appeared at the door and scurried to the sidewalk, then used their cars for cover, firing their AKs in all directions. I picked up my shell casing and slipped it into my pocket, then rolled out of the ditch and into a gully as a secondary position. A whoosh to my right, and a familiar vapor trail of a rocket-propelled grenade headed in their direction. The RPG smashed into the front of the house, the explosion taking out some of the gang as they exited. The rest dove for cover to join their buddies. Gunfire from my rear to the left and right thudded into the ground at the ditch I'd just left. Bastards had me flanked, and if I hadn't moved, I'd have been in a kill zone. It didn't make sense. The ones flanking me couldn't have been part of the gang to fire on their own kind. It was too much of a coincidence that I ended up between rival gangs at that specific hour of the morning. There wasn't time to work out an answer. My fingers teased at the remote for the chopper. Using my jacket flaps and hood for cover, I pulled out my cell phone, already prepped in camera mode. The image was shaky, until I brought the chopper under control. Green silhouettes of three of the gang were behind the two vehicles out front. One of them cowered behind the engine block of the first car. From the outline of what were probably dreadlocks, I guessed it was handbag. No more rounds were trained on my own position. Instead, I could see what looked like tracer rounds through the night scope from the heat signal's glow of bullets now peppering the gang's vehicles. Rotating the handle on the chopper remote, I saw the first assailant's heat signature tucked behind the wall of the burned-out house to my rear and right. The second assailant to my left was maybe forty yards behind me. My mind raced. It always did that in combat. It was like time slowed down, but your mind could operate at a speed of light. Leastways, that's what I always experienced. They obviously intended to take me out but their priority now seemed to be the gang. I doubted law enforcement would use a two-man team to take down a gang. 
maybe whoever it was, they thought they'd taken me out. Whatever, they'd now turned their attention to the gang. I'd been lucky they'd not seen my heat signature when I'd rolled into the second ditch. I had a decision to make. Tough it out and lie low, or execute an exit strategy. I turned the chopper around at the sound of an explosion. The assailants had taken out the gas tank of one of the cars. Handbag's heat signature disappeared inside the other car. The other two gang members fired back from behind the flames. One of them dropped to the sidewalk, lifeless. It was time to put an end to this crap. I swung the chopper back over the assailant behind me and to my left, put the chopper into a dive, then pressed the detonator as his image loomed large. Scrambling along the ditch, I reached the tripwire I'd set and tugged on it. Using the cover of the explosive charges to mask my body heat signal, I dived through the hedgerow, zigzagging the fifty yards to where I'd hidden the Harley. Sucking hard for breath, I dragged the Harley upright, pulled in the clutch handle, slipped it into gear, kicked hard, then sped off down the road with my lights out. The road I was speeding along ran parallel to the street out front of the gang's house. I was clocking some speed to put some distance between the scene and me. I heard a roar over on my right. Across the empty lots, the muscle car that handbag had dived into was racing in the same direction. Whatever engine he had under the hood, he pulled away. Dipping my hand into my jacket pocket, I pulled out a detonator remote, pressed the button, and saw Greg's house explode in a ball of flame. I had a feeling he'd realize it was for the best. If we ever crossed paths again, I could always blame it on the gang. I hoped that Greg was right about the cops deserting the area. Someone would have been bound to have called it in with the explosions and the firepower that went down. I pulled over, dragged off my backpack and rifle and dropped them down into the storm drain that I'd lifted the cover off of earlier. I quickly slid the cover back into place, hopped back on the Harley, then sped off. In the distance I could see Handbag's taillights. He must have been cruising, thinking that the danger had passed, and not wanted to draw attention from cops. Twisting the throttle, I was soon behind him and switched on my headlight. The trunk popped and he swerved. Caught in my headlight beam, I could see the terror in Hustler's eyes. The lid bounced back down again as he hit a bump, leaving it ajar. All I had was my pistol tucked into my waistband and the hope I could pull alongside to persuade him to stop with the business end of my Glock. Whichever way I tried to overtake, he threw his car about. His rear window was peppered with bullet holes. Shards of glass blew into my face. I had to swerve as it disintegrated, smashing to the asphalt. He swung hard right, forcing me to mount the sidewalk. Almost lost balance as I hit a pile of empty cardboard boxes stacked outside a store. Narrowly missed a street light post as I swerved back onto the road. His cell phone illuminated the inside of the car until he pressed it to his ear. After half a mile of playing cat and mouse, I wondered if Hustler was worth the effort. If he'd called for backup, it was time to peel off and disengage. Then, in the blink of an eye, I caught sight of a figure step into the road. I felt a double bump, then the wheels sliding from under me. My mind screamed, damn, a stinger, then I blotted out as my head hit the edge of the sidewalk. Chapter 10 I heard a male voice mumbling. The words were indistinct and they kept stopping as if he was in a phone conversation. I knew better than to move. Bad guys don't go around with stingers to stop vehicles in their trunks. It had to be cops who'd brought me to ground. My head thumped when I heard a voice that I recognized. It was one of the cops from the night before. Judging by a high-pitched whine, a vehicle seemed to be driving toward me in a high gear. It was worth risking opening an eyelid in case I needed to roll out of the way. The glow of a taillight loomed large, the vehicle reversing, then it screeched to a halt. The skinny hustler leapt from the trunk and ran away. I could feel my pistol digging into my gut. Both my arms were out in front of me. Making a play for my Glock, and I reckon I'd be fair game for one in the back of the head. Playing dead was easy after falling off the Harley. My body was still suffering shock. I reckon I was seconds away from death anyway if I twitched, but decided against a move that would make it for certain. Leave her, I heard, then a car door open. Cuff him and get him in the trunk. Someone grabbed my wrist, brought it behind my back and applied cuffs. At least I knew they weren't going to execute me there and then. He's out of it. 
He could be dead. His arms limp, the cop said. Then he pulled my other arm behind my back. I decided a cough was in order. Chances were that handbag wanted some answers. Doing too good a job of playing dead, and they could have decided to make sure I was dead me, then left me as roadkill. The cop started to frisk me from the ankles. No time for that crap. Take his legs and dump him in the trunk. With each of them tugging at me, they lifted me face down and bundled me in the trunk. I couldn't be sure if the cop had recognized me. It had been dark when he turned up after his buddy had stopped me the night before. The change of clothes I did could have helped, and lying face down on the asphalt, but my army boots were a dead giveaway. My trusty friends as I called them. Well broken in and not worth swapping unless I wanted blisters. The lid slapped shut, leaving me in darkness save for the glow of the taillights. Follow me to Atwater just in case someone decides to do a traffic stop. I assumed that it was handbag talking. I can't. I've had a call to attend an explosion. Do as you're freaking told. Tell them you have a flat tire or something. It's time you earned your freaking money. You can set off back as soon as we arrive safely. Car doors slammed. Tires screeched. Then we set off with a jolt. Getting out of the cuffs wouldn't be a problem. I'd rehearsed that move for days on end until I'd perfected the art. Popping the trunk when he slowed would be easy. A quick parachute roll and I'd be away. But then thinking that, the cop following could take me out with his front bumper. Besides, it looked as though I wouldn't have to go through evading the security to see what was going on at the import-export business down on the docks. At least that's where I assumed we were going on Atwater. The whole trip was proving to be a better buzz than going out on the town on furlough to find a willing bed partner. The only thing I could do was to relax. There was no point worrying about dying. No one would miss me. My mind rolled back to my first day at school. I couldn't remember any faces, only the teacher asking everyone in turn what their dads did for a living. You couldn't ask that question now, or the teacher would be fired. Most kids nowadays are with single moms, or they're on the third dad. My dad's an ambulance driver. He saves lives, I recalled saying. Truth was, I didn't have a dad, or a mom that I knew of. I busted in from the orphanage to school every day. I didn't have a clue what anyone thought of what I'd said, but I thought it sounded cool. By the time I reached high school, I perfected a whole imaginary family, down to aunties, uncles, and cousins. Then I'd make the mistake of getting too close to someone. Fights and expulsion usually followed them finding out it was all a charade. There was never any sympathy. Not surprising considering the amount of violence I used to settle scores with anyone who tormented me. The more I thought about it, the more I thought that there was nothing for me to miss, never mind anyone else not mourning for me. My chain of thought was interrupted. The car slowed, did a right, then stopped. A voice called out. Open the gates. It sounded like a chain-link gate rattling as it opened. Recalling the street view on Google, I guessed I was right about the location. I see most cars here. What's he doing here this time of the morning? Meeting with the customs official. We drove him through. A minute or so and the car stopped. Get the baggage out of the trunk and into the container. The trunk sprang open. A giant of a guy looked me over. I wanted to snicker. He looked like something out of a 70s flick, with frizzy hair and a drooping mustache. Another gorilla walked up behind him. This one had a shaven head, and he was wearing an undershirt to show off his muscles. His right and left shoulders sported tribal tattoos, but it was the Arabic writing on the back of his hand that intrigued. They hustled me out of the trunk like I weighed nothing, then dropped my backside on a chair inside a shipping container. One of them tugged on a pole switch, light flooding the container. I guessed I wasn't the only one who'd suffered the chair treatment. Unless someone had spilled a can of paint, if I wasn't mistaken, Blood was still congealing on the floor and it had pebbled dashed the walls. It wasn't like they were hiding their torch or weapon of choice. I stood at a chainsaw on a bench to one side. I was beginning to think I'd have been better taking my chances with the cop's bumper. One of them stood back, then pulled a pistol from his waistband and aimed it at me. Gorilla ran a rope around my waist and tied me to the chair. For good measure, they dropped a sack over my head. Wait outside and close the doors. 
I'll call you when I need you, said Handbag. With the sack over my head, I was guessing as long as I couldn't see him, I might be let go after a question and answer session. There was no need to see him. The sack over my head only heightened my senses as I heard his footsteps, then he stopped, dragged over a chair, and sat in front of me. You've gotten two ways out of here. One is to walk out free as a bird, and the other is with you chopped up, put in a barrel, then we'll throw you to the fishes. Get my drift? Sure, sure. Look, I was only trying to tell you there was a girl in your trunk. I was about to give up when I think I hit an animal in the road. I thought maybe she'd climbed in when she was drunk. Handbag must have been closer than I imagined, when a blow to the side of my head tipped me in the chair over. I had to admit, the words sounded on the pathetic side as I'd spoken them. He dragged me in the chair upright. None of that lying crap. I saw you running opposite to me with your lights out after the shootout. Who do you work for? Who's trying to take us out? I'd already tugged at the button on my sleeve attached to a cuff pick in the hem and worked my magic on one cuff by the time he'd finished. I tell you, man, I don't know about no shootout. I was expecting another blow to the head. Instead, he pulled the sack off of my head just as I'd untied the knot in the rope. I'm guessing you're some kind of black ops with either the CIA or Homeland Security. The FBI don't go blowing up houses. Which is it? Handbag had decided which option I'd leave by with him removing the sack, but I wasn't about to give him the satisfaction. Instead of him reacting with fight or flight, his eyes popped as if he'd crapped a brick when I snaked the rope around his head, jarring it in his mouth to stifle any cries. In one fluid movement, I rose from the chair, stepped behind him, wrapped the rope around his body, trapping his arms, then his neck, a knee in his back, and I had him on the deck where I wanted him. His body went limp with the rope squeezing on his carotid artery. I released the pressure and snaked my hand around his waistband and relieved him of his pistol, then whispered in his ear, You've got two ways out of here. Play ball and one of them could be with your rostalocks and your head still planted on your neck. Get my drift, asswipe. Maybe he heard me, maybe he didn't. He was still disorientated and limp from his oxygen-starved brain. I wasted no time sitting him on the chair, applying the handcuffs, and tying him with the rope around his chest, then secured his feet. He started to groan. I pulled the cord from my hood, tied it around his head so that it was tight across his mouth and between his teeth. There were answers to questions that I needed, but I also needed to muffle his cries. Stepping across to the bench, I picked up the chainsaw and pulled on the cord. The engine roared into life. It was time to show him how a professional handled an interrogation using my initiative. Chapter 11 In the normal way of business, government agencies don't go around assassinating citizens on home soil. Bringing up the threats against Greg was the last thing on my mind. I was more concerned as to why Handbag thought that the CIA or Homeland Security could be involved in the shootout and not some rival gang. Someone had tried to take me out back at Handbag's house, and I needed to know who it was. There was more going on here than warning someone off as a witness to a petty crime. I grabbed a hold of his locks at the back of his head, engaged the drive on the chainsaw and sliced off a handful of his hair, then thrust it at his face. That didn't hurt, did it? It doesn't have to hurt. All you have to do is tell me why you think it would be Homeland Security or the CIA blowing up your house. I released the tension on the cord in his mouth. To hell with you. You won't get out of here alive. Oh, I don't know. I'm the one with the chainsaw, remember? Just who the hell are you? Ah, uh, you want to ask the questions? I'm your worst nightmare, that's who I am. When you tried to warn off my buddy over on Greystone for being a witness to a robbery, you stepped on the wrong toes. Yeah, well, from what I saw in my rear view, the only house on Greystone blew up in a ball of flames, and I didn't do it. I don't know anything about your buddy. That's not what he says. Yeah, well, he's full of crap. I don't know about him being full of crap, but your pants will be before I'm finished. Just blink your eyes when you're ready to talk, I said, and put pressure back on the cord to stifle him from shouting out. I'll start with a finger. No, maybe your big toe. Better still, what about your dick, I said, then placed the chainsaw down and pulled off his sneaker and sock. I picked up the chainsaw, put it in gear, then revved it up to full throttle. 
A damp patch appeared at the zipper on his jeans, then spread around and down his leg. It wasn't the only sign of fear. The guy was acting like a coward. Not surprising, really. He started to try and to wriggle free, his eyes bulging at the strain of pulling on the ropes. Much as I'd have liked to have sliced an appendage from his body as a reminder of our encounter, I had to bear in mind the two gorillas outside the container and an exit strategy. Wait, I'll tell you what. It's your lucky day. I'm in a generous mood. All you have to say is why you thought the services would want to take you out rather than arrest you. Then you can call your thugs in here and I'll be on my way. Oh, sorry, I nearly forgot. I want you to back right off my buddy, or I'll be back, get my drift. Of course, if you don't want to play ball, we can finish it now, I said, and placed the chainsaw blade next to his cheek. Lucky for him, his eyes blinked. I set the chainsaw to idle, then took the pressure off of the cord in his mouth. Look, man, I don't know why I said that about the CIA, but there was more firepower and explosions going on than any of the gangs of around here could have put together. It can't have been the Latin Counts, we're into different stuff. Maybe it's an outside gang trying to muscle in. Crap, man, it was like facing some kind of freaking military exercise. That's all I said it for. As for your buddy whoever he is, we're good, right? His explanation sounded plausible. Oh, I'm good all right. Now call in your thugs after I turn off the light. Tell them the bulb's gone and to get my body out. Say anything else and I'll put a bullet in your skull. I picked up the sack from the floor and dropped it over his head, then pulled on the light cord. Drawing the pistol from my waistband, I pressed my back to the wall. Adonis and Brains, get the hell in here. The light bulb's gone. Get the stiff out of here. The door to the container grated as it opened, giving some modicum of light as they entered. There wasn't any need for a fight. They walked straight over to handbag. Stepping outside, I closed the door to the sound of handbag calling out, Get the freaking door, dumbass. It was just my luck that the rods wouldn't locate to lock the door when I pulled on the handle. They were now pounding on the door as I struggled to shoulder it closed. Handbag's car was parked behind me, but I imagined the key wouldn't be in the ignition. To my left was the exit and then a guard to deal with. To my right was an open gate to an area with oil tanks that could give me plenty of cover. I was losing the battle to keep the door closed and fired around through the gap in the door. It felt like I was heading into the jaws of hell as I stepped back from the door and sprinted toward the tanks, hoping for a back exit. An almost simultaneous sound of gunfire and a searing pain in my upper arm threw me off balance. I clicked the heel of my left foot with my right as I felt two thuds in my back and hit the ground. Ended up face down with a mouthful of dirt. I rolled over, only for a third thud to rip at my jacket in the chest area. I tried to suck in a lungful of air to no avail. All I could do was gasp short breaths. Instinct told me to crawl for cover before I would blank out. At the point of losing consciousness, my lungs finally took in some air. I managed to scramble into the shadows. My hand was wet with the blood running down my arm from the wound where the bullet had struck. My chest and back felt as though someone had poked at me with a branding iron. I could see them stalking and crouching along the line of containers with their guns out front. From my right, and driving my way in a convoy, I heard the roar of engines and watched the headlights of an oil truck annoyingly light up the area. They were driving for the main exit. As the first tanker crawled past my position, I could see the legs of my assailants from under the vehicle's chassis. With my gun arm out of action, shooting with my left hand might only have served to give away my position. Two more trucks and they'd find me for sure. I tucked the pistol into my waistband. It was too late to get to the second truck. As the third one passed, I grabbed a hold of the foot ladder on the tank and swung my legs up onto a plinth. There was hardly enough room to gain purchase. Intense pain in my arm ran through to my chest. Hanging on for dear life, we passed through the exit. Before the truck had a chance to pick up speed, and thinking I couldn't hold on any longer, I dropped off onto the road. The momentum had me landing and running into some bushes. I crawled behind them, then rested with my back to a wall. I was aware of feeling faint and wishing I had my full field dressing kit with me. There was a sizable pool of blood where my hand lay limp on the ground. There wasn't any time to waste unless I wanted to bleed out. As painful as it was, I slipped off my jacket, then my sweatshirt and body vest. 
I unfastened the knot holding a toggle around the bottom hem of my jacket, then pulled out the cord. There was an entry wound at the back of my upper arm, and a larger exit wound at the front with a flap of skin hanging loose. Fortunately it had missed the bone. The bullet hadn't hit an artery or blood would have been pumping out. Still I needed to stop what bleeding there was. It didn't take me long to fashion a tourniquet, with a few winces in the process. Pulling at the zipper of an inside pocket in my jacket, I opened it and fished out a sachet of clotting gel, then pulled out a tampon and a penknife. I cursed at the drugstore back at Fort Bragg had run out of pressure bandages as I cut the sleeve from my sweatshirt. Sweat poured from my brow at the exertion and smarted in my eyes. I applied the gel to the entry and exit wound, then placed the tampon on the wound. I loosened the tourniquet. Applied pressure with my other hand. Most people would laugh at some guy keeping a tampon as an emergency backup if they couldn't get a hold of a pressure bandage. But then, they probably wouldn't know that using a tampon to stem, or at least absorb blood flow, had saved many a marine's life in the field while the clotting gel worked its magic. Wrapping my sleeve around the wound area, I then used my teeth and fingers to tie it off in a knot as tight as possible. My thoughts turned to getting the hell away from there. I needed an extraction and fished my satellite phone from a jacket pocket. It was time to face the music back at Fort Bragg. Need a medivac, I typed. Just about to put in the GPS coordinates and to press encryption, I pressed delete instead. I hadn't done with Detroit yet. Not by a long way. Not when a native had put a bullet in my arm and someone had tried to rub me out back at Handbag's house. Easing my fingers into my pocket, I dug deep and pulled out a folded note. Reaching over to my jacket, I tugged it toward me and took out my cell phone. Punching in Maria's number, I pressed the call icon and waited. Then I waited some more as my eyelids felt heavy. The phone slipped from my grasp. I heard Maria's voice as if it was whispering in my head. Hello, hello. Who is that calling? Chapter 12 I'd always told myself that I'd never let something like cancer take me. I'd seen enough people die with a bullet to the head to know it was clean and easy, almost humane if you didn't see it coming. Being wounded and in pain was like a cancer eating away at your insides. Visions of some of the buddies I'd nursed in the field passed through my mind, screaming in pain until I sent them into a stupor with a shot of morphine. I recalled slapping one of them on one occasion, then removing his weapon and telling him to suck it up, when he asked me to put him out of his misery. Good thing I did take his weapon, seeing as how he recovered got married and had kids. Somewhere in my subconscious, I was fighting hard to get a grip. It was only a flesh wound. It wasn't like my innards had spewed out and I needed a quick way out. I shook my head and opened my eyes, disgusted with the thoughts I had had. The call on my cell phone had closed. I heard voices across the road and peered through a gap in the bushes. Handbag was remonstrating with some guy wearing a suit and tie at the office entrance. The suit guy sported a thick bushy mustache and a goatee beard. He was short and dumpy, with a mop of black hair, and with a mid-eastern look to him. Handbag threw his hands in the air, then turned and marched on through the gates to talk with the security guy outside the gatehouse. A guy wearing a bomber jacket, white shirt and tie, he walked out through the office door. Suit guy walked with him to a black SUV. The vehicle door was marked U.S. Customs and Border Protection. They talked a while, then Suit walked over to his own vehicle. He opened the door, reached inside, then walked over to the customs guy. The Suit guy had a good scan around, and then handed him an envelope through his open window. Recalling Handbag's conversation with the security guard, I guessed the Suit guy was Mom who had handed a backhander to the customs guy, probably for him to turn a blind eye. At least that's what appeared to me what had gone down. 5.30 in the morning was a funny time to be doing business with someone from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. Especially when it involved brown envelopes. The way he'd given handbag a tongue lashing, I guessed that the guy he'd referred to as Mom, probably short for Mohammed, he was the head of the snake, and up to his neck in charge of handbag's gang business. Mom walked back to his car, climbed inside, then I watched them both drive off in different directions. I began to think where the hell my head had been at when I tried to phone Maria. It wasn't just that she didn't have a car. If she did have a vehicle, and she'd arrived when they were outside, it could have put the both of us in a bind. 
There again, it would be a big assumption to make, and a lot to expect of someone to ask for sanctuary when you had a bullet hole in your arm. The next five minutes I spent struggling to put on my sweatshirt and jacket. I needed out of there before dawn broke. Using the wall for purchase, I hauled myself to my feet. Peering over the wall, it framed a passageway between two warehouses. I picked up my vest and rolled over the wall. Two hundred yards humping and I was at the riverside and a marina. There was a rowing boat at the bottom of a stairway fastened with a rope. Leaning on the wall, I acted as if I was taking the air while scanning the boats and the area for any sign of activity. The area was deserted, but I imagined that if I didn't get out of there, it would soon be busy. Feeling weak with the loss of blood, walking any distance was not an option. Not when there was a chance of a patrol car catching sight of me. Scrambling down the steps, I climbed into the rowing boat, and gritting my teeth, I rowed out of the marina and into the river. A sense of relief washed over me as the current took over. I rested the oars, then lay back to restore some oxygen to my brain, and let the current do the work. Grasping at a vision of the map, I guessed that the current was taking me along the river away from Lake St. Clair. Teasing the spent rifle cartridge out of my jacket pocket, I launched it into the river. The vest was an army issue, so I had no qualms about dropping it over the side of the boat. All I had to worry about was to hope that the boat would stay on the U.S. side of the river. Drifting onto the Canadian side of the border that cut through the river could land me in more trouble than I was already in, with only a false U.S. license for ID. I let the boat drift to the bank where I couldn't see any signs of life. Once on the rocky shoreline, I gave the boat a push back out in the river and scrambled up the banking. Lying on my back in the tall grass, I had another of those oh crap sinking feelings. I started to wonder if I'd have been better drifting to the Canadian side, especially if the wound in my arm started with an infection. They have free medical care over there. But then I thought they'd have to contact the police. Sockham would have little reached that side of the border to extract me. Maria was my only option. Then I thought of Greg. I pulled out the note he'd written with his cell phone number and the address where he was staying. This was as near an emergency that we'd talked about as we could get. I hesitated. He was too far away. Not only that, something wasn't right with Greg's story. Handbag mentioning it being like it was a military operation had already put my mind in the direction that he could have set me up. But why? I couldn't work out. Maria was my only chance, that and getting the medical field kit from my ruck. Pulling out my cell phone, I noticed that my battery was low on charge. I dialed her number. Hello, she groaned out. Who is it? The guy from the diner. You gave me your number. Said you had a long sofa. I need some help. What sort of help? she asked. Can you get here if I give you the address? I asked her and gave her a rough idea of where I was at. Could you get a taxi and come and pick me up? I can pay the fare. I don't have much charge in my phone to be phoning for taxis, I said, completely exhausted. No need. I've got mom's car. Where are you exactly? What's happened? My eyes rose to the sky. I didn't have a clue where I was exactly. Hold on a minute. I crawled out of the grass and onto the road. My vision was blurred, but I could make out the bridge I'd passed earlier around 200 yards away. The pain in my arm was excruciating. All I could hope was that I wouldn't pass out again. The battery icon started to flash on the screen. Do you know where Atwater Street is? Yeah, I know it. I was on a boat on the Detroit River. I passed two bridges from the marina near Atwater, then the boat took in water so I'm stuck here. I fell on the rocks and cut my arm, so I'm in a state. I can see a road running parallel to the river. Oh, no. Wait, I'll have a look at the map on my laptop. I guess I'd have to come clean about the one back at her apartment. The last thing I wanted was to scare her off. At least she'd be expecting me looking a sight. Got it. It must be West Fort Street that you can see. The second bridge would be Ambassador Bridge. I'm on my way. Can you make it to the bridge near to you? Sure. How long will it take? I'm only 20 minutes away. Good. Please hurry. What about your kids? They're staying with Mom. I knew I was pushing my luck already, and I thought I'd leave telling her I needed a detour to get my rucksack for when she arrived. 
See you soon, I said, and closed the call. My battery died. The storm drain was a half mile from Handbag's house. Likely the area would be crawling with cops, but I couldn't think of any other way of getting a hold of some morphine, and the wound sewn up without my field medical kit. I looked at my watch. There was 18 minutes left to concoct a story. It would soon be time to find out just how grateful she was for rescuing her. Chapter 13 18 minutes is a long time to chew things over in your mind. I had a good idea that Greg was playing me back at his house. Hell, I was wary of him before I ever set foot over his threshold, with my hand never far away from a weapon. He'd used all he knew about me to get a result, and I'd played along with him. He should have known you can't fool a proficient liar. Thinking that, it also gives you a good idea when someone is genuine. His shock had seemed in earnest when I'd studied his reaction and I'd told him about the hits on Hank and Craig. If there was a connection with him to what happened back at Fort Bragg, and some reason he needed me to put the Frighteners on the gang, I still couldn't figure it out. Dawn had almost broken when I saw Blue Ford driving slow along the street toward the bridge. Ten yards away, and I stepped up from behind a tree and waved. Maria pulled over and stopped. God, you look rough, she said. Get in. I had to admit, I imagined that I didn't look like no white knight, but even without her makeup and her hair tied back, she looked like a guardian angel to me. Yeah, not had much sleep. I was talking about your jacket. Yeah, damned brambles on the banking bank snagged me. I was thankful it was my right arm that was wounded, and she couldn't see the extent of my blood-soaked sleeve when I sat next to her. What were you doing on the river at that time of day? Fishing. I didn't have you down as the fishing type, she said. Looks can be deceiving. Listen, I couldn't stay at my buddy's. He had to go away on business. I've hidden a rucksack that he lent me to save me carrying it around. I'll give you directions. How's your arm? Numish, I said, and gave her the directions, then gritted my teeth at the pain. As the surroundings lightened with the sun rising, pockets of traffic joined us on our way to Highland Park. I was grateful for her not talking. Maybe she was tired. I knew that I was tired. After being awake all night, I was struggling to keep alert. Tried not to show any discomfort that would ever swing the car in the direction of a hospital. My head swiveled as we passed along the road parallel to what had been Greg's home. In the distance, it was looking like I'd overdone it with the C4. There was just one cop car outside the house. Traffic cones cordoned off half of the street where debris had landed. Slow down. Around twenty yards ahead, park at the side of the storm drain, but don't put your wheels over it. I don't like it here. What possessed you to end up walking around this dive? She asked. Is it a bad area? Bad. Look at that demolished house smoldering ahead. Yeah. Got to admit, it made me nervous passing through until I got to the marina. Maria stopped the car and I climbed out onto the road. The grill over the storm drain was a lot tougher to lift with only one arm. I tugged on the rope I'd fastened to the grill and pulled out my ruck, then dropped the cover. I could see a what the hell expression roll over her face as I dropped my ruck between the back seat and mine. I guessed she'd caught sight of my arm. Odd place to hide it, she said, as I shuffled my backside on the seat and closed the door. Good job I did put it there if it's as bad as you say it is around here. Do you live far from here? I asked, changing the subject. We pick up Woodward Avenue half a mile from here. My apartment's on a side street around three miles further along. As we drove on, I could see her mind churning over things. Maybe she thought that she'd made a mistake with her offer. I looked straight ahead as we passed Greg's house. You never did say what brought you to Detroit. Job hunting. She laughed. What? Here in Detroit? You'll be lucky. Yeah, guess you're right. I was hoping for a job with my buddy, but it didn't work out. What line of work? Security. Well, you can handle yourself. I'll give you that. I saw what you can do firsthand, remember? It didn't seem to me from the expression on her face that her question was meant for me to remember, but a reminder to herself why she would take in a homeless bum in the state that I was in. There again, I knew from experience that some girls like to hang around tough guys. It was the ones who used that trait to get you into fights that made me squirm. 
I couldn't figure her out yet, just accepting that she had been grateful. Handbag's plot place came into view. The whole area outside where his house had stood was teeming with patrol cars. Guys in white suits were digging in the debris. Two news vans were parked a short distance away. One news crew was set up in the street with a newswoman talking in the direction of a camera. At least Greg would know that it was him and me done as far as debts were concerned. Looks like the vandals had fun up here last night. Soon won't be any housing left for them to destroy, she said, and shook her head. Traffic in front of us had slowed us down, probably taking in the scene. I was guessing that for the time of day, they were there out of some kind of morbid fascination after they'd heard about what went down on the news. Just concentrate your eyes on the road. You're near to the sidewalk, and you're too close to the car in front. We crawled past the area where I'd exploded the chopper. The area was taped off, with a white tent structure over where the assailant flanking me would have been. Around fifty yards further along, and there was a junction, with a left turning to Handbag Street. Two cop cars were blocking access. The cops rested their butts on the hood of one of them, and they were jawing at each other. Closing in on them, I recognized the nearest one right away. It was the cop who had stopped and searched me. The other guy was the cop who had worked the stinger on me. Maria crunched the transmission as she selected a lower gear, with the line in front of us picking up speed. Both cops looked over their shoulders. Our eyes briefly met. I pushed back into the seat and looked straight ahead. The hairs on my neck bristled. I pulled down the visor and made to pull up my eye. Looking in the vanity mirror, I hadn't realized that I had a lump the size of a golf ball on my temple and an open cut. You okay? Fine, just a speck of dust. There was a line of cars behind. The cop cars hadn't moved, but both cops were looking in our direction. I sighed, then lifted the visor. I'm ready for a coffee now, I said. She gave me a sideways glance. Espresso style in a mug. No milk or sugar if I remember. I think I can manage to rustle up cremated bacon and sunny side up eggs in a sandwich, but it'll have to be on rye. I don't have burger buns. I glanced at her. Her smile radiated as she glanced back, like a cat that had the cream. I couldn't help but wonder if she knew what she had let herself in for. You got that right, not like your boss. The yolks were frazzled. You should have complained. It would have killed him to fry up some more. He really is tight. She needn't have said. I already had a fix on him as a tight ass. I gathered that, I said. We'll need to get you fixed up first. Good thing I was a nurse. I have a first aid kit back at my apartment. Great, I said, but saying that, I doubted a few band-aids and iodine would sort out my problem. How come you're working at the diner? Needs must. Hospital department I worked at closed when the car factories closed down. It was like ten nurses applying for every post after that. I gave up in the end. A girl and her family have to eat, she said. What about moving out of Detroit? I asked her. Not possible. Not with two kids. I need my mom to look after them when I work. You working today? Yeah, at lunchtime. I get back around nine today, so it'll give you a chance to recover. Last thing I wanted was to be a financial burden. Listen, I have plenty of money so you don't have to worry about my keep. If you can manage a few days, I'll be out of your hair. We pulled up outside her apartment block. It had started to rain. Nurses earned good money as far as I knew. I was wondering if she was using her kids as an excuse not to move out of Detroit. But then I thought, I'd never had the problem of trying to pay for child care. The offer to pay for your keep is appreciated. Maybe you might find a job here and settle here in Detroit. You never know your luck in a lottery. You could possibly find work, I suppose, she said. I already had work, I thought, as we climbed the stairs. My priority after taking care of the bullet wound would be to find Skinny Hustler before Handbag or what was left of his crew found her. They tried to kill her for some reason. She'd be running scared. Whatever, she could have an inside track on what they were up to down at Atwater. Here we are, she said, as she put the key in the lock. Returning her smile, I had to avert my gaze in case she got the wrong impression. I had to remind myself that I was just there to recover from my wound and to lay low for a while. 
I took a deep breath as she pushed open the door. They say that how you live is what defines you. I breathed out in a sigh, knowing that I'd soon find out what defined her. Trusting her if she found out I'd been shot would be another matter. Chapter 14 Maria turned at the threshold and pulled the door ajar. Wait, before we go inside, are you going to tell me your name? She'd come to her senses at last. I'd been in control so far since we met. She was laying down her mark on her territory. It was a bit late in the day, considering I could have pushed her through the door. Done whatever evil I might have had on my mind, knowing she was alone, then walked away. Being grateful is one thing. Putting yourself in harm's way is another. Oh, yeah, sorry. Edward Joyce. My friends call me Ted, I said, and showed my driver's license. Hey, I didn't need proof, she said, then turned and pushed open the door. Follow me. Make yourself at home. The bedrooms are on the left. The restroom is on the right at the far end, she said, as we entered the hallway. I noticed bolts on all three bedroom doors near the top, which I thought strange. I need a shower if you don't mind, before I bandage up my arm. No problem taking a shower, she said, where you can use the bathtub and have a soak. She reached up to unfasten a bolt at the top of the restroom door. Do you want me to take a look at your arm first? I have some bandages. If it's all the same, I don't think it's that bad. I have a bandage in my ruck if I need one. Suit yourself. I'll rustle up something to eat and make a coffee while you take a shower. Then you can decide if I can help. Stepping inside the restroom, I closed the door behind me. When I looked, the catch for the bolt was missing. The pain in my arm soon took away the curiosity as to why she had everything locked on the outside, yet she didn't have a catch for the bolt on the inside. I wriggled out of my clothes. Removed the dressing. Turning the faucet, I stepped under the shower. She tapped on the door. Do you have a change of clothes? No, I was thinking of going out to buy some after a rest. My ex-husband left a bag of clothes here. I'll dig them out and leave some behind the door. I have a towel here and a bathrobe. How's your arm? Fine, I lied. Truth was, although the gel had worked, under the shower, there was a small trickle of blood, but the pain was still immense. The door opened slightly, then she passed in the bathrobe and towel. Thanks. I stepped out the shower, dried myself off, then sat on the toilet seat and opened my ruck. I took out my medical kit. It was looking as though Lady Luck had been smiling on me. The bullet must have been a small caliber, either that or it had lost energy over a distance. Feeling for the bone, it didn't appear to have any chips, but from the entry wound, the bullet had traveled around the bone, before exiting at my bicep. Where it exited, it needed stitches, but with the flap of skin in place, it wouldn't leave much of a scar. The time to start stitching and injecting a shot of morphine if needs be, would be after she had gone to work. I picked up a sachet of antibiotic cream, tore off the end, then applied it around the wound areas, before slapping gauze over the wounds and applying a bandage. You okay in there? Need help? Fine, I'll be out in a minute. I've dug out some of his clothes for you. Thanks. With everything stowed in my ruck, I reached out, pulled the clothes inside, and dressed. Can't say I was happy at walking in her ex's clothes, but at least I had my own boots. Coffee and breakfast is ready, she said, as I entered the living area. I dropped my ruck over at the sofa, then walked over to the table. The open plan room to a kitchen area was clean, but sparsely furnished. I took a seat at the table. It wasn't what I expected. I thought that the walls and dresser surface would be cluttered with photographs and ornaments, but there were none. The table and chair legs had foam wrapped around them. If it wasn't for the wear and tear on the chair backs, I'd have thought they'd been delivered that day from a furniture store. Over in a corner, the television was fastened to a chain, attaching it to the wall. The walk space to the kitchen area was blocked with a baby gate. The kitchen surfaces had no rack of knives. I couldn't help but wonder if she'd hidden the knives on account of my visit. Whatever, I thought the setup strange. Hmm, the coffee smells good, I said, and took a sip. She took a seat opposite me, rested her arms on the table, then seemed to be searching inside my eyes. If I hadn't felt so beat up, 
I'd have gone straight into chat up mode. So are you going to tell me about yourself? Is there a Mrs. Joyce? I forked a slice of bacon into my mouth, then signaled with a wave of a finger for her to wait for a reply. Crunching and chewing real slow, my mind raced as to how I should respond, and if my answer was going to end like with the high school scenarios I'd experienced. It was going to be difficult living under the same roof. It's easy to slip up. Make a mistake. I snatched a vision of my high school sweetheart. The love of my life. I recalled the day she called me out for lying about my background. The pain of that day still festered inside, when I recalled her storming away. I shrugged my shoulders. In any event, I had my own questions. Like, where are the areas where addicts hang out? It was how to frame the question that bothered me, but if she could answer, it would save time in finding Hustler. Well, is there a Mrs. Joyce? Chapter 15 I swallowed hard, deciding to keep it simple and to deflect the question back to her. No, there's no Mrs. Joyce. What about you? You said ex-husband. Is there a boyfriend? No. God forbid. Don't have time. Me too. Well, not a boyfriend. I meant no girlfriend. Don't worry. I know what you meant. At least I know you're not gay. She blushed, then added, Not that there's anything wrong with that. We laughed. I realized I'd missed an opportunity to say I was gay for me to keep a distance. Then maybe she wouldn't have probed for more background info. It's not just having no time. I move around a lot, I said. What happened with your ex? I asked her. Up saddlebags and left shortly after Roberto was born, she said and rolled her eyes. Sorry. No need. It was six years ago. Really, I should have taken what clothes he had left to Goodwill. Good thing I didn't throw them out, she said. Yeah, I guess. Swallowing the last morsel of egg, I chugged it down with the coffee. My eyelids were heavy. Listen, I need to get forty winks if that's okay? Sure. I'll get a pillow and some bedding, she said. A pillow will do. I'll take a nap in my clothes. Maria walked through to the hallway and returned with a pillow. There you go. I want to call at mom's to see the kids before they go to school, and have shopping to do before I go to work. I'll leave a key on the table for if you go out. I slipped my hand into my money pouch and dragged out some hundred dollar bills. Here, take that for now. We can sort out the money later. Maria blushed. I could see that she was hesitant to take the bills. Look. Money doesn't grow on trees. Take it, I insist. Food costs money. Sure. Okay, I'll get us a couple of steaks for tonight. Sounds good. When are the kids back? Tomorrow around six. Fine. Over at the sofa, I dropped my backside on the cushion, removed my boots, then rolled onto the cushions. My head no sooner hit the pillow than I knew sleep would be hard come by with the pain in my arm. I could hear Maria taking a shower and shortly after I heard the outside door close. I jumped up from the sofa, peeked around the curtain, and watched her climb into her car. Relief washed over me that she was gone. I removed my t-shirt, dragged over my ruck and retrieved the medical kit. I unfastened the bandage and removed the gauze. It was red all around both wounds. Taking a needle and some thread, I threaded it through the eye. I'd done it for others and practiced on a pig but somehow the idea of sewing up the wound in my arm had my fingers trembling. I didn't have a clue how I'd sew the entry wound. I'd be sewing blind. Suck it up, my mind screamed, as I lifted the syringe and drew 10 cc of morphine. Poised with the needle over my muscle. I snatched my head in the direction of the door as it opened. Sorry, I left my... Maria looked horrified and she shouted. What the hell do you think you're doing? God damn it. Don't tell me you're a freaking addict. Get out now, or I'll call the police. She dug in her purse and threw the bills I'd given her in my direction, then pulled out her cell phone. I'm serious. Get the hell out of here now. Come near me and I'll scream the block down. It's not how it looks. I can explain. Chapter 16 Maria looked on, agitated. 
It was written all over her face. I placed the syringe down with the rest of my medical kit. No need for the police. I'll go now. I guess that's you and me all square, seeing how we both rescued each other. Mentioning me rescuing her had the effect I hoped for and seemed to calm her down. It's not what you think. This isn't heroin, it's 10 cc of morphine for the pain. I'm a trained medic, I said. You're army, aren't you? If I'm not mistaken, special forces. You look like you've been through the wars with all those scars. How she'd worked out that I was special forces was beyond me. It was time to fess up. But I was more intrigued as to how she knew I was special forces. What makes you think that? The desert boots when I first saw you screamed army. Then, I guessed you were ex-army, the way you handled yourself. You sleeping rough. I imagined that you were drifting after getting out. You wouldn't be the first one to do that. But that medical kit tells a different story, she said. Most women I've met wouldn't have a clue about different army boots, never mind spotting a special forces medical kit. Look, at least let me give my arm a shot and dress the wound before I go. I could see by her expression that she was churning it over. She fidgeted with her cell phone, then bit on her bottom lip. You're not a Navy SEAL, I know that much. To have that kit, you must be active. Huh, what makes you think that? I know a Navy SEAL kit inside out. Whatever, they don't sell those kits, and they sure wouldn't let you take them off base, only on training exercises, or missions. I'm a nurse, remember? I trained in the Army. Spent three years attached to the Navy SEALs, specializing in trauma injuries. So I'm guessing you're still active. She placed her cell phone on the kitchen table. You'd better let me give you the shot, and I'll stitch up the wounds. Gunshot by the look of it, and judging by that bruising around your chest, I reckon you've taken fire on a vest. The question is, how'd you get shot on home soil? I can't ever remember blushing, but with her having me dead to rights, I could feel the heat rise in my cheeks. I held up my arms, palms facing her in surrender. Look, I need you to trust me. I can't tell you the whys and wherefores, but I swear, I'm not some criminal, or an addict, and I'm not Edward Joyce. I was hoping that last snippet would win her over. Don't worry, Ted, if that's what you want to be called. I understand. We knew better than to ask what they'd been up to when they arrived for treatment. But I'm not sure I want you around when the kids arrive back. Hey, you're the boss. Maria stepped forward and got to work on the wound. She wasn't some naive server that was for sure. Not after posing the question as to why I was active and taking rounds on home soil. It had to have crossed her mind that I'd hidden my ruck in the vicinity of where she'd seen Greg's and handbags houses destroyed. I drew in the smell of her perfume as she stuck the needle in my arm. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be around when her kids arrived home. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to be around when she arrived back from work. Not if she liked to watch the news channel. The action over at Highland Park would be the news of the day, I thought. And God forbid that they'd find Fat Guy's corpse and splash the details all over the screen. At least I'd noticed that she didn't have any newspapers around the house. That damned perfume of hers was like a magnet, making me want to pull her to me. Luckily, my mind drifted, distracted as the morphine took effect, preventing me from getting a slap. The needle and thread only felt like tugging as she stitched up the wounds. The shot of morphine must have doubled up on me having no sleep. The next thing I knew... I sat bolt upright, disorientated, and noticed my arm bandaged. Maria? No one answered. Her cell phone wasn't on the table. Pushing off of the sofa, I stumbled over to the window. Her car was gone. There wasn't any sign of police cars. I'd been out of it for two hours. Time enough for the police to set up a perimeter. I had a decision to make and I glanced around the room. I picked up my t-shirt off of the sofa and wriggled into it. The air was thick with the aroma of coffee. My eyes set on where I'd left my rut. It wasn't there. Hobbling over to the kitchen area, I looked to see if she'd stowed it there. On the breakfast bar, I noticed a handwritten note and two keys. The writing drifted in and out of focus, until I finally managed to read the words. Coffee and percolator. Small key for front door. Five lever for gun safe and cleaning cupboard in the hall. Your rucksack's in there. She topped it off writing her first name followed by an X. 
At the bottom was a P.S. I've added a bottle of wine to the shopping list. Hope you slept well. I wasn't in any fit state to make a quick exit, so I poured a black coffee and downed it in one. Her note didn't sound like she would snitch on me, and it gave me some comfort. But then I had to remember she wasn't dumb. She could be using the note to set me up with a false sense of security. If she had talked it over with her mom, she could be fighting with her conscience. Maria could decide to phone the police at any time of the day. Hell, her mom could even decide to phone the police to protect her daughter. Fighting the drowsiness, I headed for the hallway, unfastened the bolt at the top of the cleaning cupboard door, and snatched it open. After a few missed pokes, I inserted the key in the safe lock, then retrieved my ruck. I noticed the hood of my jacket poking out of a black garbage bag and shook my head. Forensics would have a field day if they found my clothing. I dragged out the ruck and slipped it over my shoulder, then picked up the garbage bag and headed for the exit. As I closed the door behind me, I looked at the door key. I hesitated for a moment, then slipped it in my pocket. At the fire door at the end of the stairwell, I stopped and looked around through the glass panel. It looked clear, so I slipped outside into a rear courtyard and over to a dumpster. Lifting the lid, I dropped the garbage bag inside and reorganized other waste bags to cover it, then closed the lid. It was a struggle to get the other strap of my ruck over my shoulder, but I finally managed it and set off walking. My legs were about to give up when I arrived at some park gates. One of them hung loose, which hardly looked inviting. Walking on through, I came to a park bench. One of the wooden slats was missing, but the way I felt, I'd have slept on a clothesline, so I dropped my butt on the seat. Over to my right, a black guy strutted in my direction. He was glancing around. Looked shifty as if checking there was no one else around, which set me in alert mode. I cursed that I'd not taken my pistol from my ruck. I shrugged out of the straps, dropped it between my legs, then unfastened the zipper. Hey, dude. You got some change you can spare? He took a seat next to me and glanced around. His hand slipped to his waistband behind him. The dummy's eyes popped when I beat him to it and pressed the barrel of my gun to his forehead. Drop it. Hands where I can see them. Damn. You an undercover cop? I'll ask the questions. I said, and rose to my feet, kicking his pistol away. I backed off and retrieved it, then dropped the mag. My arm hurt like hell, so I launched his mag as best as I could some distance with my good arm, and watched it land in a thicket. Where would I get a hold of some stuff around here? Hey, man. I didn't know you was a brother. Stuff's on every street corner. I can get some if you puts the gun down and gives me money. He must have thought I was born yesterday. Is there anywhere addicts hang out together and sleep rough? Dude, most of us sleep rough, but there's Crackalandia, as the Spix named it, before us blacks took it over. You must be new around here. I can take you there if you likes. No thanks. Where is it? You don't wants to be going there solo, man. Use white. Like I said, if you've got money, I'll take you. I pointed my gun at his groin area. Cut the lip. Where the hell is it? Hey, stay cool, man. It's around three miles from here along Woodard. Then goes southeast of HP along Davis and South. It's under the viaduct. You can't miss the signs as you approach. Where's Woodard and what's HP? Whoa there, man. Point your gun away. I'll tells you. HP is Highland Park. Woodard is what we calls Woodward Avenue around here. Man, you sure ain't from these parts. That was all I needed to hear. It wasn't far from Handbag's house. Take off your sweatshirt and leave it on the bench. Then start walking back the way you came. Turn around and I'll blow a hole in the back of your freaking head. Whatever you says, man. It's all good. No needs to be pulling the trigger. As he set off, his pistol followed the same path as his mag into the bushes. I put on a sweatshirt and pulled the hood over my head. It was looking though I wouldn't be getting any sleep for a while. Not when there was a chance of handbag finding Hustler before I could get to her. I shrugged my shoulders, tucked my pistol into my waistband, then picked up my ruck and set off for the exit and Highland Park. Chapter 17 Crecolandia wasn't difficult to spot. 
What few residents were left had put up signs on the approach road. One of them with a skull and crossbones at the top, it read, Warning, Addict Infestation. They'll rob you for a dime. May God protect us and save us all. The lettering had faded, telling me that the sign must have been there for some time. Then I spotted it. Judging by the cardboard city under the viaduct, and people mooching around, it didn't look like the legislators or the cops had any inclination to save them, or the residents. With my ruck and money stash hidden in the bushes along Woodward, all I had to my name was twenty dollars hidden in my sock. I pulled up my hood over my head, then dug my hands into my sweatshirt pockets. With one hand, I gripped the butt of my Glock. Head bowed, I set off in a shuffle, until I was among the dead beats. I dropped to a crouch, and settled with my back to a concrete support. Hey, how's it hanging, brother? Keeping my head bowed, the guy addressing me was five feet away. All I could see was that he was wearing sandals, and his filthy jeans were ripped at the knees. He had no socks, giving it away he was a black guy. The guy dropped his backside next to me. You ain't seen my bitch on your travels, have you? he said. Head still bowed. I shrugged my shoulders at him and glanced away. The residents were mostly black, but there were a few whites. The guy in the park must have been lying. But then I expected that of him. Turning to face him, he looked shocked. You ain't Reuben. That's his sweatshirt. You's white. So? The guy held up his palms. His fingers trembled. Hey, it's all good, man. Your business with Reuben's your business. Your brother, right? I see it in your eyes. It must be some good stuff you're on. The effect of the morphine must have been visible. I'd not thought anyone would put the sweatshirt to the man. But then it was gray with blue hoops and fairly conspicuous. Easing my pistol from my waistband, I lifted the hem of the sweatshirt and showed the guy the barrel, then quickly covered it again. Listen, I don't know your bitch, but I'm looking for a black woman who works over on Greystone. Matchstick thin and with a front tooth missing. Hell, that sounds like everyone here. You mustn't be from around these parts. She sells you some bad stuff? You don't needs to buy off of her, knows what I'm saying. You got money? Man, I can get me some good white or yellow butter any time. I was guessing the guy didn't mean butter for bread. Not with the amount of scumbags around drawing on pipes and trying desperately to gather all the vapors. Tell me about the woman and I'll arrange to meet up with some money. I only want to talk to her. You a cop? Do I look like a freaking cop? I growled at him. You got some balls if you are. There again, those I say you ain't. You done good to get Reuben's sweatshirt, so I ain't gonna mess with you. Say I knew the woman, what's it worth? Twenty dollars. Hell, that's only good to get me less than an hour in La La Land. Two tenths of a gram won't cut it. Make it fifty for half a gram and I'll tells you. The guy had turned from potential dealer to user in the bat of an eye. I gritted my teeth for effect and poked the barrel of my gun at him under my sweatshirt so he could see I meant business. Make it twenty dollars and I won't put a freaking bullet between your eyes. Where can I find her? Either the cussing or gritting my teeth to spit out the words had the desired effect. She's a screech of tires, the grit spitting on the underneath of a pickup truck, and a vehicle skidded to a stop. Two guys jumped out, leaving the doors open and the engine running. Most of the inhabitants ran like rats in a barn. Some remained, sitting cross-legged in a stupor, oblivious to their surroundings. Crap what does handbag sidekicks want now? It's Adonis and his sidekick, Brains, said the guy next to me. His eyes darted around as if looking for cover, and he struggled to get to his feet. Cougar, don't move, or I'll turn you into a colander. Crap, what's they wants me for? I kept my head down and rocked back and forth in an attempt to blend in as a native. A boot connected in my side. Get the hell out of here. I rolled over and scrambled behind the viaduct support. Where's Queenie? I heard one of them say. Crap, man, she's around somewheres, probably sleeping. Poor gal looked like she'd taken a beating when she arrived. Peering from behind the concrete pillar, I watched Handbag's henchmen go on a wrecker's spree, upturning and kicking makeshift cardboard sleeping accommodation. Hustler darted from under the debris, but too late to escape from brains. He grabbed her by the hair and dragged her to the ground. 
Get her in the car, Adonis said. She hollered at him, you ape. I told my bro all I knows last night. I was already crouched at the back of their pickup when they arrived with their guns drawn. Holding my Glock with two hands, I was hoping for my left finger to add strength to my right finger. Hustler put up a fight, gripping the frame around the door and planting her feet on the sill. Brain slipped his gun into his waistband. Adonis was already in the driver's side and screaming at Brains to get her inside. Brains tussled with her with his back to me. Shoot the bitch. Brains reached for his waistband. I dropped my hand into the back of the pickup, grabbed a tire wrench in my left hand and struck him. His head split open like a ripe tomato, spilling its contents. I wrapped my arms around him to use his body for cover as he staggered. His gun arm flailed in the air. Adonis pulled his gun. Brains dropped, taking me and Hustler with him. I lost my grip on my pistol. Let go of the tire wrench. Grabbed his hand and squeezed his trigger finger. A hole appeared in Adonis's forehead, but not before he'd pulled his own trigger and hit Brains in the chest on the way down. Adonis crumpled over onto the passenger seat. Hustler was stuck under Brains, writhing to get out from under him. I dragged her out and around to the driver's side. She pounded my chest with her fists. I'm here to help you, you stupid cow. Get inside and let's get away from here before the cops arrive. Her eyes looked at me like someone demented. I guess she was well past her fixed time. Look, get in and I'll buy you some butter. Then we'll go our separate ways. Somewhere in the void between her ears, it looked as though I'd made a connection as her fists pounding at my chest slowed, then stopped. You better make good she said. Yeah, help me get this gorilla out of the pickup and I'll make good. Hey, what about my money? Cougar asked and slapped the hood. It wasn't worth arguing. If he saw it as a dead in his stupefied crazed mind, I thought he may just give my description to the police. I reached down to my sock, took out the bill, and tossed the twenty out of the window. In the rear view, I watched him scrambling on all fours as I pressed down hard on the pedal. The body count was growing and it was taking me nearer to the head of the snake. At least forensics would probably take it that they argued and shot each other. I pulled over, took off my sweatshirt, then retrieved my ruck. As an afterthought, I reached for the tire wrench in the back of the pickup, wiped it with the sweatshirt, then tossed them into the field. Where's we heading? she asked, as I drove on and turned down what looked like a country road. This'll do, I said, and pulled over at a gate to a field. Hustler turned sideways and faced me. Money before you get your hand in my panties. That's what you want, right? There ain't no butter to be gotten around here. She was the type of woman I'd never consider giving a poke. Her face was scabby, and goodness knows how many diseases she was carrying in her snatcher. I pulled at the zipper on my ruck. Slipped a fifty out of my money belt and dropped it on her lap. That's for the butter when I drop you off. Tell me why Handbag wanted you dead, and there's another fifty for you. Damn you, Snowflake, she said, and grabbed the door handle. I ain't snitching on Leroy, she said. It's on safety lock. Play ball, and I'll open it. Gotta be worth more than a fifty. Give me another hundred. Okay, I'll give you a hundred. But hear me good. Lie to me or try for more, and I'll take you to Handbag myself. Okay, okay. But drive on and I'll tells you on the way. I needs me some stuff, like yesterday. Bastards took all mine last night. All I could hope was that it was worth the effort and the bills. Taking a glance in her direction, she gave me a narrowed stink eye. Maybe trusting her to tell the truth was stretching it. Not a little, but a lot. Chapter 18 Hustler hunkered down in her seat. She drew up her legs and wrapped her scrawny arms around them. Her face scrunched, with her bottom lip touching her nose. She looked like some evil gargoyle warding off a preacher. How do you know Handbag? Sorry, Leroy. I know who you means. He's my bro. What does that mean, a friend from the same clan? No, flesh and blood. Different dads. The revelation stunned me. What brother would have their sister killed, I thought. So why did he want you killed in the early hours? How's it he knows that? A bird told me. 
Now cut the questions, or forget the hundred. Just tell me why. For nothing. All it was, was a piece of junk. What junk? A stupid ornament I borrowed from his bedroom. I'd have given it back once I'd earned. Said it was a freaking big deal. This junk, what was it? An ornament. Ugly at that. Some dude sat on a chair wearing a dress. Man, it was heavy. Thought it was gold, but the guy at the pawn shop said it was lead-painted gold. Still, he gave me enough to buy some stash so I could do some dealing. Nobody wants to trick with me no more. I gave her a sideways glance. If she had filled out a little, lost the scabs, and had some dental work, I reckon she could have been a looker in her day. Why didn't you ask Leroy for money? Said he'd done giving, and he wouldn't give me the steam off of his duda. Beat the crap out of me till I told him where it was. And where's that? I told you, man. The pawn shop. They didn't get the ticket off of me. Never asked. I glanced at her again. She gave me that stinky eye of hers. Give me the hundred and stop next to the boy on the bike. I told you what you want to know. It was looking as though not all the connections to her brain cells had been destroyed. I guessed what would come next. I pulled over and stopped a hundred yards from the boy. I'll sell you the pawn ticket. How's about another hundred? How's about I pistol whip you for it? Okay, what about fifty? Twenty, that's all I have. Done. I took the bills from my ruck, held up my arm, but kept the bills tight in my fingers. Ticket first. Crack Hustler scoffed, then dug deep in the back pocket of her jeans. Listen, I ain't no damned fool. Unfasten the lock, then we'll exchange, she said. I released the lock and she teased me with the ticket, then grabbed the bills with the same fingers. Her hand yanked on the door handle. It could have been with me only having had two hours sleep, who knows, but she'd been fast as a greyhound, and slick as a magician. Not so fast, Queenie, I said, at the same time grabbing her jeans by the waistband and dragging her inside. She fought like crazy. It was a hell of a struggle trying to tear the ticket from her grasp. Taking a firm grip of her pressure point under her arm served to deliver a dose of my own magic. I followed up by bending her hand at the wrist. My wounded arm felt as though a car tire had run over it as I pushed her outside. With my foot hard down on the pedal, I raced away, tires burning rubber. In the rear view, Crack Hustler was sat on the sidewalk, thumping the concrete with both fists. I glanced at the ticket. She told the truth. The name of the pawn shop was just as she'd said. The pawn shop had read, followed by the address. Tossing the ticket on the passenger seat, I noticed a cell phone. It must have slipped out of her pocket in the struggle. I scanned through the contacts and stopped at bro, then said a grin. From the way she'd fought for the ticket, I was guessing she'd worked out that the figurine was more than junk. The intrigue was burning a hole in my brain. Exactly what sentiment the ornament held to handbag that he'd order his sister's death for stealing it was beyond me. There was only one way to find out, but it would cost another $120 to retrieve it. The significance of the amount that she'd negotiated wasn't lost on me. Regardless, I scanned the road ahead for someone who could give me directions. Chapter 19 The pawn shop wasn't in the best of areas. Different gangs had the area tagged at opposite ends of the street with their graffiti. It reminded me of dogs lifting their leg at a tree trunk to mark out their territory. Just who controlled the parade of stores wasn't clear. I wondered if it was a no man's land. A sort of neutral area. They had those kind of areas in Afghanistan. By day you could patrol in uniform, mingling with the Taliban and loyal natives alike, and not have a clue which was which. No one would try and shoot you. But at night time it was a case of beware all those who enter. I glanced around. All the stores had heavy metal grills. Driving slowly past the pawn shop, some smartass had painted out the A and the W, then scrawled an O and an R over the top of the signage. The grill over the door was open, but a closed sign hung on the glass pane. I took a left turn down an alley, then a right into the back street and parked. The back of the store looked like a fortress. Heavy steel doors were padlocked with some seriously thick steel chain links. The wall was around 15 feet high, 
topped with a roll of razor wire. I drove around to the front and parked outside. Hauled my ruck behind the seat, then climbed out onto the sidewalk. The light was on inside the shop, but I couldn't see any movement. I wondered if he could be in the back and he'd close the store to do some inventory check or something. Looking left and right, the street was empty, but I noticed a few curtains twitch at the apartment windows above the store's opposite. Trying a tap on the glass door panel brought no result. Rapping harder, the door creaked ajar. Hello, you open, I called out, as I elbowed the door open. Stepping inside, the first thing I noticed was a camera LED flashing high on the wall and pointed straight at me. I banged on the counter. Customer. Anyone at home? Hello. I glanced to my left. On the floor I could see a smashed crystal vase. There was an empty space on the display at the side of an open steel door. The loan price tag on the shelf said $195 in thick felt tip. Something didn't feel right. Behind the counter it was grilled like a prison cell. It looked as though either someone had left in a hurry or darted through to the back. I stepped back to the entrance, slid the bolt on the door to secure it, then stepped over to the counter. Drawing my Glock, I used the counter to hide it from the camera view. Hey, you open, I said, and I edged along the counter both hands gripping the butt of my pistol, and my finger caressing the trigger. Listen, you sick or something, I said, and stepped lightly through the open doorway to the back of the counter. I pushed my back to the wall at the side of the entrance to a hallway, then stepped out, pointing the gun ahead. My eyes darted around. It was clear, save for a moist dark smear on the floor tile and a smudged palm print on the doorframe in an open door. I stepped through the doorway to find the body of an old guy. He was clutching his chest, a dark stain on his shirt. A large pool had formed at the side of him where he'd bled out. I checked for a pulse, but there wasn't one. The pool hadn't congealed, which told me he'd not been gone long. On the desk, I noticed a recorder for the CCTV. It was one of those old tape recorder machines. When I pressed eject, it was empty. Even so, I turned it off at the power switch. Next to a recorder was a computer monitor and keyboard. I tapped the keyboard and the monitor sprung to life. The image on the screen was exactly as Hustler had described the ornament. The caption read, Stolen from the Central Syrian Museum in Raqqa. Dated from around 500 BC and believed to be worth over $1 million on the black market. Just what the hell handbag had been doing with it in his bedroom, God only knows, I thought. There wasn't time to be deliberating. The handle of the telephone was off of the cradle. He could have phoned the police before he expired. I picked up a rag, dusted the switch on the recorder, then wiped the keyboard. Whoever it was that had tapped the stiff, I guessed it was the artifact they were after. Adonis and Brain sprung to mind. It could have been their last stop, before going to seek out Hustler to tie up the loose ends. On the way to the exit, I grabbed a hooded jacket and sweatshirt off of a rack of clothes, then unfastened the bolt, wiping it clean. A guy was leaning inside the pickup, a buddy standing guard. Hey, get the hell out of there, I said, dropped the clothing, and then pulled out my gun. Back off, real slow. The guy in the pickup scrambled out and set off running, his buddy following at his heels and zigzagging. I glanced into the cab as they disappeared down an alley. The wires were cut and hanging loose, ready for hot wiring. It was looking as though catching the lowlife by surprise, he'd cut through more wires than intended. The sound of sirens drifted in the distance. I knelt on the seat to drag out my ruck, but it snagged on something. There wasn't time to work out which wire went to which. The strap to my ruck had gotten caught under the seat. I reached under the seat to free the strap, only to drag out a cardboard box and a videotape. The box was maybe six by six and around nine inches tall. I freed the strap, then retrieved my ruck. The sound of the siren was getting louder. I quickly pulled on the sweatshirt with the hood over my head, then donned the jacket. A quick wipe around the cabin, then I shrugged my ruck onto my shoulders. The video film would probably identify the killers, so I left it on the seat after giving it a wipe, along with the box. I was about to set off walking, when something at the back of my mind told me to pick up the cardboard box which had some weight. Tucking it under my arm, I walked briskly, turning at the alley, then along the back street. As much as I wanted to open the box, 
The sirens now sounded too close for comfort. I'd cut it fine. I glanced at my watch and did a quick calculation. If my hunch was right about Adonis and Brains, I calculated it had taken the police fifty minutes to respond to gunshots. I turned into an alley, then arrived in another street. From seeing the towering GM Renaissance Center and the other office blocks surrounding it on the skyline, I worked out my compass bearing. It wasn't far from the greasy diner. A stupid thought entered my head. I wondered if I should say my goodbyes to Maria. My shoulders sagged. Either side of the street ahead, the two youths who tried to steal the pickup stepped out, guns drawn. Chapter 20 Narrowing my eyes, I waited for the punks to start shouting orders, or at worst, to see muzzle flashes. I turned slowly to one side to make a smaller target. Beating a bullet by turning for the metal plate in my ruck to take the heat would be touch and go. If I could have, I thought that some self-flagellation would have been in order for going off mission. If I had had my team with me, the punks would have already been taken out by my left and right flank buddies, and with someone watching my back. Going solo was proving to be a nightmare. The only consolation, I thought, was that the cops were only a street or so away. For that reason alone, I hoped they weren't stupid enough to pull the trigger. Hey, white dude, put your hands on your head, one of them called out, then he crept in a circle to behind me. I said put your freaking hands on your head. I ignored him. The other punk danced from foot to foot in front of me. They can't have been older than fifteen. The way the punk facing me danced, he looked pumped up as if he was on something. You ever heard of Handbag and his crew? I asked, then honked phlegm and spat it on the ground, keeping my arms at my side. The punk behind me stepped to my right. He jabbed his barrel at the side of my head, holding it horizontal, gangsta style, just like I'd seen in the films. He grabbed the box from under my arm. What's if I does know him, he said. If you know of him, you wouldn't be hotwiring his sidekick's pickup. And you sure wouldn't be stealing a present he'd bought for his mom. They shared anxious glances. Big mistake. In one fluid move, I had his gun and stepped behind him. Drop the gun, punk, where you get to see me blow his brains out. The young guy facing me lowered his arm and bending over, he placed his gun on the cobbles. Take the freaking box. We didn't know it was handbags, honestly. You'll tell him that, right? Kick the gun away, then eat dirt. The teenager out front did as he was told. I jabbed the barrel at the back of the other youth's head. You too, son. Snuggle up close at the side of your buddy. The one on the ground started to sniffle. Please, mister, we's only looking to scare you. Don't hurt us. Mama's waiting for me to go shopping to. How old are you? Fourteen. I rolled my eyes. Never mind your mom. You should be at school. Listen, I'm gonna walk away, but I'm gonna watch you every step of the way. Move a muscle and both your moms will be crying at your funerals. I reached down, picked up his gun and stuffed it in my pocket. Dropped the clip out of the other gun, then racked the slide to check there wasn't one in the chamber. I gathered the box off of the cobbles and stepped over to them. Stop sniveling, said one of them to the other. The defiant tone of voice told me he may not wait for me to disappear and he'd run for backup. I ambled over to him and put the gun to the back of his head, then pulled the trigger. His body went into shock at the sound of the click. He trembled from head to toe. Then he joined his buddy, sniveling like there was no tomorrow. Next round will be live if either of you move a muscle for fifteen minutes. I'd wasted enough time and backed off. Reaching another alley, I slipped away. I arrived at a bridge over a canal where I wiped the guns and dropped them into the water. I was done with Detroit. I'd felt safer outside the green zone in Iraq. It didn't help that with all the action my arm was throbbing. Not only that, I suffered sleep deprivation. My vision had started to blur. Over the bridge, I could make out some derelict buildings. If I'd have shaded my eyes to mask out Detroit's skyline, what was once a thriving industrial area wouldn't have looked out of place in Kobani on the Turkish border. Especially after ISIS had done shelling the crap out of the town. The only difference was the red Detroit brick. The one nearest didn't have a roof. Most of the windows were boarded with sheets of wood. It wasn't exactly the Ritz, but it would have to do. 
The name sign had gone, but I could just about make out the faded wording painted on the front of the building. Detroit's premier car interior upholsterers. So much for calling it Detroit Motor City. At one time, the factory would have been full of machines and workers, probably supplying product to the local car industry. It was sad to see it was stripped clean. What the liquidators had left, I imagined the locals had weighed in for scrap. Even the rotted wooden loading doors were on the floor, with the hinges and locks long gone. Most of the upper floor had collapsed in on the bottom floor, with debris everywhere. I grabbed a hold of an 8x4 board and let lean it against the wall. It would serve as a hide for me to get some shut-eye. With the amount of crunching underfoot I was making, I doubted anyone would get near me without I'd hear them. Settled under the board, my back to the wall, I tried to make sense of all that had happened. Talking to Lone Wolf over at Fort Bragg at a clandestine meeting after I'd made good my escape, we discounted the fictional version of a conspiracy theory to silence our team. Powerful politicians, or Pentagon brass and their like don't have the clout to have us go on missions for their personal gain as an ulterior motive. Too many checks and balances for them to succeed. Hell, there were times we even had to check with the Attorney General for some missions, so we didn't end up in a war crime tribunal. When I told Lone Wolf about the call from Greg, he had the same alarm bells ringing in his head as me. There was no doubting he'd worked one on me back at his house. ISIS, or some other terrorist group, would have the biggest grudge to bear, but I couldn't see how they could get to know our identities. Not when we only used code names. Besides, they'd have bragged about it over the internet by now. As much as I didn't want to be in Detroit, I knew that I couldn't leave. Greg could have tapped me back at his house when I least expected it. If he was mixed up in the incidents back at Fort Bragg, then he'd had use of me for his own gain, keeping me alive long enough to do his bidding. My eyelids felt heavy. The next thing I knew, my neck jolted to the sound of a cell phone ringing. Fumbling to take it out of my jacket pocket, I brought it under control. The name, Bro, flashed on the screen of Hustler's cell phone. I poised my finger over the icon to accept the call. Chapter 21 For the young punks to show fear at the mention of Handbag's name, he must have been well known. My encounter with him and his crew would have caused some serious damage to his operation. If nothing else, once word had traveled that he'd had his ass kicked, his street cred would take a hit. I imagined he'd be on a serious campaign to recruit replacements before the other gangs muscled in on his territory. If I stayed in Detroit, he'd be too busy fighting his corner to worry about me. My thumb slipped over to the cancel icon and I stopped the call. I'd said all I wanted to say to him. The phone buzzed this time. I pulled up the message from Handbag. Hi, babe. Where are you? Saw's about B4. You okay? I tried to put my mindset into how Crack Hustler would have replied. F you, scumbag, I typed, then the devil in me pressed send. He was quick to reply. It's all good. B phoned earlier to say he's gotten it. You seen A or B? I assumed the A and B stood for his sidekicks, Adonis and Brains, and the it that he'd mentioned was the artifact. No. Where are you? I replied. It took a while for an answer, but he was cautious, ignoring the question. Call me. We can jaw. Forget what happened. I got stuff for you. I imagined he was holding out the carrot of some stuff to entice her. Can't. Swollen face. Will A or B give right? No. Their cell's down. I need to see you. I sighed and shook my head. Make good, he'd said. Make good my ass. Snuff her out more like, I thought. I doubted Adonis or Brains would have switched off their phones when they arrived at Crackalandia. No doubt Cougar would have emptied their pockets to supplement his habit. At least I hoped that, then he wouldn't be around when the police arrived at the scene. Not contacting them had to have handbag worry. Later, I typed, sent the message, then powered down her cell phone. All I could hope was that he wouldn't have the manpower to go looking for her. Not now I had a channel open to communicate with him if needs be. There I was, possibly carrying around a million dollars, and I'd not looked. It showed me just how tired I'd been. I glanced at my watch. I'd been out of it for over two hours. Add the two hours sleep earlier and it was enough to restore some semblance of consciousness. 
I picked up the box and tore away at the tape. Lifting the flaps, I pulled out the contents, wrapped in bubble wrap. Carefully teasing the tape holding the wrap, I unrolled it to reveal the artifact. It was heavy, but it wasn't gold. Stone most likely, and painted gold, although the paint had faded and cracked. But then I thought that I'd look rough around the edges after two and a half thousand years. The pawn shop owner had been lucky to spot its value. There again, it had ended up as his curse. I hoped that it wasn't carrying some evil omen. I wouldn't have given it house room. Hustler had been right. It looked to me like a piece of cheap junk you'd buy on vacation as a memento, then realized you'd made a mistake when you'd gotten it home. Wrapped up and back in the box, I didn't have a clue what to do with the artifact. Detroit would have a museum somewhere. When I had time, I thought that maybe I could leave it on the doorstep with a note. My mind picked up on where I had left off before I dozed. I snatched an image of the tattoo on Adonis' hand. It was Arabic for God is great. There could have been a connection there to the artifact if he was Syrian. One thing was for sure, I needed to find a library or an internet cafe. It was the only way I could think of me finding out about the import-export business down on the docks. I could look to see what public records had on them. None of our missions had ever involved artifact smuggling, so the connection to the murders back in Fort Bragg was a long shot. Still, it was all I had. At some stage I'd have to find Greg and put him under surveillance. Maybe even give him the sack over his head treatment for some answers. I began to wonder if blowing up his house had been a mistake. It was getting dark. I expected that I would be less conspicuous with the fading light and with it masking my exit, it would be better for me to head away from there. Put some more distance between the pawn shop and me, I thought. Greg could have wanted me dead on my mission at Handbag's house, and to leave me as the patsy to take the blame. If he did, and he knew that scenario had failed, then he could have a second option to contact the police to say I was in Detroit. He could snitch me out to them that I was wanted for two homicides back in Fort Bragg. Booking into motel wasn't an option. If the police had somehow managed to get a fix on me, they could have alerted hotels and motels by circulating my image. Going back to Maria's for a steak and a glass of wine was sounding like a better option. I'd noticed a wooded area at the back of her apartment block. It would give good cover. From there I could watch the entrance and have a good look around for a police ambush. It sounded risky, but then I thought, what the hell? I needed a base camp. Somewhere to charge my batteries and relax. Her apartment would have to do, unless I could find somewhere else on my way over there. Hoboing around with no fixed address and with a ruck on my back made me apprehensive. It was like I had a magnet attached to me. No doubt my ruck would make me a target for every punk in Detroit to have a go at lightening my load. I let out a sigh. All I had was five days. After that I'd promised to hand myself in, unless the police had found another sucker to pin the charges on. Still, I had options. Gold mining in Alaska over at Porcupine Creek was one of them. Getting into Canada would be easy from Detroit and to make my way to Porcupine. I reckon that would be preferable than spending a lifetime trying to escape from prison. No one would ask my name up there. All they'd want to know was how much sweat I could put in for 12 hours a day on a kiss and a promise of a paycheck at the end of the season, together with three meals a day, and a bed. The decision was made in the blink of an eye. I knew exactly what I had to do. Chapter 22 The Third Night It was just my luck for it to start raining. The thick bush foliage gave me good cover in the wooded area at the back of Maria's apartment. The overhanging branches of the trees were a godsend, and thinned out the raindrops. I was thankful to have borrowed the hooded jacket from the pawn shop. Given time, I knew the rain would eventually penetrate the material. After I walked around the perimeter, I was satisfied the police hadn't set an ambush. From my vantage point, I could see the entranceway from Woodward to the parking lot. The wooded area was elevated. I had a good view of the road either way for some distance. If any cops arrived, all I had to do was to slip away through the fields behind me. A thought was bugging me that the police could have already visited, found nothing, then decided to return later. With two hours to go, I needed to start gathering branches to make the frame for a hide. Headlights turned the corner and into the lot. Under the street light, I was sure it was Maria's car. If it was her, then she was early. 
I doubted the cops would allow her to return on her own and put her in harm's way. It was her all right. There was no mistaking her form as she climbed out of the car and popped her umbrella. Maria walked around the back of her car, then flipped open the trunk. She started to load up with shopping bags. Shrugging the straps of my pack over my shoulder, I stooped, then gathered the roll of rope I'd bought from a hardware store on my way over. Sliding on the leaves underfoot, I scurried down the banking, then rushed over the asphalted area and on through the back door. With a quick trot up the stairway, a turn of the key in the lock, and I was in there before her. Over at the sofa, I dumped my ruck and the rope out of sight behind the long curtain drape, then dashed back to the door. Here, let me help, I said and took hold of some of the bags as she walked through the doorway. You're early. Yeah, I asked one of the other girls to come in early. I was worried in case your wound had got infected. Looks like you're okay carrying those bags. You're wet. Been out? Yeah, just got back before you. My arm still hurts, but I'll have to grin and bear it. Maria followed me through into the kitchen. I dumped the bags on the breakfast bar, then removed my jacket and hung it over the back of a chair. I hope you like Merlot, she said, and showed me the bottle. Great. With the smile on her face as she put away the groceries, it was easy to work out she was pleased at having company. It began to look as though the last thing on her mind would be to have me arrested. I'll take a shower and change. Then I'll rustle up a meal for us, she said. Yeah, I'll take a shower after you. I've bought a few items of clothing to change into from the local Goodwill store. I was wondering where you got the jacket and sweatshirt from, she said, and headed out of the living room. Much as I wanted to trust her, I had my doubts. No sooner than I heard the bathroom door close, and the shower start, I darted to the side of the sofa, pulled it from the wall, then tipped it over. I took a utility penknife from my pocket and slit the lining underneath. Taking one end of the rope, I tied it to a wooden strut, then stuffed the rope inside the frame together with my leather gloves. Once I tipped the sofa upright, I took the t-shirt and jeans I'd bought from my ruck, then dropped the rucksack behind a curtain drape. The rope was as good an exit plan as I could think of. I'd just dropped my backside on the sofa cushion, when Maria breezed into the room. My eyes popped. She was wearing a short bathrobe. The belt was tied around her waist but it was open enough at the lapels to show more than a little cleavage. She took a seat at the dining table and rummaged in her purse. The bottom half to one side of her bathrobe dropped, revealing her thigh. It could have been gravity at work. It could have been deliberate. Who knows? I guessed the latter. Ah, here it is, she said, and held up a lipstick applicator. Maybe she saw my flushed cheeks. I couldn't be sure, but she looked down at her robe then covered her thigh. The seductive sideways smile told me my guess was the right one. There again, maybe it was wishful thinking on my part. The shower's free now. I'll start the stakes, then get changed. On the way through to take a shower, I had to wonder if this was the second time I'd been played in Detroit. I never could work out the way a woman's mind worked. Maybe that's why I'd stuck to one-night stands since I split with Renee. This situation was different. I wouldn't be sneaking out of someone's bed in the middle of the night without a please or a thank you. Especially knowing they probably were faking sleep anyway, maybe with one eye open, facing away. I imagined it would have been the same as they'd probably done when crying out to fake an orgasm. Maybe they were hoping next time lucky and good riddance. This time, I'd be bedding down for a few days. The attraction was obvious between us. Couldn't be sure if it was a good idea to act on the energy I felt in her presence. Showered and dressed, I headed on back to the living room. Took a seat at the dining table. I've removed the dressing. It could do with a new bandage if you could help. Let's take a look. Maria walked over, clutched at the lapels of her robe to save her modesty. She stooped and inspected the wounds. You're doing fine. Listen, everything is cooking on the stove. I'll get changed, then put on a new bandage for you. Getting a little air to the wound won't harm. Maria shuffled through to her bedroom. Sitting there at the table I watched the exit door along the hallway. I hoped she wouldn't be locked in her bedroom, sending a text to the police that it was all clear. I needn't have bothered. Glanced in her purse. Her cell was at the top. All the same, I rose to my feet. 
tiptoed through the hallway to the door, locked it, bolted it top and bottom, then engaged the security chain. The door was flimsy, easy to bust open with a battering ram. At least securing the door would slow them down. Standing there for a while, I listened with my ear to the door. Footsteps clattered on the concrete stairway. I rolled my eyes. Maybe my luck had run out. Chapter 23 I'd done the drill enough times. Always on the outside. One of us on the battering ram, but more often than not using an explosive charge. One of us either side of the door. One covering behind, stun grenade at the ready. You didn't need to tiptoe, just move quickly with purpose and follow the drill. The other thing I knew was that we didn't wear high heels. If I wasn't mistaken, those were a woman's footsteps I could hear. The clip-clopping echoed in the hallway, then stopped. Looking through the spy hole, the distorted figure of a woman opened her door. Someone at the door? I flustered and turned. Maria had popped her head around the doorframe to her bedroom. Thought I heard someone knock. Must be next door. Anyway, I've locked the door. Yeah, sorry. I forgot, what with the shopping. Thanks. Her door closed. I dropped a coat from the hall stand. If nothing else, it could trip someone up when entering. Back in the living area, I switched on the television. The remote was missing. Fiddling with the control panel, I reduced the sound, then scrolled the channels, stopping at the local news station. Some guy on an outside broadcast was interviewing an old woman who'd been mugged. He signed off back to the station. The news lady was cute. Long blonde hair, but showing black roots. Kneeling on the carpet, on closer inspection, I wasn't so sure about her looking cute. Her face was caked with makeup. Looked like she'd have to scrape it off. She tapped a pile of papers on her desk, as if settling a deck of cards, then she said a smile. Earlier today, gang warfare in Detroit took a nasty turn, with explosions at two houses in the Highland Park area. Six bodies were found at the scene of one house, in what one police source described as the aftermath of a military-style operation. Since then, we have learned that forensics have determined that rocket-propelled grenades were used, together with military-grade explosives. Our reporter was at the scene this morning and recorded this interview. I have to warn viewers the images of the clip we're about to show are disturbing. The screen cut to the outside news report. Sensing someone behind, I turned. Maria was standing at the hallway door. Leaning forward, I turned off the television, then rose to my feet. I couldn't be sure she heard anything of the report. Damn it, you look good. Shame to be eating in, I said. I hoped a little flattery would distract her if she had heard anything. Still, I meant what I said. Her red dress looked as though she had it airbrushed onto her body. Matching shoes and lipstick, with a little makeup, finished off the vision. Only the box she was clutching with a white cross on it seemed out of place. Why thank you kind sir. Had the dress for years. Not much call for dressing up. It isn't every day I get a chance to have a meal with company especially without the kids here. I took a seat at the dining table. Maria opened her magic box, then set about bandaging the wound. I took a deep breath. It was that perfume again. From what she had said about the company, I got the picture. Maria stepped into the kitchen area, opened a cupboard, took out a CD player and plugged it in the mains. To the sound of slow R&B, still with her back to me, and her but squirming to the rhythm, she said, listen, if ever you want to watch television, I keep the remote in this cupboard. I'll let you set the table. I'd forgotten all about the house being devoid of knickknacks until then. Seeing as how she was setting the scene, I didn't like to ask why. With the table set and the food out, Maria flicked the switch onto the wall lights and turned out the main light. I'll let you open the wine. I have another one if this runs out. Her message couldn't be any more loud and clear the way she'd set the mood. She took a seat opposite. I had a need to reinforce my own message. Listen, I'll be gone from here in less than a week's time. Doubt I'll ever get back to Detroit. She held out her glass and I filled it with wine, then I filled my own. The statement seemed to have gone over her head. She took a long swig, draining the glass, then held it out for more. 
I poured her more wine. She offered her glass and toast. We chinked glasses. Here's the ships passing in the night, she said. I hope you accomplish whatever it is you came here for. I'll drink to that, I said, and took a long gulp of the Merlot. It was looking as though Lady Luck was still watching over me. The conversation and a second bottle of wine flowed. It was all good apart from when she told me about her dad. Seems her dad was ex-army. Couldn't settle when he arrived home after getting wounded and then ended it all. He explained why she'd taken me in, beside the gratitude. She hit me with a sideways spin ball. So, has why you're here got anything to do with that news report you were watching? What? You mean that old lady getting mugged? I needed to change the subject. Dwelling on what went down at Greg's and Handbag's houses would have broken the mood. With the last morsel long gone, and only half a glass of wine left, I rose from the chair. Let's sit on the sofa. It'll be more comfortable. Ever the gent where women were concerned, I took her hand and led her to the sofa. Is there an internet cafe around here? Nearest I know of is near Highland Park, she said. But if it means traveling through there and there's a gang war going on, forget it. You could use my laptop. It's in the cupboard with the remote. She'd obviously caught some of the news report. Maybe she heard it all. Thanks, I will. Do the libraries have public computers? Only it's public records I need to search. Yeah. Is there one near here on Woodard? Woodard. You're beginning to sound like a local. You'll be calling the city Detroit next, she said, and laughed, her head involuntarily dropping involuntary. Her hair, combed to one side behind her ear, took on a life of its own. She swept it back behind her ear. It didn't go unnoticed that she touched my knee when she'd laughed. Only fleeting, but a touch is a touch. Well, is there? There's lots. There's a bunch near Midtown, but that's a long ways from here, she said, her words slurring. The avenue goes from downtown through to 8 Mile. That's some distance, but it has intersections around the city named in miles that tells you how far it is from the original settler city center. So people will say, just past 8 Mile and so on. It confuses the hell out of some visitors, like we speak a different language. Her hair dropped over her face again and she swept it back. Yeah, I got that when I asked for a soda today. Server asked me what flavor and I said any. Ended up with an ice cream concoction. Maria smirked. Closed one and sent me a look as if she had me marked as an idiot. Easy mistake. We call it soda pop around here. Got it from Canadians and Brits who call it pop. If you'd have said Coke, they'd have gotten it right away. Maria tilted her head back and closed her eyes. Wow, this wine is strong. For the second time, her head nodded, but now I noticed her eyes glazed. She made no attempt to sweep her hair back into place. Instead, she kicked off her shoes. Maria rested her head on my shoulder. Snuggled up tight. She was right about the wine. Never touched the stuff. I could devour a twelve-pack in one session and still have all my senses working. But the wine? My head was spinning. If I didn't know better, I'd have thought she'd spiked my drink. My eyelids were heavy. Bed, I said. Is that an order? She said, and saluted. Help me up. I'd broken a cardinal rule by drinking. Rising to my feet and swaying, I knew that I'd let down my guard. Repelling out of the window and down to the parking lot would be tricky, with my senses dulled. As much as I was out of it, I still had it in mind that her mother could betray her confidence to the police. What mother wouldn't if she knew her daughter had taken in a stranger with a bullet wound? I took a hold of her hands. Surprised at her strength, she caught me off balance. Tugged me toward her. We collapsed together in a heap, exchanging spit like it was dessert. She broke away. This time she gave the order, and whispered with her lips on my ear. Bed. The next thing I could remember was buzzing. My head pounded. The annoying buzz was faint at first, but getting louder. Chapter 24 Wafting my hand in the air didn't chase away what I imagined was an annoying housefly. The buzzing followed my hand at every turn, as if the damn thing was dive-bombing me. 
Flicking open first one eye, then the other, I sighed at the realization it was my wristwatch alarm. I pressed the off button, raised my head, then glanced along my body. My head hit the pillow. The buzz was gone, replaced with pounding in my temples. We were both fully dressed on top of the bed cover. Hell, I even had my boots on. Maria's arm was draped over my waist. I was in a good place apart from the throbbing. It would have been easy to have wrapped my arm around her and slept some more. Something at the back of my mind told me not to be so stupid. At 3.35, it was the danger hour. Any time in the next hour would be a good time for the police to smash down the door. Maria stirred. Removed her arm from my waist. She rolled over. Snored a few rounds, then she settled into a quiet sleep. The wine, combined with sleep deprivation, had knocked me out. Now I felt alert. It wasn't just my mind on form. If she'd been awake, I could have finished what we'd started. I inched off of the bed. Crept through the open door and pushed it to, just short of the catch clicking. In the living room, the street lights penetrated the net curtain giving some light. Standing to one side of the window for five minutes or so, I peered through a gap in the nets. There were no suspicious vehicles. No shadows that caused alarm. The only noise came from a bunch of tomcats surrounding a female. They fought amongst themselves for the right, meowing and howling, top note. She wasn't having any. Sneaked away undetected. They chased her scent. All was quiet once more. The next hour was pure torture. I was torn between keeping alert and wanting to go and awaken Maria. It was that carnal thing. Pure desire. But then there was that feel-good factor that kept circling. The one of her sleeping with her arm around me. It had felt as if she were protecting me, and not the other way around. Her perfume had impregnated the cushion on the sofa as if she'd left an invite. Only there was no group of suitors circling her. Just me. The guy who wouldn't even give her his name. She deserved better. I crept over to the kitchen area and retrieved her laptop. Anything to keep me on mission and my mind off of Maria. Firing up her computer, I opened the browser, then searched for stolen artifacts from Syria. Two clicks on the search results and I found what I was looking for. The same image of the figure I had in my ruck stared back at me. As stolen goods go, it was hot. Too hot to sell on the open market. But it wasn't just that one figurine. Crates of the stuff had disappeared. I could think of many missions that we'd carried out in Syria. All of them were straight in and out, mission accomplished. None of them concerned artifacts stolen from the museum in Raqqa, the ISIS stronghold. However, it seemed to be a big coincidence that our latest target near the museum was what we'd been working on as a mission over at the horror factory back at base. That was, right up to just before the hits on Hank and Craig. The bigwigs in the terror organization had hidden out in the structure of the Tishreen Dam, together with some high-profile captives. It was no wonder they'd used it as a hiding place. Bombing the dam could have caused chaos if it had been breached. Then right at the last minute, we'd learned that the Kurdish and Arab fighters had wrestled it back from ISIS. Now they were holed up in the larger Tabka Dam. Better defended. We just didn't have the construction blueprints to mount and plan a ground attack. Bombing it could have killed hundreds of thousands. The assessments from Intel at the time was that over one million would be made homeless downstream and only add to the European refugee problem. Not that we gave a flying frog about the Europeans personally. It was all about accountability to diplomatic considerations and the collateral damage to the civilian population. Besides, it would have been considered a war crime. I still had it in mind, with the mission called off, that I couldn't see terrorists risking an attack on U.S. soil knowing they were safe and secure. Never mind having the intelligence set up to know what we were up to. Still, it couldn't be discounted as a possibility. My thoughts fragmented. Greg could have found out about what we were up to from Craig and Hank. He could have sold us out. Maybe his dissatisfaction at the VA could have turned him. The artifact could be nothing more than a coincidence. If my old buddies had let slip to Greg what we had planned before it was called off, then that would be motive enough for him to terminate Craig and Hank if he'd gotten religion and gone native. Unable to think straight, I pounded my forehead with my knuckles, then snatched my vision to the hallway. At the sound of a door creaking, 
I closed the lid on the laptop. Maria appeared. She traded her dress for her short bathrobe. I blinked when she turned on the light. What are you doing sitting in the dark, she said. Couldn't sleep. Did we, you know? No, we didn't, I said, knowing exactly what she meant. The wine, she said. Yeah, it got to me too. We both snickered. The lipstick was gone and she'd wiped away her makeup. Her cheeks flushed. No wonder you couldn't sleep, she said, and sent me a seductive smile, followed by an all-knowing wink. Maria walked over to the curtain, pulled on the drapes. What's this? Maria said. I thought I put it in the gun safe. Yeah, I needed something from inside. Listen, you can't leave it around here. Especially when I've seen a gun at the top. And not when my kids are around. Promise? Her tone of voice had made it an order, requiring a reply. Promise. She dragged it out. I stepped over to her, picked up the ruck and carried it through to the hallway. Maria met me in the hallway as I closed the cleaning cupboard door. Listen, sorry about the ruck, I said. She put her finger on my lips, then said, shush. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. What for? That second bottle of wine. Maria reached forward, rose to her toes, wrapped her arms around my neck, pressed hard against me. We shared a lingering kiss. It was past the danger hour, with dawn breaking. I thought, what the hell, I could always escape from prison. Then I picked her up, carried her into the bedroom, launched her onto the bed. We can't be doing this tomorrow, she said, as I stripped, then climbed beside her. The kids will be here at six this evening. I wasn't sure if her words mentioning the kids were some sort of a test, but my ardor subsided. Resting my head beside her, I looked into her eyes. It was looking as though I was going to be entering unknown territory with her kids around. I didn't need the distraction. Exiting stage left to Porcupine Creek was looking like an option. Maybe I could ask Mom to have them for another day, she said, rescuing the situation. We'll see what tomorrow brings. I said, and unfastened the belt around the robe at her waist. Chapter 25 Rolling over, I reached out to put my arm around Maria. She wasn't there. Maria's space was replaced with her pillow. I pulled it toward me, breathed in her perfume fragrance. My arm throbbed. Maria, I called out, then threw my legs over the side of the bed. Sitting for a while, I rubbed my eyes, then glanced at my watch. 7.30 Maria, I shouted once more. No reply. I pulled on my boxers and headed for the living room. It felt strange to be the one who'd been abandoned. Only the thought that it was her home and she'd have to return put a smile on my lips. Save for that, I'd have felt used. But then that's what we had done. We'd used each other. My instinct told me it was time to move on. I wasn't looking for a relationship. God only knows what I'd expected in coming to Detroit. I sure wasn't a cop. Misguided loyalty to my ex-team buddies? Orders from Lone Wolf? None of that would help me get out of the mess I was in. Sure, I had skills. Surveillance and sniping. How to kill with my hands and with any number of weapons. Thinking quickly on my feet. None of my training had taught me how to gather evidence in a civilian homicide case. It was time to make a phone call. Put an end to it all. A glance at the kitchen table distracted my train of thought. Maria had left a note. A pill bottle was weighing it down. I picked up the note with the bottle and walked through to the kitchen area. Coffee and percolator, but needs switching on. Back at six. You had a restless night. Slept bad. Didn't like to wake you once you went to sleep. Take two tablets. Who's Renee? Take the map if you go out. She'd signed it, Maria followed by, Triple X. Greg had told me that I sometimes mumbled in my sleep. One thing I knew, I hadn't called out Renee's name at the point of no return. I switched on the coffee machine. Took two tablets from the bottle. Gulped them down with a glass of water. On the way to the restroom... I fixated on her question, who's Renee? 
All of a sudden, I had the feeling I was going to have to answer something I didn't want to disclose. My first thought was to make something up. Say she's a sister. Add that to having to meet her kids, and I felt uncomfortable. A quick body wash and dressed, then I headed to the kitchen. Poured the coffee. Took a sip. The pain in my arm had subsided to a dull ache. Her consideration in leaving the tablets had me thinking. She had told me about her ex-husband. Why not tell her about Renee? I unfolded the map. She'd circled some destinations. In the margin, she'd written libraries and then a circle. A smile curled on my lips. She put a roof over my head. Nursed me. Not delved too deep. Bedded me. And now she was my assistant. For those things alone, I decided it was worth staying around to investigate some more. I grabbed a hold of my jacket. Emptied the pockets. Stashed Hustler's phone and a few other items on top of the kitchen cupboard, and headed for the door. I decided not to take a weapon. With the map, I could use the back streets following Woodward and head toward Midtown. Maybe take a bus. Once there, I hoped that I would be like the proverbial needle in the haystack. Difficult to spot. Once outside, I hopped onto a bus. The city center was in stark contrast to the suburbs. It made it hard to imagine that they had carbuncle areas attached the likes of Highland Park. Modern high-rise office blocks and magnificent buildings from better times, together with bustling sidewalks, gave it energy, with no indication of bankruptcy. The only thing that gave away the financial situation was the traffic cones cordoning off potholes and seriously cracked asphalt. The bus passed the Chase Tower on Woodward Avenue. Yet more road works without anyone working on them. You stop, buddy, said the driver. The door sucked open. Take a left on Putnam, then left again. Can't miss it. He was right. Set back off the road, I walked along the semicircular driveway and to the entrance. Four off-red concrete columns at the entrance looked out set against the light and dark gray tiles of the structure. I signed in at reception as a guest and headed for the Federal Depository Collection. What is it you want? The clerk asked. I need to search limited corporation records. Do you have a computer? No. There's a fee. No problem. I dug in my pocket for some bills and paid the fee. If you need anything printing off, there's a separate charge. Thanks. Settled at a computer station. I pulled up the record for CTM import and export. Mohammed Ali Hassan, majority shareholder and CEO. He explained why Anbeg called him Mo, which I'd guessed right anyway. I searched his name. He had a further list of 12 businesses, including an oil refinery and a chain of gas stations. The guy was seriously rich. Over at the clerk's desk, I arranged for him to print the list. Can I get access to the web? Only if you have your own device. Do you have one I can borrow for a quick search? I can pay, I said, looking right and left, then dropped $30 on his desk. He slipped the $30 into his pocket. Pushed his keyboard over, then turned his monitor to face me. Sure, but make it quick. I typed in most full name and the word images into the browser search, then hit the mouse button. I searched through them. Most of the images, he had his back turned or was covering his face with his hand. Bingo! I found one mentioning him opening his business on the docks. He looked different. For a start he looked shocked, sporting a long chin beard and no tie. Obviously a Shiite by the looks of his appearance. That wasn't how he looked now. The guy I'd seen was wearing a suit and tie, with a goatee beard. But as the caption said, it was him. It said he was from Lebanon but his name screamed Iraq to me. Not only that, but the distinct scar under his eye reminded me of a target from years ago. But that wasn't his name. That guy was high up in Saddam's Ba'ath party. A Sunni. Can you print off this image for me and I'll be gone? Sure. That'll be one dollar. Yeah, right. Take it out of the thirty. He didn't protest. Maybe it was how I snarled my words. Heading outside with the print copies, I was disappointed that there wasn't a Syrian connection. Thinking that, he still intrigued me. If he was who I thought it was, 
We assisted the CIA in removing him from Iraq. The whys and wherefores, we were never told. Walking along Cass Street, a car with a blue hood and police written across it was parked by the sidewalk. The cop was leaning over onto the passenger seat. He looked up at me. I quickened my pace and bowed my head. I scrunched the copies into a ball, then dumped them over some bushes. I knew exactly who the cop was. What I should have done was run. Police. On the ground now. Arms outstretched. Chapter 26 Raising my head like a tortoise as I lay on the ground, I saw a young black woman pull out her cell phone. She was maybe twenty yards away on the sidewalk. The way she held the phone, I knew she was recording. At least I had a witness. A knee dug into my back, the force taking my breath. A hand grabbed my head and forced it to the sidewalk. Offering no resistance, he levered one arm at a time behind my back and cuffed me. For good measure, I felt a plastic strap bind my wrists. The cop leaned over, his lips to my ear. The guy was salivating. I hear you're good at removing cuffs, scumbag. It ain't happening again on my watch. He patted me down. Pulled my penknife from my pocket. It was just my luck for the cop to be the one who worked the stinger on me and to clock who I was. A boot connected in my side. I winced. Get in the back of my car. Time for me to collect my five grand. Now I knew how much I was worth the handbag. A hand grabbed my neck. He bounced my head on the concrete, then dragged me to my feet. Resisting with a boot in his groin could have cost me a bullet in the back of my head if I had cut and ran. It would be on the woman's video recording. Proof that I tried to escape. That alone would mitigate his rough treatment and give him just cause to kill me. He forced my head down. Planted a boot on my backside. Nothing sophisticated like a sway of the hip to get me inside his car. I scrambled the rest of the way onto the seat. The cop slammed the door. What the? I heard Stinger call out through his open passenger window. Give me the phone. He wrestled the phone from the woman. A car pulled up behind. What you doing, man? It was the tall cop who first stopped me after I tussled with fat guy. Deleting the recording. Sick of people interfering in police business. She ain't putting me on social media. Stinger thrust the cell phone back at the woman. Now get the hell out of here before I arrest you too. You can't go's doing that. I have rights. You done beat on him for doing nothing. She scurried off. You sent for the wagon? Tall cop said. Stinger opened his car door. No need. Finished my shift. It'll save the city money if I take him. What's he done? Hanging around a car with intent to steal. Concealed weapon. That's bullcrap. Ask him to show you the weapon. It's a small penknife. Where's there a car parked around here? Tall cop stooped. Looked me over. Wait. That's the guy I stopped, remember? Better phone Danny Blake over at Homicide Division. My thoughts scrambled. Maybe they found fat guy. He'd stopped me in the vicinity where I'd left the corpse. I told you, I'll take him. Not if he is who I think he is. Tall cop pulled at his mic on his lapel and opened the driver's door. Dropped his but side saddle on the seat. Officer A-93 to dispatch. Suspect apprehended outside the public library. Possible code 1035. Need patching through to Detective Blake. Copy that. What you doing, man? I said I'd take him. Tall cop showed him his hand. Blake here. That suspect we talked about. He's apprehended. Do you want us to bring him in? No. I'm on my way. Where are you? Cass Street. Next to the library, he said. Copy that. Tall cop turned to Stinger. We're to wait here. Stinger took off his cap and slapped it on his thigh. Pulled out his cell phone. Put it to his ear. Tall cop climbed out of the seat and left the door open. He didn't realize it, but he just saved my life. Through the grill separating the back seat from the front, the vehicle looked past its cell by date. I leaned forward. The guy was a slob. 
plastic coffee cups and fast food cartons littered the passenger seat and foot space. I could not never move the double cuffs even if I wanted. The open door looked inviting, but the grill was rock solid. Stinger might have taken his eye of the ball by walking away, but Tall Cop was right there. I pushed back in the seat. What's this about me being a suspect? You'll find out when you get back to headquarters. A sort of resignation washed over me. With my hands behind my back, I couldn't reach for the lockpick that he'd missed. It was tucked away in my small coin pocket of my jeans. Besides, removing the plastic cuffs would be difficult. Stinger was out of earshot at the entrance to the library driveway, still talking on his cell phone. It was the shifty way he kept looking over that I didn't like. Ten minutes was a long time to be jawing on the phone. At the sound of brakes screeching and the loud fart of an exhaust on its last legs, I turned. The door to the back seat opened. Get out! Detective Blake's here for you. It was some entrance. You could have heard Blake's car coming from a mile away. There was no excuse for the exhaust. That was down to pure neglect. As for his brakes, he could have thrown a shoe on the way over. I moved along the bench seat and swung my legs over, planting my boots on the sidewalk. I glanced along the sidewalk at Stinger. He threw me a glance, still with the phone pressed to his ear, then stepped back out of view. I couldn't be sure if he had been staring at me, or if he'd looked past me. Turning to look over my right shoulder, a black sedan drove toward us. The windows were open. Rifle barrels were poking out. Get down, I screamed, head-butting tall cop in his stomach. We're gonna be hit. A crescendo of rounds rang out. Bullets ripped through the body of the car. Some splintered the granite on the building behind me. I'd already rolled behind the wheel at the engine. Blake was out of his car, crouched at the rear behind the trunk, returning fire. There was an almighty crash. Glancing along to the library entrance, I noticed Stinger was firing rounds in the air. Tall cop scrambled to his feet. His shirt collar had a dark patch. He'd been hit. He pulled his firearm from its holster. Walked nonchalantly past me then onto the road. Bam, 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 I heard, and sneaked to look over the hood. The sedan was smashed against an excavator at the roadworks. Tall cop wasn't even crouching. He wasn't even holding his firearm two-handed. A guy covered in tattoos and wearing a string undershirt rolled out of the sedan, rifle in hand. Tall cop raised his arm. Bam, bam, bam. The first two smashed into the guy's chest. The last one put a hole in his forehead. All went quiet, then, bam. The body of the tattooed guy twitched. From the direction of the last round, I had a good idea who had fired that last shot into what must have already been a stiff. Stinger crept toward the sedan, arriving there first. He fired two rounds through the open door, then reached inside. All clear, he said, then holstered his pistol. A hand grabbed me by the shoulder. You get against the wall, tall cop said. It didn't take long for the road to be awash with every imaginable type of law enforcement vehicles. I owe you, tall cop said. You've made it this far. Don't try anything stupid. Besides the dark patch on his shirt, I noticed a graze of the tall cop's forehead. You okay? I asked him. I'm fine. Just a bullet graze, he said, and touched the graze with his fingers. Why did they want you dead? Me? Hell, it's nothing to do with me. Maybe it was you they were after. Yeah, right. Anyway, the wagon's here. On your feet. He'd been some marksman. Cool as a cucumber under fire. I guessed he could have been ex-army. Maybe that's why he'd made a connection with me when I'd mentioned I was military. They wasted no time fastening the leg irons and cuffs. Then they dumped me inside the wagon. It was only a short ride to homicide headquarters. The elevator was out of action. It took as long as the ride to shuffle up to the division offices and into an interview room. There was a lot to think about. Stories to concoct. I fixated on the red LED of the camera recording my presence. There'd be no sack over my head. No chainsaw. No screaming in my ear. Glancing at the locked door with a remote-controlled solenoid lock, there'd be no escape either. It was just me and my wits. 
In a perverted way, I was looking forward to the game. Chapter 27 Thirty minutes waiting in the interview room, and my bicep developed a throb from hell at the bullet wound. I didn't know if it was procedure to leave me shackled that long. Maybe they had an angle as to who I was. They could have had me down this highly dangerous. Someone not to be messed with. Or it could have been some kind of textbook psychological move. Some sort of trick to have criminals to come unglued with the weight. The last thing I wanted was to headbutt a button on the wall above a speaker and tell them about my injury. They'd ask questions. Take photographs. Put two and two together and make ten. All I could do was to suffer in silence. Saying silence, the starter on the fluorescent which started out as a low hum, now seemed to be a high-pitched buzz. Only it wasn't. I guess my senses were heightened. I'd rather have had the sort of torture where someone screamed in my ear. The white walls were closing in on me. Apart from a desk and three chairs, and the ever-present red-eye on the wall camera, there wasn't anything to distract in a good way. But then that's the way they liked it, I guessed, all clinical and strictly business. I could be sure of that. On the desk was a buff folder. Scrawled across it at the top in red felt tip at red statements. If they were hoping for a confession, they were mistaken. I heard the sound of someone walking along the corridor outside. Their footsteps were loud, like someone walking with a sense of purpose. Whoever it was, they stopped at the door. The lock buzzed, then clicked open. I was expecting Blake. Tall cop entered. What are you doing here? I asked. Statement. I need a statement about what happened back there. Detective Blake will be along shortly. How long do I have to suffer these? I said, then jiggled the chain connected from my wrist cuffs to the belt at the waist, and on down to the shackles at my ankles. I'm surprised you still have them. Blake will sort that out. His answer ruled out that they thought I was dangerous, or that they knew I was special forces. For sure they wouldn't remove them if they had tied me to the homicides back at Fort Bragg. That information alone would have had their but squeaking at their own security. It can't have been much of a bullet graze on his neck. All he had was a large band-aid over the wound. It was a credit to him not to have thrown a sickie and taken time off. Most cops, I imagined, would go straight to the hospital, then file a compensation claim. What about the bullet you took your, your upper body? It wasn't a bullet. I'd had surgery and bust the stitched when he knocked me over. He could have been an honest cop. I could have been wrong. You ex-army? I asked him. Yeah. Kuwait and Iraq. Then stints at different barracks back home. CID investigator in the Marine Corps. Where are you stationed? He asked me. I shrugged my shoulders. Ignored his question. So you were CID? Military police. I pointed my finger. Hey, the camera. Right to remain silent. You should know that. As soon as Blake realizes his mistake, I'll jaw with you all day long over a beer about the army, but... Understand. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm grateful for what you did back there. I guess he'd had to ask the question. Finding out anything about my army record through official channels would be difficult, even for an ex-military investigator. Likely he'd be on admin leave before the day was out with him discharging his weapon, pending investigation. Hopefully, that would be him tied up, unable to check me out. How come you ended up a traffic cop? Not much chance of walking straight into a detective job in Civvy Street. You have to pay your dues. Blake's helping me try to make detective, but I won't hold my breath. Not with the budget cuts. The lock buzzing interrupted the conversation. Blake breezed into the room. He tossed a bunch of keys over to tall cop. Hands the size of shovels plucked them from the air. Take the shackles off of him. We won't be needing those just yet. Should I leave? Tall cop said, then unshackled me. No, you can take a chair. Blake dragged a chair to the side of the desk, then sat and faced me. He dropped two zipped plastic bags on the table. One of them held my driving license. The other my penknife and wristwatch. There wasn't the $300 I'd had in my pocket. Not even the loose change. His appearance told me that he looked after himself better than the department looked after his car. 
His bald head had a shine to it. Clean-shaven. Starched white shirt with a plain blue tie. His trouser crease looked sharp enough that it could cut a finger. He didn't sound like a local, more like a Californian. Quick thinking back there. Well spotted. What is it you've done to annoy MS-13 that they'd want to snuff you out, Blake said. Even I knew that MS-13 were notorious contract killers, besides all their other criminal activities. I imagined Handbag arranged the hit after Stinger had phoned him. Especially with Handbag suffering a shortage of personnel at the time. I'd look in your own backyard if I were you. Maybe they'd been tailing you. They arrived right after you. Some bust you'd made in the past, perhaps? Nothing to do with me. So anyway, are you sticking with the trumped-up charges, or can I go now? We'll deal with the charges later. Where do you know Officer Connor from? Who? He's the one who arrested you. Don't know him. Never met him before. He turned to tall cop. Didn't you say Officer Connor attended the scene after you'd stopped him the other night? Yeah. Ah, so it was your buddy, I said. It was dark. No street lights. Raining. Didn't pay any attention. Fair enough. Where are you staying in Detroit? I started a coughing fit. When you're interrogated, it's not what you know as much as what they know that's the problem. I knew Tall Cop had read Greg's name and address from the note. Maybe it had registered with him, maybe it hadn't. I slapped my chest. That's better. What's the street called where you stopped me? Sorry, what's your name? Officer Granger. What's that got to do with where you're staying? Well, like I said at the time, I was meant to be staying with a buddy of mine, but he had to go away on business. That night you stopped me. I took shelter in a derelict house opposite to get out of the rain. I've been sleeping rough there ever since. They exchanged glances. We'll be back soon. I just need a private word with Officer Granger. Can I get you coffee? No thanks. I'm fine. What was your buddy's name? There was no point lying. Granger could have his name imprinted on his mind. Greg. Greg Bell. Left alone, I could see where this was heading. Granger would have a sharp mind as an ex-investigator. As someone who knew the area, he would have known Greg's address in Highland Park. It's not as if there were any other houses in the street. Now they would know there were no houses standing. They hadn't seemed interested in the trumped-up charges Connor had leveled my way. It was clear to me that this was heading to my mission at Handbag's house. Their private words ran to fifteen minutes. Blake and Granger entered. Took their seats. Well now, we have a problem, Blake said. Yeah, what's that? The address you had for your buddy. It's not registered to him. It's registered to the city. In fact, it's due for demolition. That revelation hit me like a sidewinder, but it didn't surprise me. Besides Greg saying he'd bought the house, I imagined Rose had been part of Greg's story. A figment of his fertile mind. Whirlwind romance he'd said over the phone. Even the security business he said he had was probably fabricated. I'd noticed that the signs on his van were magnetic plates. Blake was clever not saying that he knew the house was already down to the foundations. I showed him my palms. Hey, that's not my problem. Hell, I don't have the title to the house where I'm bunking down. Blake drummed his fingers on the table. His eyes narrowed. For someone who acted smooth, he was clearly rattled. Describe the inside of the house where you say you're staying. I only sleep in the kitchen. There are marks on the walls where the cupboards have been removed. No sink. Oh, and a broken stool with a leg missing. Check it out. You'll probably see smudges in the dust at the corner where I sleep. Oh, we'll check it out all right. This address on your license. Is it current? Obviously not. I've just said where I'm bunking down. You think you're smart, don't you? Granger here said you told him this Greg Bell was ex-army. So here we have two army guys in Detroit of no fixed address. Then we have a military-style operation, leaving six dead. Nearby what you said was your buddy's house. Only it isn't his house, is it? I'd say that puts you two in the frame. Wouldn't you, said Blake? I'd say you're full of crap. 
I know nothing about no mission. If we're heading in that direction, I want to make a phone call cause I'm keeping it buttoned. One other thing, you've not charged me, so I'm free to go, right? Kinda read your rights when he charged and arrested you, so you can't go anywhere. No, he didn't. I have a witness. Fat black chick. Wearing a McDonald uniform. It shouldn't be hard to find her. Ask Granger here what Connor did to her phone. Granger's cheeks reddened. Blake rolled his eyes. Even I knew he should have confirmed I'd been read my rights before the interview started. We'll take a break. Then I'll read you your rights and lay out the charges again if you try to leave. Seeing as how you've no money and you're homeless, I might just add vagrancy. Blake slapped his hands on the desk, then rose to his feet. Take him to a phone. Yeah, and while you're having your break, ask Connor where my $300 has gotten to, and my loose change. Forget about vagrancy. My attorney will give me a loan. It was the one phone call I hoped I wouldn't have to make. But Blake was slick. I now knew what they thought they had on me. He must have had doubts about Connor's charges, for him to try the vagrancy angle as a means to keep me. I wasn't even sure if there was such a crime as vagrancy and it was just a ruse. At the phone, I put my hand over the mouthpiece. It's private. Granger shuffled away, but didn't take his eyes off of me for one second. His holster was empty. Probably he had to hand his gun in for ballistics. He was all that was between me and the exit door. I had to remember he'd served in the Marines. Investigator or not, he'd still had to have undergone their rigorous training, including unarmed combat. The training would not be something you would forget over time. You'd just be a little rusty. Besides, my arm was, was injured. Letting out a sigh, I dialed the number. LW? I said, having kept my voice low. Yeah. I need an attorney. Homicide Headquarters, Detroit. Affirmative. What's your position? Dire, but I have info. I need out. Give it one hour, maybe more. Granger escorted me back to the interview room. He stepped into the room with me. It could take more than an hour for my attorney to arrive. I don't need the company if you don't mind. Suit yourself. Just tell me one thing. Are you in Detroit on official army business? Who said I was still in the army? You did. No, I didn't. You mentioned your military ID had been stolen. Yeah, my discharge papers. Anyways, as I said, no company until my attorney arrives. He didn't need telling twice, turned on his heels, and left me to my own devices. I pulled the plastic bag with my wristwatch and penknife toward me. It defied belief that the dumbass cops had not removed the items from the room. Checking the time, an hour had already passed. There was me thinking that all I would have had to have done when I arrived was to point out that a flimsy penknife with a two-inch blade was hardly a weapon or a device for opening car locks. Then maybe they would have released me. Damned blade would have snapped if I tried it in a car lock. But then I thought they would know that. That thought hung in the air for a while. I didn't try sleight of hand, but simply opened the evidence bag, then put my penknife and wristwatch in my pocket. No one rushed into the room, so I did the same with the driving license, then tossed the bags into the wastebasket. Playing an imaginary piano on the desk surface, I tapped out a beat. The door lock buzzed. Granger opened the door and held it open. A guy wearing a suit walked inside. You'll be my attorney then? No. CIA agent Adams. He handed me his calling card. It looked legit. Chapter 28 I wasn't expecting an attorney using the guise of a CIA agent to arrange an extraction. If it was a game, it had me flustered. I knew Lone Wolf could have had their backing for me to go under the radar for my own security. He could have alerted them I had a problem. I'd have to tread lightly. Be careful with what I said. I'll leave you two alone and have them turn off the camera, Granger said, then he closed the door. Adams took a seat. Stared at me. Opened a buff file. Tilted it so I couldn't see the contents. If he was going to burst out laughing any minute, his expression wasn't giving it away. Edward Joyce, he said. I still couldn't be sure if it was a game. 
He was no one I knew. All I could do was play along. What is it you want? Glancing at the camera, I noticed that the red LED had extinguished. His eyes followed my line of vision. It's off the record. We can talk freely, he said. Freely meant I could lie from the top of my head, then deny it all if he really was CIA. What's the CIA got to do with someone suspected of breaking into a car? That's not why I'm here. I think you know why I'm here. So why don't you tell me? Now I was really flustered. Why was he there? Assuming he was real, CIA operated generally overseas. Homeland Security is involved in security matters on the mainland. The FBI deals with cross-border crime and assists security services with forensics and tagging terrorists on home soil. Okay, so sometimes their paths crossed, but the visit didn't square with me. What I wanted to say was to stop messing around. He could have still been winding me up. Lone Wolf could have sent him. Not got a clue. I'm just waiting for my attorney. Okay, I'll start. Where did you get this driver license from? Adams asked, removing a photocopy of my license from his file and pushed it toward me. If it's all the same, I'll plead the fifth until my attorney arrives. Listen, smartass, it's quite simple. The police searched the license and traffic violation database. That flagged it to us. Do you have any idea how or why that would happen? Damn, I'd never thought. CIA issued the license and other documents for when we were parachuted into Colombia. It made sense they'd keep a record for if we were captured and someone tried to check out our background. I'd have thought they scrubbed the record once the mission was over. There was one thing I couldn't hide. He would know who I was. It was my mugshot on the license, and no mistake. They'd likely have the original photo on file with my real name. You can see it's my picture. So I forgot to hand it in. So what? I'll hand it in when I get back to Sockham. It's not that simple. I'll have to report you for using a false identity without permission. The guy was a jerk. He wasn't acting as if Lone Wolf had sent him. If he had sent him, he'd gone off script. I haven't used it. Well, pardon me, but the police here think you're Edward Joyce. They're assuming that. I haven't given them anything. Only asked for an attorney. Besides, they're holding me on trumped-up charges. Not worth giving the game away who I am in the interests of national security. You should appreciate that. As soon as my attorney arrives, I'll be out of here. Yeah, they said that. Oh, really? Seems they checked a camera showing the action after your arrest. They saw footage earlier of the officer taking you down from the CCTV at a nearby building. An overzealous cop from what they said. Oh, did they? Yeah. They're just trying to hold onto you to see what you know about the gang warfare that went down in the early hours yesterday. Yeah, well that's nothing to do with me. I was only visiting a friend here. Looks as though I had the wrong address. Never got to see him. You're lucky you didn't get killed with a stray bullet. Blake said he put away one of the MS-13 gang for life a few months ago. He thinks he was the target. Listen, forget about me reporting you not handing in the license. I can see it's you from the photo. We just needed to be sure. Make sure you hand it in. That's our only interest. The door lock buzzed, then opened. Adams walked over to the door. He'd made a mistake. His buff folder was on the desk. I flicked it open, then closed it again. He exchanged a few words with Granger. Your attorney is here. Good luck, he said, then stepped over to the desk. Swooped up the photocopy of the license. Placed it in his folder. I recognized my visitor right away. The attorney swept into the room. Caught the CIA guy shoulder to shoulder as he exited. His suit was a size too big. The spotted bow tie looked hideous. He heaved his briefcase onto the desk. I trust we'll have privacy, he said and turned to Granger over at the door. The camera is off if that's what you mean. No, I meant as in, take a hike. You were listening at the door before that other guy left. I'll go outside for a smoke break. You do that. Granger closed the door. The attorney walked over and pressed his ear to the door. Right, he's gone. What was that guy that just left? 
C.A. I thought Lone Wolf had sent him. Didn't say anything. You can explain what he wanted later. Have they charged you with anything? No, not officially. Let's get out of here then. Blake's tied up in the office. I told him we'd be thirty minutes. You didn't sound like an attorney when you spoke to Granger. You're lucky you didn't give the game away. Gotta have some fun. Don't be a wuss. This'll be a cakewalk. He opened his briefcase. Fingered some lockpicks. James Bond would have been proud of the goodies he had stacked in there, except for the apple. Those picks won't help. It's a solenoid, I said. Besides, if we play it by the book, I could walk away without legal assistance. Can't take chances. Lone Wolf said to get you out of here. The cops here haven't found out you're wanted back at Fort Bragg yet. If, or should I say, when they find that out, we can't help. The lock? He held up a cube of metal. Magnum do it. Come on, chop, chop. Over at the door, he swiped the magnet over the side of the lock. It buzzed, then clicked open. Chin up, shoulders straight. No looking over your shoulder. We walked briskly toward the exit. Passed through the swing doors. Down the stairway. That was quick, said Granger. He was leaning against a wall, puffing on a cigarette. Don't call me Slick Eddie for nothing, said Scrounger, as he was affectionately called in the unit. Granger tapped me on the shoulder. Listen, about that drink and a chat. You can find me most lunchtimes over at the Maple Bar on Holden Street. I doubt I'll be around here that long, I said. Whatever, he said, then stubbed out his cigarette with his boot. That's a pity. There's something I wanted to ask you off the record. I ignored him. At the same time it intrigued me what he'd wanted to know. We headed out of the parking lot. Scrounger had parked out on the street away from the parking lot cameras. He ripped off his bow tie. Unfastened his shirt at the collar. Dumped his coat on the back seat. We need to get back to the chopper. You can fill me in on the way. Lone Wolf wants you to hang around here, but you have to be back as promised. You can use the car to drive back to the city. What time does it have to be back at the depot? Depot. Don't be stupid. It's not a rental car. Don't worry, the owners are on vacation. I'd not noticed the smashed steering column and the wires hanging loose. I eased a piece of paper out of my coin pocket. Here, get this checked out. Greg's supposed to be staying there at his in-laws. He says he's married to someone called Rose. His cell phone number is on there. I need someone to find his cell tower movements. He's up to his eyeballs in something. I need to find him. I set about giving him the details of my time in Detroit, chapter and verse. We parked. Scrounger opened his briefcase. Handed me a wallet. You'll need money for a taxi. Take this. Watching Scrounger climb into the chopper, my mind ran away with itself. CIA guys aren't anyone's buddies. They wouldn't give you steam off of their crap unless they were forced to. He'd obviously not alerted the police as to who I was. I thought it was dumb to walk out of there the way we had. All I worked at that I could say, if needed, was that as I had not been officially charged, my attorney said I was free to leave and the door had been left ajar, and that we couldn't find Blake to tell him you were leaving. All the same, I reckoned every cop in Detroit would be on the lookout for me. Sometimes orders could be a curse. The CIA guy had given enough info for a real attorney to get me out of there legit. The picture I'd seen in his file gave me an idea why Adams wanted me on the loose. What I didn't get was where he had gotten it from and why he hadn't asked questions about the subject. No one followed me into the library. Or had they, I wondered. Chapter 29 With the car ditched and the Salvation Army store providing a change of clothes, I still felt conspicuous. Sometimes it's best to hide in plain sight instead of skulking in the shadows. At least that was the theory. It had worked at the diner. There was no guarantee it would work a second time. Still, I was back in Midtown chancing my luck. I wondered if I was mad going back to the scene of the attempted MS-13 hit. My shirt collar was a touch on the tight side, so I loosened the tie and unfastened the top button. 
I could never recall wearing a suit and tie. One thing I noticed was that people were less inclined to shun me, even garnering the occasional smiles from passers-by. I could see why detectives earned respect. That thought gave me an idea. It was business as usual along Cass Avenue. The excavator was still there, but everything else had been moved. The only sign there had been a shootout was the police tape adorning the traffic cones at the roadworks. Not a cop car in sight. I let the newspaper under my arm drop to the sidewalk. Bending down, I quickly scanned where I tossed the scrunched-up photocopies. There was no sign of them. As I rose, I noticed a camera covering the area. If the bluff I had in mind didn't work, I'd be screwed. I had to know what the police knew. I had to know if I was followed into the library. I left my clothes bag in an alcove at the vestibule. The woman in reception was busy taking a call. She replaced the handset and smiled. Can I help you? Yes. My colleagues checked the security footage from the camera outside earlier. Don't say they forgot something. Nah, only they want me to look at the earlier footage before the incident. Come through. It's in the back room here. The woman was chatty. Showed me how it all worked. Left me to my own devices. Scrolling back to the footage to before I entered the library driveway, there was no sign of anyone following. Fast forwarding, I ran through to where I tossed the papers, then set it at normal speed. If Blake had seen what I was witnessing, he'd know that Connor was crooked, down to him slipping my bills into his pocket. One thing it didn't cover was Connor firing his shots in the air. Slowing down the speed as Connor reached into the SUV, I froze the image. Moved it on one frame at a time. When he'd holstered his gun to shout the all clear, his other hand was briefly behind his back. That had to be him pocketing one of the gang's cell phones. Likely the one he'd called to direct the hit. It would be easy to miss at normal speed if it wasn't something you were looking for. Punching the fast forward key, it was like watching a Keystone Cops movie. Blake looked directly at the camera, then disappeared from view. From the time it took for him to return, I guessed he was checking the camera footage. He returned and looked in the bushes. He picked up the scrunched photocopies and unraveled them. Right away, he made a phone call. Thirty minutes later a car arrived. A guy climbed out of the car. Talked to Blake. He showed him the photocopies. Blake pointed to the camera and they both looked straight into the shot. It was Agent Adams. I'd seen enough. Enough to know I didn't know where the hell Adams fit into the picture. I spent the next few minutes deleting me entering the building and walking over to reception. That's it. I'm done. Thanks. No problem, detective, she said. Detective, I thought. I had to smile as I walked out with my back to the camera. At the same time, my thoughts scrambled. Adams had lied about the police searching the license database for it to alert CIA. Thinking that, he knew about the false license. He could have been the one to have searched records. One thing for sure, Blake knew who Mo was and so did the CIA. The footage I'd seen made that obvious. Blake knew enough to phone Adams. It was Mo's photo in Adams' file. What I didn't know was why they were working together. One other thing I didn't know was if Adams had told Blake I was using a false name. Or that I was from the unit back at Fort Bragg. He can't have told them I was wanted for homicide, or they'd never have removed the shackles. I glanced at my watch. I'd had enough for one day. It was time to be catching a bus back to Maria's apartment and to meet her kids. I picked up my clothes bag and headed for the bus stop. The bus journey was a blur. I realized that I was out of my depth. All this investigating stuff wasn't what I was trained for. The thing that kept pounding in my brain was that I was being used and chased by everyone. Okay, so I'd been skeptical about Greg from the outset. All the same, I wasn't to know for sure he was lying. He could have been telling the truth at the time. Maybe he'd learned too much from me in the telling stories department. He'd made it all sound plausible. A thought struck me. He could have been working off the books for the CIA or some other agency. He could have taken on a mercenary contract from someone. If Charlie was his aunt, that would make his wife Greg's uncle. Truth was, I just couldn't work out what was going on. Let alone know if there was a connection back to the homicides back at Fort Bragg. 
clambering up the stairway to Maria's apartment, I had it in mind to hide away there for the rest of my time in Detroit. Then go back to base to face the music. Tell them it was a dead end in Detroit. But then I recalled Moe's address listed on his business records. Least I could do was to sneak a look at his lifestyle. Perching like a stork on one leg, I took the key from my sock, then opened the door. It was gone six. The apartment was deadly quiet. I felt secure with the door closed behind me. Only the invisible man could have followed me. Adams didn't even shake my hand, so there was no chance he'd left a tracker device on me. It was like I was in my own little castle with the drawbridge up. I hung the clothes bag on the hallway stand. No sooner had I hit the living room than I turned at a sound of a key in the lock. Roberto, come back here, Maria's voice called out. Maria and a young girl were silhouetted in the doorway to the exit. A boy ran down the hallway. Only got a good look as he stopped at the entrance to the living room. He was around seven years old, wearing a full Spider-Man outfit. He trapped his hands and feet on the doorframe and shimmied up the frame until his head hit the top. He mustn't have seen me. Then our eyes locked. He looked like he'd seen a ghost. Maria shouted, Get down this minute. Losing his grip, he was about to hit the floor when she scooped her arms around him and set him down. He inched around her, hiding behind her coat. Sorry about the dramatic entrance. He can get hyper at times. He popped his head around her, then ducked back. Mom, let me through, will you? said a young girl's voice. Her daughter was around twelve years old. She marched with purpose over to the sofa, then dropped her backside on the cushion. Anna crossed her arms over her stomach. I couldn't be sure she had been in the middle of an argument with her mom, but she sulked. Don't be ignorant. Show your manners, Maria said. This is Ted that I told you about. So you're Anna. Pleased to meet you. She wasn't having any and huffed. Then she rose and marched back to the hallway. Where are you going, young lady? Come back here and say hi. I'm going to the restroom, okay? The hallway door slammed. Sorry about that. I think it's her hormones. She'll come around. Don't worry about it, I said. You scrub up well. You look good in a suit, Maria said. Maria looked harassed. Worried. I smiled. Man, she was hot. Hot but vulnerable. Unsure of herself. I took her hand. Gave it a squeeze, then let go. Thanks, but I don't feel good. I'll change when she's finished in the restroom. Maria walked over to the television. She switched it on together with the game's machine. Roberto sneaked a look at me from behind her coat. When she walked away, Roberto was cross-legged on the floor, eyes glued to the screen as a Spider-Man game loaded. That's him settled, she said, and removed her coat. Only Anna to sort out, and I'll make us a meal, she said. I'm paying a visit to Amtramp tomorrow. Is it far from here? It's on that map I gave you. Not far. Over to the west. Why would you want to go there? Nothing but Arabs and Polish live there. Looking for a job. Oh. Fine. Roberto jumped up. Ran around the room. Arms out as if flying. He stopped in front of me, set a crouch, then threw an outstretched hand at me. Spreading his fingers, I imagined he was throwing me an imaginary Spider-Man's web. Then he charged around the room. Knocked over a dining room chair. Maria snatched him into her arms. Calmed him down. I could see why the chairs had protection, and why the room was void of knickknacks. Come on, sunshine. Back to your game, she said, and pressed the reset button. Autism, she whispered, as she joined me at the sofa. Ah. Got it. Anna walked back into the room. Picked up the upturned chair and took a seat. She changed out of her school uniform. Slammed down what looked like a school book on the table. Homework, hon, said Maria. Anna mumbled. Listen, lady. You can stop this before you start, said Maria. Maria turned to me. Listen, she's not usually like this. I got this, I said, and walked over to Anna. Don't know why. 
I wasn't exactly experienced in the children's department. What's the problem? Is it me staying here, or the homework? She turned on her seat. Put her hands at her waist. No, it's her. We were fine on our own. Just don't expect me calling you uncle. Don't expect me calling you anything. Maria shouted, Anna. Anna rose to her feet, tears in her eyes, and ran back into the hallway. Maria blushed. I shrugged my shoulders. Sorry, I wasn't expecting this, Maria said, and then hurried through into the hallway. Roberto set off on another run around the room. Climbed on the sofa, then dived. I caught him before he landed on the carpet. He pounded my chest and I let go. I was left dumbstruck and flopped onto the sofa. I wasn't sure if I could handle the few hours before I hoped it was their bedtime, never mind three days. I'd rather have faced down terrorists. It was no wonder she'd made the best of last night. The last thing I wanted was to feel sorry for her. In a way, her situation only had me feeling admiration for her. Roberto pulled a comic from under the sofa cushion. He sidled up to me. Dropped the comic in my lap. He didn't say anything. He didn't even look at me. Like a fish out of water, I floundered as he climbed onto the sofa and sat on my knee. All I knew was that this wasn't my scene. I had a decision to make as usual, but my mind wouldn't engage. Chapter 30 The Fourth Night Maria walked into the living room. Roberto flew through the air and landed on the sofa. Really, Maria said. Someone will get hurt. It's only a kid doing what kids do. Roberto climbed off of the sofa and lined up for another airplane ride. Lying on my back, I grabbed his hands. He dug his stomach to my boots and I launched him at the sofa to him squealing with delight. Stop it! What if he bangs his head? I have enough with two kids, never mind three. Spoil sport. He's having fun. All the same I want him quieted down, not hyper. I have his school reading book here. You could help him read while I make something to eat. Less chance of him having a seizure that way. I rose to my feet. Took a hold of the book. Roberto clung to me with his arms around my waist. Sorry, son. Moody Pants there says we're to read. We sat down. I opened the first page. He was way behind for his age. It was one of those early in the series of Peter and Jane type books with images. Don't look at him when you read the words, or what you say will be jumbled. Why is that? Your lips will be out of sync with what he hears. He won't be able to take it in. We worked our way through the first few pages. I'd read it, then he'd copy. Then I'd have him point to the images that the words referred to. He seemed bright as a button. Got it right every time. I flicked back to the beginning. Started again. This time, I said nothing and pointed to the words. He couldn't recall any of them, even getting the names for the images wrong. He reminded me of quite a few kids from the orphanage. There were the kids that no one wanted to foster. There were the ones that some orderlies would lose their patience with. Slapped them around. Not in front of me after I'd gotten older. They knew my reputation. They wouldn't have dared. Bunch of misfits and cowards with poor attitudes. Not all of them, but enough to make their lives a misery. He snatched the book and threw it on the floor. Puffed out his lips in a sulk. He picked up the Spider-Man comic and thrust it at me. I read the captions to him instead of going back to the book. That put a smile on his face. Come and get it. It's only meatballs and fries. Not had time to buy anything special. Anna made me feel unwelcome at the table. It was nothing, she said. She didn't say anything. Her demeanor and facial expressions said it all. She didn't want me there. That sentiment was mutual. I didn't want to be there. Problem was, I had nowhere else to hide out. All I could do was to make the best of a strange situation. Roberto kept sneaking looks at me as he ate. Maria did her best to lighten matters, but her conversation fell flat. Anna pushed her plate away and left the table. Maria shook her head. I really am sorry. She's at that awkward age, Maria said. 
Anna stood at the hallway door, hands on hips. I heard that. Like, what do you expect when you bring a stranger home, said Anna. That's done it. I'll sort her out right now. Maria disappeared through the hallway and left Roberto and me at the table. World War III erupted from the direction of Anna's bedroom. Roberto covered his ears with his hands. He was clearly distressed. He wasn't the only one. I rose to my feet. Picked up Roberto and settled him on my shoulders, then piggybacked him over to the television. I tipped him head over ass and set him on the floor, then reset his game. He looked up at me and smiled. Then he turned his attention back to the television and lost himself in the game. Sorry about that, Maria said. Anna's got something to say. Anna inspected her sneakers. She clasped her hands in front of her, head bowed and swaying. She mumbled, sorry. Say it like you mean it. Sorry, Ted. That's better. Now go and finish your homework. Anna shuffled out of the room. She wasn't sorry. She meant what she'd said before. Now she was probably seething at having to say sorry. I wanted to say something. Thought better of it. It wasn't my problem. At least it soon wouldn't be. On the scale of the problems I was facing, it was bottom of the list. Something to grin and bear. While Maria said about clearing the table, I headed for Ada's shower and to change. When I returned, the little fella had had enough for one day. He was spark out on the floor. Time for his bed, Maria said. I'll carry him. Scooping him up in my arms, I carried him into the hallway. He felt fragile. No wait. Like a ball of fluff. Maria stepped ahead and unbolted the door, then switched on the light. He didn't stir as I laid him on his bed. The wallpaper, bedding, lampshade, and toys were all a tribute to the Spider-Man brand. I wasn't sure it was healthy. Interests are one thing. Pandering to an obsession another. Still, he wasn't my child, so what did I know? Why bolt the doors? I asked her as we walked back into the living area. Because he can be a danger to himself. I have to keep things out of harm's way. I don't lock his door when he's in bed. I just keep the door to the living room locked. Got it. Listen, when Anna's asleep, we need to talk, Maria said. What about? If I wanted her to hear, I'd not have said that. Fair enough. My mind raced. Had she seen the news reports, or heard that they'd found Fat Guy's body? I hope not, or there could be a chance she'd give me my marching orders. Watching her wash the dishes, she kept glancing over at me now and again. Her expression at times gave me the impression that she had something on her mind, and it wasn't that she wanted to bed me. Chapter 31 With the pots washed, Maria disappeared into her bedroom. I picked up the local tabloid I'd bought and started to read the smut. It came as a surprise that they had a political section. That the Syrian army had retaken Palmyra from ISIS made me smile. The Russians had caught us napping in Syria. They'd known exactly what they were doing in leaving ISIS alone, and to only attack the rebels for them to force a ceasefire. Assad had been in bed with ISIS, exchanging oil from them to fuel his army, and in return, he supplied electricity to some of their territory. It wasn't common knowledge, because they used intermediaries. But we knew in our unit. Now it was looking as though the Ruskies and Assad could put the second part of their plan into place, so they could take out ISIS, while the rebels had their hands tied behind their back in peace negotiations. Divide and conquer as they say. I couldn't help but wonder if the Pentagon knew about this plan all along. One thing they did know, the oil was leaking into Turkey, but they were doing nothing about it. But then I thought that it's always about the oil and they needed Turkey on their side. They weren't about to let a trickle of oil get in the way of an alliance, while some Turkish dude and ISIS lined their pockets from the war. Anything interesting? Maria asked, as she breezed into the room. Not really. Maria switched on the television without sound and selected the local news channel. She'd showered and changed. Looked less harassed. Took a seat next to me. Anna's asleep. I so love this time of day when I can relax, she said. Gotta admit. You've got your work cut out, I said. They're good kids, really. Thanks for trying with Roberto. 
Listen, we need to talk. My backside started to twitch. Well, not exactly, but let's say I was unnerved. What's on your mind? Her eyelid flickered, with the fingers of her left hand trembling as she stroked her lip. Whatever she wanted to say, it didn't look as though it was going to come easy. I need a babysitter tomorrow morning. My Adam's apple did a leap. Don't like to ask, but I have a doctor's appointment. I need to set off early. Mom can't get here until 8.30 to take them to school. It's only for an hour, she said, her expression pleading for an affirmative answer. Roberto I thought I could cope with. Anna was a different ball game. How will they take it? I'm a stranger to them. Yeah, I thought about that. I was thinking we could all walk around back to the kids' play area. Anna could keep Roberto occupied on the swings until Mom arrives. All you'd have to do is to look on. Relieved that that was all I'd have to do, I was quick to answer. You got it. The frown swept from her brow as she leaned forward. Planted a kiss on my cheek, then wrapped her arms around me. It was nice to cuddle. The smell of her hair. The warmth of her cheek. Then the moistness of our lips joined in a kiss. It was all I could do to stop my hands from straying. I pulled away. Listen, it doesn't seem right with the kids here. Especially if Anna walks in. You're right, I'll make coffee. With Maria in the kitchen area, I turned up the volume on the TV remote. Big mistake. Fat guy's mugshot appeared on the screen. I pressed the mute, but it didn't work. Nothing worked. The batteries had died. Fingerprints taken from duct tape and handcuffs that police found in an abandoned Ford Pinto have been matched to the scene of four indecent assaults on women that ended in homicides. All of them carried out over the last three months. Police have traced the vehicle back to the owner, who is believed to be armed and dangerous. The police are seeking help in finding Jason Burke, who has not been seen at his home for the past four days. The public are advised not to confront him, but to phone this number. A telephone number appeared on the screen. I glanced over at Maria. She was staring at the television. Her eyes looked as though they were on stalks. My God. That was him. Who? I said. The guy who attacked me. I should phone the police. Nah, it looked nothing like him. Yeah, and how many Ford Pintos do you see around? They didn't say it was a two-tone. Just a coincidence. Still, best I phone them. I'm sure it was him on the screen. Maria picked up the handset from the cradle on the breakfast bar and pressed the digits. I was over there in an instant and pressed the connectors to close the call. I took the handset from her and put it back on the cradle. Don't go telling anyone. If you do phone them, they'll need to interview me. So, what difference does that make? For goodness sake, there's a perv out there. Just why the hell were you scared of talking to the police? My back was against the wall. I couldn't be sure if I could trust her enough to tell her what happened back there in the alley. Detroit was beginning to suck big time. Chapter 32 Maria walked around the breakfast bar and joined me at the sofa. I was usually quick at thinking fast on my feet, but this time I needed to sit and to gather my thoughts. I turned to face her and reached for her hand, but she snatched it away. Look, you have to trust me. Trust you? I think I've already done that. I need an explanation where you can leave right now. To think I was going to have you babysit. Wait, it's difficult. I'm on official army business here. You can understand that. That's why I don't want the police nosing around me. I understand that, but what if that guy attacks and murders someone again? I couldn't have that on my conscience. Could you? My backside shuffled on the cushion. It was an uncomfortable question to answer if it wasn't that I knew the truth that he was dead. But how to explain that caused a brain fart? L. Listen, if it is him, I saved you from a fate worse than death, I said. That doesn't cut it. I have to do the right thing. I let out a sigh. Okay, then I'll collect my ruck and I'm out of here. Just give the police the description of me that's opposite to the way I look. You can do that, right? Maria looked me straight in the eye. Her mind was clearly churning over me leaving. 
I detected moistness in her eyes. What if they come to my work and speak to my boss? Hell, if my boss sees his picture, he could phone them. He knows what you look like. I can't lie. I don't have it in me. The situation was as much of a bind as the one back at Fort Bragg. She was right. I could picture the events. Her boss gives my description and puts Fat Guy and me at the diner, arguing. Granger sees his statement and ties me to his stop and search nearby, where he noticed my cut knuckles. If they find the body near to his stop and search, with the guy's mashed face, then that would be me toast. Then if Maria had given a false description, she could be implicated in his death, or at least be considered as preventing the course of justice. Sure, I could argue self-defense, but then I thought, would I be locked up while they argued if they should charge me or not? It wasn't just that. Sure, Maria was a victim, but if they somehow could make some sort of charge against her, what would happen to her kids? The thought of Roberto ending up in an orphanage had me gulping. I took a deep breath. The guy's dead. It was an accident. What? How? She sidled away from me along the sofa. I sat on my hands in the hope that she wouldn't see me as threatening. After you got on the bus, he pulled a knife on me. We struggled. Fell to the ground. He still had the knife in his hand and it stuck into him. Oh my God. And you're sure he's dead? Yeah, I checked. I panicked and dragged him behind a dumpster. They've obviously not found his corpse yet. Listen, you don't have to worry about you or your kids. I'll go now. Just remember, if you say anything, you could be in trouble for not reporting it earlier. Wait, I need to think. Yeah, and while you're thinking, just remember, if I hadn't intervened, you could have been his fifth victim. Where would that have left Anna and Roberto? I'd given her enough to chew on. That she hadn't started screaming and pushing me out of the door was a good sign. It's not enough. I need to know more. Like, what were you involved in to get that bullet in your arm? You know I can't say. All I will say, it was in the line of duty and I was a victim. You know the script. You've worked with our guys. The hands on the wall clock clicked over to 11.30. Car headlights briefly shone on the living room window. I heard a car door slam. Rising to my feet, I left Maria chewing over the situation, then I walked around the sofa to the window and peered outside. It was a cop car. Two cops had climbed out of their vehicle. They didn't look to be in a hurry. One of them lit a cigarette and rested his backside on the hood. The other walked toward our apartment entrance. My shoulders drooped. Under the streetlight, there was no mistaking his stature. It could have been a coincidence. It would be his patrol area after all. I turned to Maria. So much for thinking he'd be on admin leave. They must have cleared up the situation quickly. Did the police answer the call? Yeah, but you closed it before I could speak. Damn. I think they could have traced the call. Your number could have come up on their screen. There wasn't time to ask her what she would say when I heard pounding on the door. She'd already disappeared into the hallway when I stepped around the sofa. My mind turned to spaghetti, writhing in a multitude of directions. Repelling out of the window was a lost cause. Especially with a cop out front and armed with a service pistol. If I tried to make it to the hallway to get my Glock from my ruck, the cop would likely see me. Yes, what can I help you with, officer? Maria asked. Chapter 33 I worked my way around to the side of the hallway door, craned my neck and listened. It was hard to know if she'd give me away to the cop. Just routine, ma'am. Dispatch called me to look in on you. Said they had a 911 from the number at this address, but it cut out. You okay? Okay. What? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Sorry, I was asleep on the Davenport. The call would be my son. Just put him to bed. I had to take the phone from him. He's only seven and autistic. For someone who didn't think she could lie, she was doing fine. Sorry to hear that, ma'am. You look stressed. Mind if I take a look around? There's really nothing to see. I'm not stressed, just tired. All the same, I wouldn't feel easy if I didn't take a look around. Hi. 
I have my two children in bed. Don't worry. Just a quick look around. There was a pause. Not long, but it seemed like a lifetime. Ah, oh, okay, but be quick, she said, in a raised voice. Granger was a persistent son of a bitch. I stepped back behind the sofa and hunkered down when I heard their footsteps head for the living room. Please, there's no need to take your gun out. Routine, ma'am. You live alone. I told you. I live with my kids. Please, hurry. I have to be up early for a doctor's appointment. Everything looks fine. Sorry to have bothered you. I heard them walk back along the hallway. My heart was pounding at a loud beat. A vision of the sweatshirt I was wearing at the police station flashed through my mind. It was distinct, and it was hung on the clothes stand by the exit. The outside door closed. I'd been holding my breath to the point of dizziness. I exhaled. Sucked in a deep lungful of air. On all fours, I crawled to the front of the sofa. It's a wonder I didn't have a heart attack, Maria said. You're going to have to go. I can't handle this. I looked directly at her. Turn out the light and sit on the sofa. If he looks up, he'll see your shadow. You did fine. She did as she was told. I crawled over to her, took her hands in mine. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you through all this. She sniffled, then drew in a staccato of breaths. The last thing I needed was for her to start bawling. Moving to sit beside her, I took her in my arms. Held her tight then stroked the back of her hair. I heard car doors slam. An engine started. Then I heard the vehicle drive away. There now, he's gone. We're safe. She turned her head and our lips met in a passionate kiss. There were too many tears of hers to dry as we both drew our legs onto the sofa, entwined as one. All of a sudden I was in a good place. Not a care in the world. She'd come through for me. Maria drew her head back. You don't have to go. Let's go to bed. You sure? I've never been so sure. They never wake up. Okay, but I'll set my wristwatch alarm and get up real early to sleep on the sofa. Can't have the kids find me in your bed. There was no disorientation this time when my alarm sounded. Easing off of the bed, I dressed. Crept into the hallway. Retrieved my ruck from the gun safe, then on into the living room. I'd hardly slept after our tryst. It was the damned hooded top. If Granger had seen it, I imagined they could be having a powwow with SWAT down at the station. They'd have three choices. Risk a hostage situation and call on the landline with the place surrounded. Smash the door down and risk serious injury to Maria and her kids in a shootout. Or, they could wait for them to leave and maybe ambush me outside. The latter sounded the better tactical option, but then what did I know? I reckoned Granger would push for the latter as an ex-marine. But then would they listen to a traffic cop, I thought. Whatever, I peered through the curtain. There wasn't any movement. No strange vehicles parked with radio antennas. The first thing I did was to retrieve my satellite phone and to power it up. Instantly it buzzed to signal an encrypted message. Address and marriage false. No king security recorded with the taxation authority, or with the state. No claim as yet received at the VA. No recent movement on cell, or signal. Last movements picked up on cell masts near Atwood on the docks, then back to Greystone in Highland Park, timed at 3 a.m. 0300 hours on the day of the incident. Stay in situ. Delete message. I deleted the message and put the phone safely in my ruck. Carefully. I upended the sofa, then stowed my ruck on slats at the bottom of the frame. Quietly as possible, I tipped the sofa back into position. Greg was out there somewhere, up to his neck and whatever the hell was going down in Detroit. That would include suckering me into the hit on Handbag's gang. Then there was the attempt to take me out to set me up as a patsy. Maybe he intended for me to take the fall and to cover his tracks. If he could do that, I had no doubt that he could have carried out the hits on my buddies back at base. I had to sit down. Much as I'd smelled a rat, I'd hoped I was wrong. I had thought that I had him pegged during our time in the unit. Obviously I didn't. I had it in mind I was finished in Detroit. 
there was enough in the message to prove a reasonable doubt that I was involved in the homicides. But then there were those three words. A direct order from Lone Wolf, stay in situ. God only knows what he expected of me. Chapter 34 The last I could remember was resting my butt on the back of the sofa. After an hour or so of nothing stirring outside, I'd succumbed to tiredness and rolled over onto the sofa to sleep. Something was now prodding me on the cheek. I cracked open an eye, my spirit almost leaping from my body. First thought was that I'd died and gone to heaven. An angelic face, with beautiful dark eyes, was not more than an inch from my face. Roberto, shouldn't you be in bed? I said. He stood back and tossed his Spider-Man comic at me. Not now, Roberto, said Maria, to the smell of bacon cooking on the stove. Breakfast first. Bleary-eyed, I threw my legs over the side of the sofa. I was thankful that I was dressed as Anna walked into the room and she took a seat at the table. Why do I need him to look after us? I'm nearly thirteen, not five, Anna said, still sulking from the night before. Him is called Ted, so let's not have that attitude. We discussed this earlier. Don't worry. I'll keep my distance. Pretend I'm not here, I said. Anna shrugged her shoulders, then forked a rasher onto her plate alongside her egg. Roberto pulled at my hand. I think you wanted another airplane ride. Scooping him up, I spun him around, then I carried him to the table and set him on his chair. I made a sandwich with the bacon and wolfed it down, followed by a long swig of coffee. Chickening out of polite conversation, I rose from my chair. I'll just go and take a shower and then I'll be ready. By the time I changed and returned to the living room, the kids were already dressed and ready to go. Right, let's go or I'll be late, said Maria. We followed the kids to the door. Maria squeezed my hand, then gave me a sideways smile. Anna walked over to the swings with Roberto. It was looking like this child sitting would be easy. Take care of my babies. Mom will be here soon. I asked her to come early, said Maria. Don't worry, they won't come to any harm with me. I hope not for your sake, she said, and laughed, then wagged her umbrella at my face. Or you'll have me to deal with. Just where the trust came from, I couldn't be sure, but it was welcomed. I wasn't sure that I'd have been so trusting in the same circumstances. Maria waved, then disappeared around the corner. Sitting on a bench, I watched as Anna pushed Roberto on the swing. Higher, he kept shouting, then squealed with delight. Roberto was like a jack-in-a-box character. He sprang from the seat, flying through the air, and thankfully landed safely. Come back here, Anna said, and set off in pursuit as he ran to a climbing frame. You're not allowed. Get down. It was time to take control and I hurried over. I'll watch him, I said. He doesn't need watching. He needs to get down. Mom doesn't allow him on the climbing frame. Her words were delivered curtly, and as if she had a smell under her nose. Yeah, well your mom ain't here and I'm in charge. I took a hold of Roberto by the waist and lifted him to grab a hold of the horizontal ladder. Keeping a firm hold of him, he swung from rung to rung. He snickered all the way along. I'm telling mom. What, that you're a little madam with a hormone problem? She already knows that. Anna glared at me. You'll be toast when I tell her. She could have been right. I lifted him down and piggybacked him over to the swing. This time, I squeezed him into the baby swing. It was a tight fit, but he managed it, and the bars would stop him jumping. If you'd have put him in here to start with, he wouldn't have jumped. Now stop giving me crap. I'm the adult. Yeah, right. I walked back to the bench and took a seat. A burly guy walked over to the swings with his child, a boy of around the same age as Roberto. The kid sat on the swing next to Roberto, with the guy pushing. Words were exchanged between the kid and Anna. The guy grabbed at the chain and stopped Roberto's swing. Anna stamped her feet. The guy looked to be scolding Anna and grabbed her arm. Hey, what's going on here? I said as I arrived. The retard here is upsetting my son. He shouldn't be allowed to play here. That swing is for five-year-old kids. Retard! Don't go calling my brother a retard. 
He's got more brains than that dork of yours, Anna spat at him. Whoa there, I'll deal with this. I squared up to the guy, and swept Anna away with my arm. To be honest, I was a little on the rough side. But I could see she was fired up. Retard! I'll tell you what, use that word again, or lay a finger on his sister, and we'll see who the retard is. You and whose army? I put my face close to his so that our noses were almost touching. Oh, I don't need an army. I'm a freaking one-man army. Try for it and make a move if you like. The guy's stature looked to shrink like a melting block of lard. His face reddened and he turned to his son. Come on, it's time for school. He couldn't let it drop once he was a good distance away. Think yourself lucky I had my son with me, he shouted. Yeah, right, I said, borrowing in his words. I was lucky. I'd have had to stand my ground if it had come to blows. Then I really would have been toast with Maria. Fighting in front of the kids wouldn't have been the smart thing to do. Thanks, Ted, Anna said. Don't worry about it. I'll leave you in charge and go and sit down. Nan's here, Anna said. I lifted Roberto out of the swing chair. He ran to his grandmother, then leapt and threw his arms around her. You must be Ted? Yeah, pleased to meet you, I said. I'll get them to school. Nan set Roberto down. Anna joined them and they set off walking. It came as a shock, when Anna turned at the corner and waved, this time with a smile on her face, no less. I was pleased that Maria's mom hadn't given me the third-degree question and answer session. That was just the way I wanted it to play out. All I wanted to be was a paying guest and not joined at the hip to the family. Although, sharing Maria's bed had muddied that thought. Back in the apartment, I retrieved a few items for my journey, including Hustler's phone, and pressed the power button. A message popped up on the screen from Handbag. You'd better phone me. Mom is sick. It didn't sound as though he'd found her yet. I decided to close that avenue down. I typed a message and pressed send. What's wrong with her? I'm in Canada for the week. I put the phone down on the table. Thinking that was the end of that, I poured a coffee from the percolator. The phone buzzed again. I pulled up the message. F you scumbag. You gotten something of mine. You that guy on the Harley, ain't ya? I have Queenie. Mom died years ago, so cut the crap. We need to talk. I realized I'd made a big mistake as I walked over to the sofa. Took a seat. Stared at the message on the screen, then took a swig of my coffee. He'd know it was me that took his thug's vehicle and they had the artifact. The main thing was that he could have some information that I needed. My mind raced. A million dollar artifact to find out what the hell was going on raced through my mind. The trace on Greg's phone had him visiting Atwater. He'd arrived back near Greystone before the crap hit the fan at Handbag's house. I needed time to think, to try and work out what connection Greg could have to Handbag and the outfit down at the docks. My fingers tapped out a message on the keyboard. Not now. Later. Queenie had better be alive, or no trade. I'll be in touch. I pressed send and tossed the phone onto the cushion. Drained the rest of my coffee. Studied the map for directions to Moe's house. The phone buzzed again. His fingers had been busy. He was clearly irate. Never mind later. Better make it now. If I have to find you, and I will, I'll chain you to four cars and tear your limbs apart. Now freaking call me, or I'll blow a hole in Queenie's head right now. I typed out a new message. Please yourself. She ain't nothing to me. Maybe I'll call you tomorrow. Sort out some kind of exchange. Need to think what I'll want. It could include dollars and Queenie. Who knows? I pressed send, then powered down the phone. I imagined Queenie would have already been tortured and would now be terminated. If she wasn't, I thought that maybe, just maybe, he might let her live after reading my messages. Putting it out of my mind, I began to think about Mo. He was the snake's head. I was more concerned about what I'd find out about his lifestyle. If his security was lax at his home, it might cost nothing to get some answers from him. Chapter 35 
Maria was right about Hamtramck over at Wayne County to the east of the city. As she had said, and the bus driver had filled me in, the area of a few square miles was a mixture of mainly Arabs and Poles. I thanked the bus driver as I climbed down the step and onto the sidewalk. The sidewalks were awash with women shopping, many wearing headscarves, or their hijabs, leaving only their eyes visible, until they approached, when they avoided eye contact. Most of the Muslims, he told me, were from Bosnia, the Yemen, or Bangladesh. He was guessing Syrian refugees would be soon added to the numbers, and push more poles out to the suburbs. Said there'd been a growing undercurrent on the outskirts since the Paris and Belgian terrorist attacks, but the area was virtually free of crime. All this told me was that Mo would feel at home living there, free of discrimination. No need to watch his back. The only thing that dogged me was the type of housing. For a rich businessman, the houses weren't exactly top-of-the-range mansions. I strolled along Joseph Kampau Avenue, the town's main drag. It looked just like any other American high street, except for some of the signs over the stores and businesses. Apart from English, I recognized the Arabic writing right away and guessed the other translations were Polish and Bengali. Taking the map from my jacket pocket, I unfolded it to get my bearings. It was only a 200-yard hump to his corner plot. Tucking the map in my pocket, I headed towards his house. Halfway down Most Street, I stopped when I saw what I hoped was his SUV in the drive. It was a modest turn-of-the-century two-story home, but a sizable plot. An Asian guy, wearing a kufi hat, was sitting on a stool outside the gate. I was outside a coffee bar and stepped inside. I'd not expected him having any kind of security. It was on the amateurish side if that's what the Asian guy was doing there. One thing I had noticed was the bank of powerful satellite dishes on the roof. They weren't exactly cable TV dishes. Three CCTV cameras high on the front of the house, together with an alarm box, told me he took his personal security seriously. What can I get you? said the silver-haired guy behind the counter. I detected a Polish accent. Just a coffee. Black, no sugar. I took a seat by the window. Mo's house was still in view. The guy placed my mug on the table. Can I tempt you with one of our freshly made Paxki pastries? The guy said. He pointed to the display. Sure, why not? Not seen you around here before. I thought it must be some sorts of cafe speak recalling Maria saying exactly the same thing at the diner. Just passing through, I said, giving him the same answer I'd given to Maria. Yeah, that's what everyone is doing around here these days, passing through. I'll be joining them soon, he said, then sighed, and placed the pastry on a plate at my table. He pulled out a chair opposite me and sat. Why's that? Look around. You're only the third customer today, and it's lunchtime. Can't even get a liquor license to boost trade. Why? For one, we're too near the mosque. The majority on the council is Muslim. Hell, we've even got a Muslim mayor. And then if we could get a license, who would drink the Polish beer anyway? None of them drink beer. Most of us Poles have left. He shook his head. The old guy had a point. By them, he obviously meant the Muslim community. Not been the same since they all arrived. Not that I'm prejudiced, and we all get along, sort of, but it's like we've been invaded. At least I don't need an alarm anymore to get up at six to fire up the ovens. Not with the call to prayer. I didn't like to tell him that his invasion scenario was what the locals would have thought there when all the Poles arrived and took over the area. I doubted it would have helped business with his portrait of the Pope hung on the wall. On the opposite side of the road, a woman wearing a full borka walked on by. She stumbled, dropping a buff file she had been carrying, and knelt on one knee to pick it up. Yeah, times change. I said, and took a bite of the pastry. Hey, that's good. Thanks. The woman wearing the borka was at the gate of Mo's house. The guard opened the gate and let her through. Tell me, the guy who lives at the corner house, does he come in here? No, he sends his security guard. Someone that likes our pastries. Gives me the creeps he does. He packs a gun, I know that much. Seeing the outline under his clothing, he said. Really? The door opened. A welcome distraction. The old guy rose from his chair and walked over to serve his customer. 
six pack skis, two coffees, and two sausages to go, said his customer. The guy at the counter was quite burly. Close cropped hair like someone in the services would have, and with huge biceps. The guy outside Mo's house wasn't the only one packing heat. There was no hiding the outline of the butt of a pistol under his t-shirt, tucked in the back of his jeans waistband. I glanced away when our eyes met in the mirror behind the counter. Staring ahead, I sensed him studying me as he left. I doubted he was the security guard the old guy was talking about. Not when he'd ordered pork sausages. Not only that, but he had headed in the opposite direction to Mo's house when he left the cafe. Is he a regular? Yeah, has been for some months. He lives in the house five doors down. I think they must rent out the rooms for workers. They seem to change every few months. Strange really, he always goes the back way, same as the others. Never uses his front door. Maybe they don't have a key. I counted the houses down to Moe's. That would put the burly guy living at the house opposite to Moe's. Too much of a coincidence. He had to be part of his security contingent. The question, if I was right, was why would he need it? The front door to Moe's house opened, but no one appeared. The security guard rose from his stool, turning to face the door. He waved as if giving acknowledgement to instructions. Doing an about-face, he walked over to the SUV, then climbed inside. Mo appeared carrying a briefcase and stepped toward the vehicle. He opened the passenger door, heaved his briefcase inside, then turned and hurried back to the house. When he reached the door, I flinched to a flash and a loud explosion in Mo's drive, then ducked below the table. The cafe window imploded with shrapnel from Mo's SUV. Someone had gotten the timing wrong. He'd likely escaped certain death. I rose, then dashed around the counter. The old guy was crouched behind his till, whimpering. What the hell was that, he said. Don't know, but I ain't going out front to find out. It could be a gas main. Is the back door open? Yeah, yeah. I'll come with you. I followed him through the corridor into the baking area, then through the exit to the backyard. A vehicle flashed along the back street. There was no mistaking the passenger or the driver, even with only a fleeting glance. It was CIA agent Adams, and the burly customer that I'd seen earlier in the cafe. Glancing along the back street, their car tires screeched as it skidded and turned the corner. There wasn't any point hanging around if I'd just witnessed an attempted CIA hit. Doubting they'd turn around, I followed their car's direction to head back to the bus stop. I expected them to have driven off away from Mo's house. Instead, when I glanced around the corner, their car did a handbrake turn outside his drive. Neighbors were milling around in the street. The back door of their car swung open. There was just enough time to see Mo dive into the back seat before I ducked back and positioned myself behind a parked car. More burning rubber than I heard their car speed past. Dumbfounded, I couldn't get a handle on what I'd just witnessed. It was obvious they hadn't attempted a hit as I'd first thought. Adams and his crew had been there to protect him. But why? Something else had been strange about what I'd seen. The woman with the borka. Thinking about her stature, she was one hell of a tall woman. Not only that, but I was sure she'd been wearing men's shoes when she knelt on the sidewalk. Whoever that was in the borka, they were known to the guard and to Mo, or they wouldn't have been given access. Chapter 36 Back at Maria's apartment, I was grateful the bus had arrived before the police and services had turned up and forced to the scene at Mo's house. I imagined I'd be on their most wanted list after exiting stage left following their interview. Especially as it had been without as much as a kiss my ass. Still, I kicked myself for not having hung around at the scene of the explosion. The figure in the Borka was bugging the crap out of me. Whoever it was, they hadn't left in the CIA vehicle so they could have been still in the house, or maybe they decked out of the back door. Hell, Borka could have been the one with their finger on the trigger for the bomb. An explosive device didn't need to be wired to the ignition. Besides, the CIA was obviously monitoring his house, and they'd have seen someone lifting the hood. I'd not taken any notice when Borka had entered the drive. It would have been easy to pull the dropping the file stun again, and then stuck a magnetic charge just under the fender. 
They could have gotten the timing wrong on squeezing the trigger when Mo opened the car door and he dashed back to the house. Perhaps he'd forgotten something and his split-second decision to return had saved his life. One thing was for sure, Mo would know who it was in the Borka. Thinking about the stature of the figure, it could have been Greg. Whatever, someone clearly wanted Mo's entire operation closed down. Greg had started it by wanting me to take out Handbag and his crew. This could be him finishing the mission. Maybe not. I grasped a vision of Mo tossing his briefcase through the open door then scurrying away. That thought screwed up the scenario I was painting. Mo could have arranged for the hit himself as a ruse. Maybe the CIA were about to curtail their security detail, and he needed to give them a reason to continue. There was no doubting I was out of my depth. On missions, sometimes we had to enlist the help of local friendly militia. The only ones I could think of right then was the Detroit police, but that bridge was down in the muddy water. The landline rang. I picked up the handset. Didn't speak, just listened. Officer Granger, ma'am. Just a courtesy call to make sure everything is okay. Sorry, she's not here. I'm her brother. Can I help you? She's at work. I tried my best to disguise my voice, but I couldn't be sure that I'd pulled it off. Her son dialed 911 yesterday by mistake. Just a follow-up call. Do you have her cell phone number? I need her details for the report. Either he'd taken a shine to her, or maybe he had seen my sweatshirt on the clothes peg by the door. Some of his experience wouldn't have missed taking all the details for an incident report. One thing was for sure, he wasn't at the station. Not with someone calling out for beers in the background over Bruce Springsteen singing back in the USA. Yeah, one moment. I lay the handset on the breakfast bar, rushed through to the hallway. Teased my cell phone from my pocket, then closed the door. Maria answered the call. Hey, nice of you to call. Mom said everything went okay today. Yeah, listen, I've just had a phone call from that cop that visited. I told him I'm your brother. He wants to speak to you. If he asks, tell him that I'm at your apartment decorating Roberto's bedroom. If he asks anything awkward, tell him you're really busy, then phone me back. Sure. And there's me thinking you were missing me, she said, then laughed. Truth was, it was good to hear a friendly voice, but I wasn't going to start getting all mushy. Closing the call, I headed back to the breakfast bar and picked up the handset, then gave him her number. The next five minutes was excruciating, when the landline rang again. I prayed it wouldn't be Granger. Luckily, it was Maria. Hi, no problem. He didn't ask anything awkward. Just my name and date of birth for his report. Thank God. What time will you be home tonight? Around 8 after I pick up the kids. Great. See you then. With the call closed, I still felt uneasy about Granger. At least I knew he wouldn't be sat outside on surveillance from the noise I'd heard in the background. Still, it didn't feel right cooped up in her apartment. With nothing to do that would pass the time, I decided to go food and clothes shopping and headed on out of the room. Roberto's door was open and I glanced inside. I'd not noticed when I'd put him to bed, but in the daylight, I could see that the wallpaper was past its cell by date. It was peeling, and at the side of his bed, it looked as though he'd pulled chunks of it away. On the way over to the mall, I tried to make sense of events and failed. One thought came back to me, and that was how the Syrian regime was swapping energy for oil with ISIS. It reminded me of the cryptic note from Hank Craig, Oil Rags to Riches, Barter Kings. I'd seen the barter program on cable television, where they'd start with say an ironing board and end up with something like a speedboat after a few exchanges. Just what the cryptic message had to do with the price of fish, I didn't know, but it had gotten me to thinking. Going back to the 60s, one of my foster dad's stats worked in what was Zambia back then, mining diamonds. The pay was fantastic, he told me. Trouble was, you couldn't get the money out because of the exchange controls. What he said they did was to buy diamonds, sell them to a trader, and he'd deposit the money through his subsidiary in the U.S. If there was anything left over, they'd exchange the diamonds for a car and drive it to the next country without exchange controls. Once there, they'd sell it for dollars to bring the money home. Clever stuff. Just where these notions were taking me I couldn't be sure as I looked over the trays of fish at the market outside the mall. 
An hour drifting around the shops and with arms full of shopping bags, I arrived back at the apartment. You're lucky, said the young woman, pulling a stroller through the door of the apartment opposite. We've been inundated with canvassers for the election today. I told them that Maria worked. They said they'd call back. I told them there were two of you. I've seen you around these past two days. You two an item? Only Maria hasn't said anything. No, just visiting. Thanks for the heads up on the canvassers. Damn nosy neighbors. I couldn't wait to get inside and close the door. With the shopping stowed away, I checked my satellite phone. There was a new message. That friend you asked about. Your hunch was right. Ex-intelligence brass in Saddam's Bath party. Spirited out of Baghdad to the U.S. New identity in exchange for intel. Do not attempt to contact. Under eyes and protection of CIA. The message was a little late. Then it started me thinking. The current ISIS regime was born out of the disaffected Sunni Ba'ath Party members and Saddam's armed forces. That would give them a strong motive to take Mo out. I fished CIA agent Adams' calling card from my pocket. He would have answers. He had Mo under protection. I toyed with the idea of making contact when I heard a knock on the door. Glancing outside from behind the curtain, there was a car parked I didn't recognize. I put away my phone and retrieved my pistol from my ruck. Whoever it was knocked again, this time with a heavy hand. Looking through the spy hole, there was a young black woman sporting her party's badge on her blouse. She knocked again, so I opened the door. Closing the door, I had a strange feeling about the woman. It was the way she'd studied me. Maybe she thought I looked cute. I doubted that. There again, she had a nervous disposition about her. Over at the window, I peeked through the net curtain. She was back at the car and standing at the driver's side, leaning in through the open window. At the angle of view, I couldn't see the driver. She stood back and pointed in my direction, so I stepped away from the window. I heard the vehicle maneuver, then drive away. Shaking my head at my state of paranoia, I ambled into Roberto's bedroom, wondering if I was being overcautious. My mind was cratered. Bombed out. It called for some therapy. I started to pull at the wallpaper, hoping on hope that Maria would be okay with me redecorating his room. Chapter 37 The decorating therapy had worked its magic. Fussing over the details had emptied my head. The problems I faced had paled, replaced with worry about how Maria would take it, not to mention Roberto. Especially now that I'd cut down on his Spider-Man theme. Sitting on the edge of his mattress, there wasn't time to wash and change when I heard the front door open. Oh, my God. What's going on in here? Maria asked as she popped her head around the doorway. What on earth have you done? Roberto and Anna hustled past her into the room. I rose from the bed. Wow, said Roberto, and ran over to the wall, now adorned with a row of giant superhero stickers that I'd stuck over the paintwork. He ran his fingers over each one at turn, a look of wonderment etched on his face. He's still got his Spider-Man images. I thought it would be better to add some more superheroes to wean him off of his obsession, I said, with Maria looking annoyed. You should have asked first. Maria's tone was off. Her cheeks reddened. She displayed anger, but her eyes missed it. Aw, oh, Mom, it's fantastic. Look around the top of the walls, said Anna, then she did a twirl. I'd put a string of alphabet cards around the top of the walls with images depicting the letters. Where it ended, it was followed by number cards. Here pull on the cord, I said to Roberto, and guided him to the bed. He pulled on the cord. The carousel light fitting above the bed started to turn to the tune of a nursery rhyme singing out the alphabet, with dangling letters spinning around. Pull it again. The tune changed to a nursery rhyme voice, counting out the numbers, and this time the letters stopped with the strings of numbers spinning around. Lifting the corner of his pillow for him, he hooped with delight when he saw I'd hidden a stack of superhero comics. I looked over at Maria as Roberto gave me a hug. She turned and hurried out of the room. Do you think I'm in trouble? She'll come around, Anna said. You're not bad for an old guy, really. Maria was nowhere to be seen when I went to take a shower and to change. When I walked into the living room, 
She was in the kitchen area. She knew I was there, but she didn't turn to look at me. Anna and Roberto, homework. And here, now, Maria called out. They walked in. Is Ted reading his book again? Anna asked. No, you can read it to him. Ted won't always be here, she said, to a heavy-handed clatter of pans. I don't mind, I said. The dishcloth slapped into the bowl. Maria stepped back from the sink as the water splashed over her. All the same, it's Anna's chore, she said, still not having turned around. I'll watch the news then. Not wanting to ask for the remote, I switched on the television, selected the channel, then took a seat. The words of the presenter went over my head, with news on the local elections. I couldn't get it out of my head that I should have asked before decorating Roberto's room. All I knew was that at his age, superheroes fascinated me, but I never had the money for the comics. All I ever read were the ones I managed to steal from the local store. The rooms and the orphanages weren't really what you would call decorated. They were just plain and functional. Clinical even. There was no getting away from the fact that I'd overstepped the mark, although my intentions were well meant. I'd not really considered her feelings. It was none of my business that in my mind, Maria had pandered to his obsession for the sake of peace and quiet. There again, maybe Maria didn't have the money to vary his interest in Spider-Man. Feeling guilty at having interfered in her domestic business was a new experience to me. I sighed. The newscaster switched over to an outside broadcast in Amtrak. It must have been a recording because it was taken in daylight. The camera zoomed in on a burnout and twisted SUV. I pushed back in my seat, then rose to switch it off. No, leave it, said Maria. When I glanced over my shoulder, Maria pointed the remote at the television. Switched it on then turned up the volume. What I can tell you is that police recovered a body from the vehicle of an as yet unidentified male. However, we understand from police sources that the intended target was probably the owner of the vehicle, a prominent businessman, Muhammad Ali Hassan. At this stage, they are not ruling out a terrorist attack. However, early indications from the forensic team suggest a sophisticated explosive device, of the type used in what was thought to be an earlier gang-related incident in Highland Park. We are told that the FBI and Homeland Security are working closely with. I felt the whip of a cloth on the back of my head. When I snatched a look over my shoulder, Maria was standing behind me with a towel in her hand. We need to talk when the kids are in bed, she said, and thrust the remote at me, then she marched back into the kitchen area. Boy, did I know I had a story to concoct. Even an idiot could connect the dots. The atmosphere was tense throughout our meal and up to and beyond the kids settling in their rooms. Maria went to change. When she returned, she was wearing a full-length bathrobe over pajamas. She had a towel wrapped around her head, and her face covered with a white cream. Her look left everything to the imagination. She might just as well have had a chastity belt on to paint the picture she was telegraphing my way. Well, she said, why don't you tell me what it was that you really went for over in Hamtramck today? Listen, I'm sorry about not telling you about the decorating, I said, hoping to deflect where the conversation was heading. Yeah, the decorating, we'll deal with that later. Answer my question, damn you. Hamtramck? I didn't go. They called off the interview. So you don't mind giving me the phone number to confirm that? It had always worked for me that the best form of defense was to attack. I responded accordingly. Now just wait a damn second. My business is my business. She rose from her chair and stamped her foot. Well now, that's where you're wrong. While ever you're under my roof, what you're up to is my business. I'm not some airhead you can lie to. You come here with a bullet wound after that gang fight over in Highland. Then you go to Hamtramck and the police connect the explosion there to the houses being blown to kingdom come over at Highland Park. Now tell me, who in hell would know how to set sophisticated explosive devices and mount a military type attack? Oh, yeah, don't tell me. Someone with special forces experience. She banged her fists on the table. Now explain to me why I shouldn't go to the police. She collapsed back onto her chair, head in hands, then started to cry because I had nothing to do with what happened over at Hamtramck today. You're lying. I swear on your children's lives that I'm not lying. Don't you dare. 
Don't you dare bring my children into this, she said, then swiped her sleeve across her eyes. Listen, calm down. Give me a Bible and I'll swear I had nothing to do with what went down today. And what about over at Highland Park? Can't say I'd ever had Bible instruction, never mind gone to church. For the heathen that I was, it seemed like a no-brainer. I was going to hell anyways. I swear. It's a coincidence, that's all, I said, in my mind referring to having nothing to do with Hamtramck, just in case there was a god, and he'd strike me down. She glared at me with one eye open and one closed. A sort of stinky-eyed look that Hustler gave me. I was beginning to think it was a look inbred into the locals. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. I walked over to her. Put my arm around her. She didn't pull away. Snuggled her head on my chest. We're good, right? We're good. Her breaths faltered. Thanks for what you did for Roberto today. It's what I'd have done if I'd had the money. It's also the thought of you going away soon. I thought you going might mess with Roberto's mind. He's taken to you. That's why I was mad. And thanks for sticking up for him this morning. Anna told me, she said, and lifted her head. Our lips collided, smearing cream all over my face. I was thankful she hadn't pressed for the phone number. Maybe she didn't really want to know the truth. Come on she said. Bed. On the way to the bedroom, I knew what I had to do the next day. It was time to pay the local militia a visit. Get some answers. Chapter 38 I'd chosen to walk to the city center. It had been a close shave with Maria the night before. The fresh air and the walk helped to clear the cobwebs. Besides, I needed the exercise. My muscles were softening. Maria hadn't heard of the maple bar that I was headed for. Maybe she wasn't the going out type. In my hurry to get the hell out of her apartment, I'd not done a search on her computer, and I'd forgotten the map. It wasn't like me not to prepare, but the incident last night had weighed heavy on my mind. It reminded me of why I didn't want domestic change to have my mind drifting away on missions. Damn it to hell, someone called out from behind a hedge at a driveway. It was followed by what sounded like metal tinkling as it hit concrete. You okay, buddy? I said. A biker in the driveway bent down to pick up his wrench. What's it to you? I showed him my palms. Hey, just being neighborly. Yeah, well go being neighborly somewhere else, he said, and slapped his bike saddle. Bitch here is playing up. What's the problem? Maybe I can help? Yeah, and maybe it can keep on walking. It's an indie mechanic I needs. What year is it? Looks like a Scout 101. 31. Bought it to restore. Rather have had a World War II version, but I couldn't find one. Ignition problem? How'd you guess? Not really a guess. Worked in the circus before I joined the army. They still use those on the wall of death. Bet I can fix it. Hey, whatever bakes your cake, man. Feel free. Tinkering around with the handle twist grip, I exposed the wires. During the conversation, seems we both had a connection to the army. His insignia on the back of his jacket looked like some cartoon joke. Detroit Stingrays, it said in an arc. Under that was a badge sewn on, showing a guy with his hands in the air as if he was screaming and running. Behind that, there was a stingray with its fin flaps back, and its stingtail looked as though it was giving cartoon guy one up the ass. There's your problem. Bare wires. Tape them up temporary and you're good to go. Really, it needs rewiring. The guy taped the wires and then fired up the engine. Hip hip freaking array, he said, and danced around in a circle. I looked at my watch. Damn. Problem, he asked. Yeah, I need to get to the maple bar for a quick business meeting. I'm gonna be late. Any idea where it is? Yeah, it's on Holden Street. I'm barred from there. Well, to be honest, all the members from the Stingray Club are barred ever since before it closed as the Eagle Bar. Toffee-nosed snobs. Some of our guys used to go banging heads down there. New owners kept the exclusion. Said they wanted it to be a hip music venue in the evenings, and they didn't want our kind causing trouble. What business is it that you have there? 
possible job on the horizon. I'll take you. Least I can do. I'll grab the Harley. Stingray pushed the Indian into his garage and returned with a knucklehead. You sure? Yeah. Hop on, he said, and tossed me a helmet. To a throaty roar, we set off. It felt good to be cruising to the rumble of the engine. We were soon outside the bar. I took off my helmet and handed it over. How long will you be? he asked. Not long. Ten to fifteen minutes. Why? Make it no more than fifteen and I'll wait. I'm going to our clubhouse for a drink. They're all ex-army vets. You can join me for a beer. I'll pull around the corner. All of a sudden I'd gone from someone he cussed at, to be being his best drinking buddy. It sounded like an exit plan. Okay, I said, and glanced at my watch. Head down, I walked in through the front door and glanced around. Granger was over at the bar. He was alone. Sitting to one side on a stool. Caressing a bottle of Bud. I edged around behind him into the bar. Can I get you a beer? I said. He swiveled around on his stool. You, he said, setting the bottle on the bar and made to move his hand to his jacket. I wouldn't if I were you, I said, lifting my arm with my hand in my sweatshirt pocket and making the shape of a gun with my fingers. There hadn't been time to make a grab for my gun. I had it tucked into my waistband at my back. I only want to talk, I said. Yeah, well I wouldn't mind some answers. Like... How come you managed to walk out of the station with the interview room door locked? He asked me. It depends on if you give me some answers. Me first. He interrupted. Just who the hell are you? He said. I shook my head. You don't get it, do you? Like I said. I'll go first. What can you tell me about Muhammad Ali Hassan? He'd been slouching up to that point. Now he'd straightened his back. I had his attention. Hassan, the business guy over at Hamtramck who someone tried to blow up yesterday. That's the one, I said. What's your interest? He asked. I'm asking you. It was your Detective Blake who called in the CIA after they found a picture of him near the library incident. So what's your interest? I said. And hoped for a truthful answer. How come you know that there's a connection to us? Did the CIA guy tell you? My questions, remember. What's your interest? I asked him. Okay, I owe you cause you saved my sorry ass. We also managed to suspend Connor. We'd been after him for some time for corruption. It would help if you'd give a statement. Maybe Blake will go easy on you if you admit that you've been up to something else. We could take that into account. No thanks. I guess that. Okay, I'll tell you what you want to know about Hassam. But first I want to know if you had anything to do with the death of that serial killer on the night I stopped you. Not that I'd hold it against you. No one's looking for who took the scum out. No one would witness you admitting the crime. It came as a surprise that they'd found the body. Yeah, right. The answer is no, I lied. You know there's an APB out for you. They're connecting yesterday's incident to the one at Highland Park. You'd be better to come in with me. If you've nothing to do with it, you won't have a problem. He was persistent. A typical MP. It was a nice try. I had to give him that much. I ain't going anywhere, only except under my own steam. Tell me about Hassan. No doubt Blake has your ear to sound out ideas, seeing as how he's taking you under his wing, I said. Maybe. Tell me one thing. Are you with an agency? He asked. I'm one of the bad good guys if that's what you want to know. I couldn't say even if I was on official business. I'm looking for some help here. He picked up his bottle, took a swig, then set it down. What, like for me to tell you where Hassan is so you can finish the job? I was getting nowhere. It had been a stupid idea to think I'd find out any information from him. Now he knew I was still in the city. Big mistake. My fifteen minutes had almost expired according to the clock behind the bar. Let's take a walk to the John, I said. Granger grinned. Like you said, I ain't going anywhere, only except under my own steam, and I need another beer. He called out to the bartender. Another bud over here. He turned to face me. Think carefully, 
There are plenty of witnesses in here, and cameras. Over his shoulder, I could see a fire door around the corner of the bar. Okay, we'll do it another way. No funny moves, or I'll squeeze the trigger. I leaned forward. Removed his pistol. Dropped the clip, then submerged it in a three-quarters full coke glass that someone had discarded on the bar. I'll leave your gun outside by the fire door. Move early and someone could get hurt. Sliding off of the stool, I arced away from him, then to the fire door. He didn't even look my way until I reached the fire door. I pulled my hand from my pocket, my finger and thumb holding the lining to show it was empty, then wiggled my fingers at him to show I hadn't been holding a gun. He slapped the bar with the palm of his hand as the bartender delivered his beer. No sooner through the fire door, I dropped his pistol, rushed around the corner, then hopped onto Stingray's bike. Let's get that beer, I said, and slipped on the helmet over my head. All the way to the club, I kept glancing over my shoulder. It didn't help that he was speeding all the way there. Any minute, I expected a patrol car to pull out and give chase. Chapter 39 Unlike the rest of the industrial buildings in the area, the Stingray Clubhouse wasn't covered in graffiti. Neither did it have a chain-link fence topped with razor wire or an array of security cameras. The sign outside matched my biker friend's badge on his jacket. For the time of day, I was surprised that there were maybe 30 or so bikes lined up outside. Maybe most of them didn't work for a living. There was just the 159 Chevy pickup in the parking lot, which kinda looked out of place. We parked up alongside the other bikes. Let's get that beer now, said Stingray, and he took off his helmet. Leave yours on the seat next to mine. Ain't no one gonna steal them around here. Music was playing through the speakers of the jukebox. It was hard to work out the tune over the top of some serious drinking banter inside, other than it was a rock tune. All of a sudden it was as if someone had flipped a switch to the electrics. It went deadly quiet. All turned to look in my direction, except someone around the corner of the bar who carried on flirting with two women. The bikers varied in age. They were anything from Vietnam vets, on through to Iraq. At least that's what was signed below the Stingray insignia on the back of the jackets. A biker in a wheelchair, his left leg amputated at the knee, rolled his wheels for me to pass. One of the bikers edged off of his stool. He was a good six foot six, wearing a stars and stripes bandana over his head. His eye patch sported the insignia of a snake slithering around a sword. Who the hell is this you dragged in gopher? He fixed my indie. He's cool man. Ex-army. Oh yeah. We'll see about that, he said and walked right up to me. What's your service number? Next I knew, two of the bikers had sidled up either side of me. They pulled sawn-off shotguns from under their jackets. I fired off a false service number as if by rote. Unzip your sweatshirt. He reached out, patted me down at the chest, grabbed my shirt and tore it apart at the buttons. Where are your tags? I wasn't expecting a parade inspection. What's your name? I repeated the service number, finishing off with Sir. Snapped my heels together, then saluted him. A roar of laughter erupted around the room. That's all we need. Another freaking wise guy. Come on, I'll let you buy me a beer. At least we know you're not wired. So what do we calls ya? Ted, I said, not wasting words. My treat, said Gopher. Gopher edged me away from him and over to the corner of the bar. He ordered the beers, then leaned over to me. Give him a wide berth and he won't bother you none. I glanced in the big guy's direction, and for a few seconds we locked eyes, then I looked away. Where did the nickname Gopher come from? Isn't that some sort of critter, I said. It is a critter, but that's not where I got the handle from. You must have had someone in your unit who could conjure up stuff that was in short supply. Yeah, I guess, I said, and recalled Scrounger back at the police station. There you are then. I used to get, go for this or go for that, so go for sort of stuck. Get it? The bartender put the beers in front of us. Big fella called out to Gopher and signaled him to his side. Gopher walked over to him and they spoke. In the mirror behind the bar, every now and then I noticed Gopher looked my way. The guy around the corner of the bar was getting over flirty with one of the girls. 
she kept pushing his hand from her thigh. In the reflection, I could see coke of the white kind being snorted at the tables. It was more than the server was likely to dispense of the drinking kind from behind the bar. Gopher sidled up to me, then slapped me on the back. Where were you stationed? Iraq. Which unit? I could see where this was going and who wanted the info. I reeled off the name of a unit our team had been stationed with before heading out on a mission. It didn't satisfy him until I told him a few stories some of the unit had relayed to me, adding a smattering of jargon. Out of the corner of my corner, I noticed him give Big Fella the thumbs up sign. Then I sent him a few questions of my own. That did the trick. A few beers and I couldn't get him to stop running off at the mouth. Listen, thanks for the beers and the stories, but I need to be going. I'll take ya. Appreciate the offer. All the same, I'll take a bus. There was a commotion behind me. When I turned, the flirty guy had tipped over a table. Some freaking gratitude. Where's my money? I don't give samples away, he said. Hey, big fella called out, don't go bringing down crap in here. There are plenty of other suppliers. The flirty guy was unsteady on his feet, clearly drunk probably fired up with combining his drinks and Charlie, judging by the white powder under his nose. You want me to repeat that to handbag? Freaking dickhead. Go and wipe your ass with your bandana, he slurred and aimed his disrespect at big guy. The drunk had my attention when he'd mentioned handbag's name. To a scraping of chairs and table legs, the bikers formed a circle around him. He obviously had everyone's attention. Big fella hopped off of his seat. I should go, I said. Gopher put his arm across me. One of the bikers slid the bolt on the exit door. I wouldn't if I were you. This could be your chance to join us. A sort of initiation. He ain't gonna get away with disrespecting our general like that. General? Yeah. All you gotta do is to beat on him. Give him a few kicks. Draw blood. I showed him the palm of my hands. I want none of this. Is there a back way out? Shush, said Gopher. Big fella ground out some phlegm and spat it out on the drunk shoe. Oh, there's no need for you to tell Handbag. I'll send him a message myself, Big fella said, as he stepped forward. There was no sign of rage or aggression in Big fella's demeanor. You don't have the balls. It's not my balls I'm gonna send him, it's your ugly freaking head with crap for brains I'll send him. One of the bikers swung a baseball bat at the back of Flirty Guy's legs. He dropped to his knees and made to put his hand under his jacket. He half revealed his gun when Big Fella's boot connected under his jaw, snapping his head back. The circle closed with a flurry of boots and fists vying to hit the target. Big Fella stood back and laughed. The guy on the deck deserved a beating for the disrespect, but it was looking as though he wouldn't make it out of there alive. The last thing I wanted was to be dragged in as a witness to another homicide. I stepped behind Big Fella, reached for my pistol, then dug the barrel at the back of his head. I think the guy's got the message. Call your troops off of him and let's all calm down. Whoa there, he called out. Leave him alone. Give him some air, said the general. One by one, they realized what was going down and stepped away. All of you, step over to the wall. If one of you as much as flinches, I swear I'll take the general out, right here. You won't make it to the door, Gopher said. If you do, this dude ain't gonna drive you away in his truck, not in his condition. Whatever, unbolt the door and drag him outside to his truck. Gopher took him by the legs, dragged him to the door, leaving a trail of blood from the guy's head on the floorboards. What now? Big fella asked. Caught off guard with the sneeze from Hill, he turned on me at speed took my gun, then pointed it between my eyes. He held out his other arm as a signal for the others to stay out of it, then tossed my gun over the bar. He pulled his own gun from his waistband and it followed mine behind the bar. I should have known with the insignia on his eye patch. He was likely ex-special forces with that move. Ah, you want a brother fight? I'm game, I said, and beckoned him on with my fingers. Mindful of my bad arm, I altered my stance sideways on. I wasn't sure my arm would hold out if I threw a punch. I didn't need the fight. Not with thirty or so hairy bikers in the clubhouse, some of them armed to the teeth. 
The fire door behind Big Fellow was chained and padlocked. There was a door behind the bar, but I didn't have a clue where it went. Over at the exit, I could see one of the two women get into the driver's side of the pickup, while the other helped the guy into the passenger side. They must have been with him all along. Gopher appeared at the door, flicking his head as if to join him. Either that, or he gained a Tourette's tick. The guy's gone now. We don't have to do this, I said, and wondering how far I'd get if I dove over the bar for my gun. We danced a little, then he threw a punch. I sidestepped. His weight turned him sideways and low with him punching at air, so I helped him along with a push on his shoulder, and swept my boot across his ankles. The move took him down. He crashed into a table. Now he didn't seem so big. Some of the guys stepped forward. Get back, I got this, he said, putting his hands on the tables either side of him for purchase to stand. It was like he'd offered me his head as he started to haul himself to his feet. I slapped both his ears with the palms of my hands cupped, sending him disorientated into limbo land. Dug my fingers at his carotid artery. If he was ex-special forces, he was out of training to miss a sucker move like that coming. His eyes twitched, the pupils disappearing as he fell to the floor. I rolled over the bar, grabbed both guns, then jumped to my feet. The guys were either too afraid to counter his orders to stay out of it, or I'd caught them unawares. I waved one of the guns. Two of you get him to his feet, he'll be fine. Just who the hell are you? He groaned out, as the two of them helped him to sit on a chair. Just a brother vet out for a drink that doesn't want the cops coming down on me. If you have taken it too far with the drunk guy, I said, then worked my way around the bar into the exit. Get your bike running, I shouted out to Gopher, pointing one gun at him, with the other covering the vets. Leave him, I heard big fella call out. I imagine that was meant for his buddies. Come here again and you're dead. No doubt that was meant for me. Outside, Gopher pulled alongside of me. I kicked the first bike in the line and the rest went down like a row of dominoes. I hopped onto the saddle and we were off, leaving the helmet behind, together with what I imagined were some angry bikers. Where to? Gopher shouted. Your house. Chapter 40 Over at Gopher's house, I emptied the bullets from Big Fella's mag and put the bullets in my pocket. I handed the gun over. Give it to your general next time you see him, I said. Will do. You got that over quickly back there, said Gopher. No point hanging around where you're not wanted. I wasn't about to wait for a points decision. Knock out punch every time if you can, I say. Gopher smirked. Cool. But I wouldn't be going back there if I were you. The general meant what he said. He won't make the same mistake twice. It was time to ask a question and the reason I wanted him alone. What was all that about handbag? Is he your supplier? I asked him. He narrowed his eyes. You DA or something? I snickered. If I was, I wouldn't have gone in without a team. So no, I'm not DA or a cop, so stand at ease. I'm just thinking of doing some business with handbag, that's all. Need some background intel, I said. Well, you won't get it from me. We have a code, he said and then spat on the ground. Then why signal me to the door? Not sure how your buddies would take that if they knew, I said. That a threat? No, it's a fact. Gopher stoked his beard and inspected his boots, then looked me in the eyes. Look, I was trying to tell you to get the hell out. Listen, I ain't no killer, he said. I know that. How come? Cause you ain't seen action. You were full of crap back there. Where did you get those stories from, the internet, or reading books? Those weapons you mentioned weren't even developed or deployed back then. Don't think your buddies would be pleased to know that back at the clubhouse. His cheeks reddened. He rolled his eyes in their sockets. Stamped his boot on the concrete. I was in the army. Bastards didn't ship me abroad, that's all. Listen, if I tells you about handbag, we all done here? Yeah, we'll be all done. I'm out of Detroit in the next few days. He did some huffing and puffing before he could spit it out. I guessed he was chewing over if I'd somehow let it be known he was lying about his service. Okay. Look, from what I hear, 
I know he's not long moved into the dealing stuff business. Brings it in by boat, sometimes light aircraft. The general's not happy. He don't hold with that sort of stuff, but some of the guys are so messed up in the head, he lets it pass by them snorting the crap. It's not like the VA will sort their crap out, he said. Any ideas where I'll find him? He used to hang out on the docks, but word is that he's fallen out with his boss these past few days. Gone into hiding. Started his own action by all accounts and his boss has found out. I don't have a clue where he's at now. So what you saying? He's muscling in on his boss's territory? Nah, from what I hear, his boss didn't like him getting into dealing, and he'd been stealing stuff from his boss to finance buying the crap. A little more probing and he was all talked out. All he had was hearsay. Interesting hearsay. Interesting enough for me to have something to chew over. Good luck with the Indian. Just one thing. I'd refine your stories if I were you. Do a little research, I said. Enough said, he replied. I gave him a salute, though he didn't deserve it. It was all I had to give him for the information, besides the advice. Turning on my heels, I headed back in the direction of Maria's apartment. Gopher was unlikely to call the clubhouse and have them come looking for me. He had too much to lose. His head for one thing, I thought, while recalling the kicking they gave the dealer. I'd learned the mistake he had made early in my life. If you're gonna lie, we've a web that can't be broken, even under torture. The situation seemed hopeless. Any one of three people could have the answers to what I was looking for, but they'd all gone to ground. Unless Greg activated his phone, Lone Wolf wouldn't be able to get back to me with his position. Making a deal to swap the artifact with handbag for info would be risky. Just where the CIA was keeping Mole would be hopeless to find out. And now I had to worry about the cops having an APB out on me. That alone would clip my wings to seek them out. A bus rolled up to the stop, and I hopped on board. I'd had enough exercise for one day. One thing I couldn't stop exercising was my mind. It was rolling round in every direction like a spinning wheel. Detective Blake knew enough about Moe's activities to have contacted his CIA babysitters when he'd found the Xerox copy of his image. But there again, were they babysitting him? Maybe they just had him under surveillance. That didn't make sense. Even if he was smuggling artifacts, what would that have to do with national security and the CIA? That would be a job for the customs, maybe the FBI, or Homeland Security on home soil. The bus stopped a short distance from Maria's apartment. I pulled the hood over my head, then getting off of the bus, I stepped over to a store doorway. At the entrance road to the apartment block, two black youths were leaning against their vehicle. It wasn't them I was interested in. It was a guy with his head bandaged, and the rusted out 59 Chevy parked behind them that caught my attention. One of the women I'd seen him with at the club hung out of the window and called out to him. He limped to his vehicle as if he'd crapped in his pants. The dealer climbed inside, then they drove away. He dallied just long enough for me to get a handle on his plate number. I set off back to the bus stop and did a right at the corner to take the back route to the apartment. No sooner inside, I located my satellite phone. I tapped in the plate number and added a message to Lone Wolf, then pressed the send button. I waited a few minutes in case he was minded to reply. While I was waiting, with Gopher mentioning the code they lived by, I recalled my first meeting with Lone Wolf when I joined the unit. We just finished a 15-mile hike in full combat gear. Any questions? He asked. Yes, sir. What does the Latin stand for under the unit's insignia? I asked him. It's the code we live by. What's that, sir? Don't poke your colleague's wife. Don't mess with your enemy's wife or any other mother's daughter as far as that goes on a mission. Stick to the business or you're out. There was no way those three Latin words stood for all that. Greg must have seen I wasn't buying the explanation. It means death before dishonored dick breath, Greg had whispered, only to be called out and made to speed walk around the field five times, carrying his ninety-pound ruck and twenty pounds of body armor. Just thinking about Greg had me wanting to vomit. As soon as ever he was handed his discharge papers, he must have given the code a two-fingered salute, I thought. Chapter 41 the fifth night. Maria arrived back at the apartment with the kids. 
I'd worked out that I needed some transport for the evening. Renting a car would leave a paper trail. I was hoping Charm and a little groveling would get me what I wanted. Hmm, that smells good, Maria said, as she walked into the living area. It's only spaghetti bolognese. Thought you could do with the rest, so I rustled us up a meal. That sounds good. Thanks. It looked as though I'd made progress with Roberto. He sidled up to me with his hands behind his back, then withdrew a hand and held up a painting. He'd painted a picture of a stick man and woman holding hands, with a girl at one side and a boy at the other side. That's great. Did you paint that? I said. He nodded. Miss gave me a star, he said, and puffed out his chest with a gold star stuck on his shirt. He dropped the painting on the breakfast bar and pulled out his other hand from behind his back. Roberto thrust a Batman comic at me. Read it, he said. Sure, after you've changed out of your school clothes, and we've eaten. He grabbed a hold of my hand and tugged on it for me to follow him to his bedroom. His face and hands were smudged with paint. Anyone in the restroom, I called out in the hallway. Roberto needs a wash. Don't let him use the shower or he could slip. Fill the bathtub. I'll be right out, Maria said. No trouble, I got this. I had to smile when I lifted him into the tub. He grabbed a hold of some Spider-Man shampoo and stabbed it at me. Hold your hand out. You're old enough to wash your own hair. That was a big mistake. The soap landed in his eye and he started to cry. I cupped my hands and splashed water over his eyes, then dabbed them with the towel. That was the second mistake. We finished up in a full-on water splashing fight. What the hell's going on in there, Maria said, and looked around the doorway. Don't worry about it, I'll mop the floor, I said, and lifted him out of the tub, then wrapped the towel around him. I cradled him into my arms to carry him into his bedroom. He weighed nothing. It was like carrying a pillow. I'd not realized just how fragile kids could be, but I launched him through the air and onto his bed anyway, to his squeals of delight. As fragile as kids could be, what kid didn't like a rough and tumble? Come on, soldier, let's get you dressed. Sitting around the dining table, it wasn't looking as though I'd made the same progress with Anna as she'd reverted to type in my presence. All she did was to scowl all the way through the meal. After what happened at the swings, I thought I'd won her over. Maybe it was because Roberto was getting all the attention from me. That was the third mistake I'd made. The spaghetti bolognese. There was more on his face and the floor than he'd eaten. He'll need another bath, I said. He'll be fine. Just wipe it off with a damp cloth when he's finished, said Maria, as I dive-bombed the last of the spaghetti into his mouth on the fork. So when is it you're going? Anna said. I'd noticed her endlessly rolling the strands of spaghetti around her fork, but she'd hardly eaten anything. In a few more days, why? Don't you like my cooking? She didn't answer the question. Will Mom be having a baby after you're gone? What? Her answer stunned me. Maria pushed back on her chair and rose to her feet. Anna! Where did that come from, young lady? Donna! She said if you're sleeping with him, it's to make babies. Get to your room, now. We'll talk about it in there. Anna stomped off into her bedroom. I exchanged glances with Maria. Sorry. She must have heard me go to your room, I said. There's nothing to be sorry about. I'll deal with her. Listen, I'll give you all some space. Any chance of borrowing your car? As long as you bring it back in one piece, or Mom will go crazy. How long will you be? Two or three hours. It should be enough time for you to calm things down, and maybe they'll be in bed when I return. Take as long as you like. You have a key for the front door. Just don't leave the tank empty, she said, and tossed me the key. Listen, I promise to read Roberto's comic. I'll read a few pages, then settle him with the game first. Fine, she said, then marched toward the hallway. A door slammed, followed by raised voices. Come on, let's wipe your face, then I'll read your comic. I sat him on my knee, read a few pages, then settled him at the television. The shouting had died down as I walked out of the door. The two black youths were still at the exit. 
I didn't like the idea of dealers so close to Maria's apartment if that's what they were doing. It's not like they'd been there all the time I'd stayed at Maria's. There again, the last thing I needed was to give away my position with the connection they probably had to handbag. Taking them to task would be a parting present if they were still around when I left. For now, all I did was to glare at them as I passed by, then set off in the direction of the dealer's house to the address Lone Wolf had messaged me with. Chapter 42 There was only one way in and out of the apartment complex where Dealer lived. It was the same sort of desolate area where Handbag used to live, only with more people around. No doubt there were good people who lived there, but it wouldn't be by choice. Probably the majority who lived there would be trapped by fate. Stuck on welfare benefits and food stamps. I could see why he drove around in a rusty pickup to blend in with his surroundings. All I did was to drive by his apartment block, clocked his pickup, then drove out again. The kids in the street had eyeballed me all the way. Some women had hung out of their windows along with their laundry. They shouted across at each other over the top of hip-hop music. The sounds competed with each other to deafen eardrums. The last thing I would have wanted to have done was to go knocking on doors and start asking questions. Not without some serious backup. I parked up around a hundred yards away from the turning to his apartment. Turned off my headlights, then cut the engine. At the corner of the entrance and set back were rows of dumpsters. They were overflowing. Street dogs pulled at plastic bags with their teeth, ripping them open with their paws, then sniffed through the contents. Every once in a while one of them would discover someone's leftover meal and all hell would break loose as the dogs fought for the scraps. As interesting as the study of pack behavior was, working out which one was alpha male, who he favored, and which was the run of the pack pushed to the back of the line, I was bored to death. Can't say how long I'd been parked, maybe an hour, when I hunkered down on my seat as I saw the distinct outline of his pickup at the junction. He pulled out and set off along the highway. I let a few cars pass. Fired up my engine and followed him. One of the cars in front peeled off. Easing off of the gas pedal. I let a few more cars overtake. North of the city, we hit countryside, and he turned right. I switched off my lights, followed him, then pulled over and stopped. There were no vehicles to give cover, so I watched his headlights for some distance. He turned left and headed toward two large domed roof buildings. I pulled out and followed the road until I passed the entrance where he turned. There was a large sign pegged in the field. Flight Training School had read and at the side of it was a picture of a cartoon light aircraft. There was a thick line struck through the words, and with clothes painted underneath. Over in the distance, I saw the silhouette of two people climb out of the pickup and one of them limped over to one of the domed buildings. Light flooded the area as a door opened and they both disappeared inside. I arrived at a dead end on the road, and parked. Thankful that there was no street lighting, I found a gap in the hedge, and walked in a crouch all the way to the buildings. There was a control tower to the right of the buildings. I cursed at not having a night vision device with me. It wasn't lit, but there was no saying there wouldn't be a lookout up there. In a parking lot to the side of the first hangar, I noticed Handbag's Mustang, the rusty pickup, and three other vehicles. At the back of the building, welding flashes intermittently lit up the area outside a window, to the sound of metal being ground. Without warning, all the activity stopped. The lights went out inside. Then I heard voices in the parking lot. There was no mistaking Handbag's voice. Dipshit. You're meant to sell the stuff not snort it, get freaking drunk, then cause problems with customers, he said. They were disrespectful. Said you were a piece of crap, was the reply, lying about what the general had said. What you want me to do, start a war with a bunch of vets. Get back there tomorrow and eat crow. If they don't play ball, then we'll see about teaching them a lesson. If you don't sort it, maybe I'll cut your balls off and hand your sack to them. Sorry, boss. Handbag fired back. Idiot. We've enough problems with manpower trying to find the dude who cut off my freaking locks. Bastard had one of our cops suspended. Now I have to work out if we should take him out in case he talks. Who the cop? Or the dude? Both of them, idiot. The dude's a certainty once I get what's mine from him. Car doors slammed. Engines fired up. Ten minutes and there was complete silence. 
Hanbeck's sentiment was understandable. However, I appreciated the warning. It took some rooting about to find something to pry the window, but once I found a discarded length of metal, I was in. Crouching on a workbench under the window, I looked around. My eyes became accustomed to the dark, but it wasn't enough. Looking out over the hangar, it was a sea of old cars in various degrees of disassembly, with some complete. The distinct smell of solvent drifted from a paint spray booth to my left. Easing off of the bench, I drifted between the rows of cars until I found what I was looking for, an inspection lamp clamped to an open hood of one of the cars. Connecting the wires to the battery, at last I could see what business they had going on there. He obviously had a love of muscle cars. Judging by the different models, he didn't seem to mind what makes they were. What was odd, was that they all had Belgian and German license plates. Arriving at a vehicle stripped down to the chassis, it was obvious what their game was. One side of the box metal on the chassis was freshly welded at the ends. The other side of the frame was open, with a piece of string hanging out. I pulled on the string. Two packages popped out like a string of sausages. Taking my penknife from my pocket, I cut the second packet, then scooped a blade full of the contents. Tasting it with my tongue, I spat it out. There was no mistaking the taste. Our tongues were the only way of identifying it in Afghanistan, that and the toxic smell when we torched it. We'd gone in to take out a gang of smugglers. They'd swapped it from the Taliban in exchange for AKs and explosives for use in making IEDs. I stuffed the packages back in the chassis and moved on. There was a tanker truck that was out of place. The top two-thirds of the tank was sliced off ready for mounting back on the bottom third which had been plated to create a compartment. The livery signage written on the door to the truck simply said, Sewage disposal and under that, septic tanks and blocked drains are our specialty. I could imagine custom officials and sniffer dogs letting it pass by. If this was the operation that had broken away from Lowe's business, then it must have cost some serious dollars to set it up. Over in the corner were metal steps to a mezzanine floor and some offices. I was up there in a flash, collecting a flashlight on the way. His security was lax. I would have had someone to 24-7. He hadn't even locked the filing cabinet drawers. Fingering through the files, I came to one tabbed, insurance. It was nothing of the sort. It was stacked full of Xerox copies of shipping manifests in the name of one of Mo's businesses. I took out my cell phone and took photos of the most recent ones. The next file contained shipping manifests for containers from Europe in the name of Leroy Gibson, American Car Import-Export. The manifests explained the foreign license plates. Attached to the documents were invoices for vehicles bought from individuals at U.S. Army bases at far less than they would be worth in the U.S. It was becoming more obvious that handbag wasn't just muscle. Most of the manifests were for shipping to northern U.S. ports, with a few listed for Canadian ports. It was the last one that interested me. It was one of Moe's and due to dock in New Jersey at North Charleston. I heard a door grate on runners, so I turned off the flashlight and crouched. Come on, boy, sniff him out. That was all I needed. A dog and a guard. Forget it, come here, boy. Idiots left a lamp connected. He must have disconnected the inspection lamp from the battery because my surroundings fell to darkness. The door grated to a close. I sighed a deep breath of relief. Digging in my jacket pocket, I pulled out a bug transmitter. Stuck it to the back of the filing cabinet. Through the office window, I watched the guard and the dog walk over to the second hangar. The guy unlocked the door and walked inside. Shortly after, light poured out of the hangar window. I was down the stairway and out of the back window in no time. Curiosity had me stalking over to the second hangar. Through the back window, I could see a two-seater light aircraft and two choppers. Behind them was what must have been millions of dollars of completed custom cars. This was no nickel and dime operation. Handbag must have been skimming big time for Mo to build such a fleet of assets. At that thought, I froze. A German Alsatian looked me right in the eyes and growled in a low rumble. Brewster, where are you, boy? Come here. Chapter 43 The Sixth Night It was tense there for a while as I tussled with the dog. The guard kept calling out the dog's name, and with some relief, the dog lost interest and trotted away. 
I made my way back to the car and set off back to Maria's apartment. Tiptoeing along the hallway at the apartment, I hoped they were all asleep. In the living room, I stopped in my tracks. Maria was sprawled out on the sofa, sleeping. As quietly as I could, I stepped into the kitchen area. The coffee pot was only warm, so I flicked the switch on the percolator. Maria stirred, threw her legs over the sofa, then yawned. Ted! Sorry. Tried not to wake you, I said. I was getting worried. You've been gone so long. I looked at my watch. It was just gone twelve thirty. Yeah, I parked and took a walk. Ended up in a fight with a dog. A dog? Someone must have lit it off of the leash. Are you okay? Just a few scratches. Maria was off her backside before I could blink. She switched on the light, then hurried around to the breakfast bar. Oh, my God. Look at your jeans. And your arm. I poured a coffee and took a sip. It's nothing. All the same, I'll get my first aid kit. Take a seat on the Davenport. Maria grabbed her kit from the cupboard, then ushered me over to the sofa. I enjoyed the attention. Renee would have fainted at the sight of blood. Chalk and cheese came to mind. Sure, they both had the looks, but Maria was different. Special. Most of the women I'd met since my divorce, it was all me, myself, and I, with duck lip selfies, texting, and goddamn talk about shoes and chocolate. They're only paw scratches. What about your leg? Not sure. It stings a little. Better take off your jeans. Where did this happen? The park near to here, I lied. Probably a street dog. We had an infestation a while back. Dog catchers have thinned them out since then. The owners abandoned them when they moved out of Detroit, but there's still quite a few around. Maria clicked her tongue as I stepped out of my jeans. She winced. You in trouble. It seems to follow you everywhere. The teeth marks had only just broken the skin. I was lucky. So was the dog. The punch on the side of its head had sent Brewster whimpering back to its owner. Fortunately, the security guard hadn't spotted me, and I made it to a wooded area behind the hangars after the dog had skulked away. Then I'd watched them until they were out of sight. Maria cleaned up the wounds and bandaged them. Thanks. No problem. I should say thanks for lending me the car. Can't say I've enjoyed traveling around by bus. She pushed back in the cushion. Tell me it's in one piece? Yeah, don't worry. And I've filled the tank. Listen, you'll be going the day after tomorrow. I've arranged for Anna to stay at Mom's after school. If I drop Roberto off here first, could you look after him until I get back? Sure. Talking about Anna, did you manage to, you know? Yeah. I sorted her out. She's at that difficult age. I can't let her stop me having a life. Not after the sacrifices I've had to make for the both of them. Maria had a point. She leaned over, held the back of my head, and drew me over to her. We shared a kiss. Come on, let's go to bed. I have to be up early, she said. I'll be back with Roberto at five. She wasn't the only one that had to be up and about early. People to see. Loose ends to tie together. The only problem was that sticking my neck out to get answers might just get my head chopped off. The only comfort I could take from that thought was that it was preferable to life in prison once I arrived back at the unit. One thing was certain, and that was time and my freedom was running out. Mentally, I had already mapped out the order of my day. Chapter 44 I was awake on the sofa facing away from the dining table. Pretended to be spark out. Maria was trying her best to keep the kids quiet. Anna was doing her best to make as much noise as possible. It was her I didn't want to face. Hopefully, with her going to her grandma's, it would be the last I'd see of her. Right, come on you two, outside. School time, Maria said in a hushed tone. The outside door opened. Just a minute, Mom. Forgot my math book, I heard Anna call out. The next thing I knew... Someone was pushing at my back. Rolling over, I came face to face with Anna. So you'll be gone tomorrow? Yeah, guess so. 
Mom says you won't be back. Only she was crying when she said it. Why can't you come back to see her? I rolled my legs off of the sofa and faced her. I live a long way from here. It's not easy. That's not to say I can't keep in touch. But you won't, will you? We'll see. Anna. We'll be late. Coming, she said, then reached forward and kissed me on the cheek. Thanks for yesterday at the swings. Gotta say, I felt the heat in my cheeks at a blush that was developing as she turned on the ball of her foot, then ran out of the room along the hallway. The outside door closed. The silence was deafening, in the sense that I was stunned with Anna mentioning that Maria had been crying at thoughts of me leaving. Not only that, but Anna had swallowed her pride to try and to make things right for her mom's sake, displaying maturity beyond her years. Pushing up to stand, I walked over to the window. I'd not heard her car drive off. I caught sight of them walking and turning the corner. A caffeine fix was in order. Over on the table, it looked as though she'd left another note. On the top of the note was a car key. Feel free to use the car. I've taken the bus. Coffee is fresh. Bacon needs reheating in microwave. Bread buttered for sandwiches under plate. I had to sit down. Take a minute to think. The whole situation was something I could get used to if I didn't have so much crap to sort out. The thought crossed my mind that I should leave before she came back. I'd paid my way. Made my intentions clear. What more could I do? Only save face and be gone. They'd get over it. They'd have to. I pulled out her laptop from the kitchen cupboard. Set it on the dining table with the coffee and sandwiches. Took a swig of coffee, then typed value of smuggled artifacts, USA into the browser search. One reply caught my eye. One billion dollars of archaeological artifacts smuggled through Bulgaria and Macedonia every year. A good chunk of that was currently working its way through trafficking routes from Syria, with the USA and Canada and Italy being the main destinations. The figures were startling. Most likely ISIS was responsible for the Syrian contraband. In return, it would give them a good chunk of change from America to fund their caliphate. Ironic really when I thought about the situation. And there I was, with a million dollars of their ill-gotten gains in my ruck. Before that, it had been adorning handbags nightstand. I pushed back on my chair, retrieved Hustler's cell phone from the cupboard, then switched on the power. The phone buzzed like crazy. 32 messages from handbag. Each one said the same except the last one. Get it back to me or you're dead, they all said. The last one was more ominous. I'm close to finding you. Real close. Call me. It was tempting, but he wasn't the first on my list. Taking out CIA agent Adam's card, I dialed his cell number. The call picked up, but no one answered. Just someone having a coughing fit. Hi, is that Agent Adams? Edward Joyce here. We met at police headquarters. He's not here. I've replaced him. You probably won't be able to help if you don't know my name. I know who you are. He briefed me. You're part of Sockham. Where are you? His reply gave me some comfort. Still in Detroit. Can we meet? Only I have some information and need some help on something that involves national security. Probably ISIS smuggling artifacts into the U.S. He didn't answer right away. Well? I'm thinking. It's awkward. Wait, sure, I know. Meet me at the old Fisher body plant. Harper Avenue. It's around back. You'll see a red fire hydrant outside some chain-link fencing at a corner. There's a hole in the fencing surrounding a parking lot. I'll meet you there, say one hour. Got it. How will you know it's me? Adam said your picture on file from your license. Oh, yeah. How will I recognize you? You'll recognize me. We've met before. What's your name? You mean my pretend name, the same as your name isn't Edward Joyce? Give me a break. You'll know who I am when you see me. Okay, understood, I said, and closed the call. I couldn't for the life of me think who he was. But then we'd worked closely with so many CIA operatives over the years. He could have been any one of them. Hopefully, whoever he was, 
I could get a fix on Moe's hideaway. A glance at my watch, and I decided to set off right away. Grabbing a few items from my rock and I was gone. The derelict fisher plant wasn't hard to find from the map. It stuck out like a sore thumb against the skyline when I arrived. Vandals had worked their way through the levels smashing every window panel in sight. Can't say I was happy at the venue. But then it was better than me stuck in an office where the police could block the exits. I parked some distance away. Climbed out of my car to reconnoiter the area. Twenty minutes scouting was long enough to work out an exit strategy for if needs be. I arrived back at my car, then drove to Antonio Street. It looked as good as any escape route I could work out. There was an office complex open with plenty of cars in the lot. With no access for visitors, I parked in the street. If necessary, a quick drive around the corner and I'd be under the underpass and away. I glanced at my watch as I locked the door. Five minutes to our meeting. I worked my way over to a grassy area across from the plant, then crouched behind some bushes. I half expected an SUV with tinted windows to appear. Instead, I saw a suit walking next to the building inside the parking lot area. I lifted my binoculars, then zoomed in. There was no mistaking who it was, even in a suit. We were given the name of Joe Carter when he joined us on the mission to rescue those hostages in Somalia. It was him all right. Trigger happy himself, which I thought scary, seeing as how there was a bulge under his jacket. But then what self-respecting CIA agent wouldn't be packing heat? It was the venue that bugged me more than anything. That, and his vehicle was nowhere around that I could see. It was the paranoia thing again. Maybe I was being too careful. Maybe not. Chapter 45 Digging my hands into my jacket pockets, I jogged over to the chain link fence. You bird spotting, he said, and pointed to my binoculars hanging loose. Sort of, I said, then tucked them inside my jacket and zipped it up. Climb on through the hole. We can talk inside. No thanks. If it's all the same, we'll talk here. There's no one around, I said, then dug my hands back in my jacket pockets. I felt more secure with the chain link fence between us. He made a move to put his hand inside his jacket. Whoa there, buddy, hold on a minute. Not so fast, I said, lifting my arm with my hand still in the pocket. There was no feint this time, as I feathered my finger on the safety trigger of my Glock, squeezing it the one time to release the safety. He quickly dropped his arm, then deliberately unfastened his jacket at the button. He took a hold of his lapel and opened up his jacket. There was a folded sheet of paper hanging out of his inside pocket. The copy of your license, remember? Just want to make sure it's you. His power of observation was on the poor side if he couldn't remember me. It had only been six months. I eased off the trigger. Tease it out, real slow. It was definitely the copy of my license. So, you don't remember my face from Somalia? I thought you were in Iraq. Oh, I remember you all right. Just needed to check. I was in Iraq. Not been back long, he said, and with the paper back in his pocket, he let go of his lapel. Why here? I said. Why not? I used to live nearby as a kid. Dad worked here. As you can see, there's no one around. Fair enough, I replied. So, what's all this about national interest? I gave him a potted version of what I'd found while in Detroit, but held some back for if I needed leverage. The important bits. So you think all this has a connection back to your buddies getting whacked? Could be, but I need some time alone with Mo to get some answers. And what about this handbag guy? Do you think he's involved in the hit on your buddies? Not sure. Doubt it. Is that dog crap on your left shoe? He hopped on one leg to take a look. Can't see anything. Must have been the light playing tricks. He straightened up. You still have the artifact then. Where is it? Safe. So do I get to see Mo now? Not sure. I'd have to think about it. Maybe ask someone higher up the chain. Where are you staying? Sleeping rough. I backed away onto the road. You have my cell phone number. Text me when you've chewed it over. Now put your hands behind your head and walk along the wall around back. Bit dramatic if you want my help. 
Less dramatic if your idea is to turn me in. Like I said, you have my cell phone number from when I called. Don't waste time trying to follow the cell pings off of the towers. I'm not stupid enough to have switched it on and to have called you from near where I'm hiding out. I lied, at realizing my mistake. Just don't leave it too long. Send a text. I'll read it when I turn it on. 24 hours and I'm out of here. Then I'll give what I have to the FBI and Homeland Security to cut a deal for if the civilian police still have me pegged for the homicides. His brow scrunched, making deep furrows across his forehead. No agency likes to be outdone by another agency. Be in touch, he said, placing his hands on his head, then he turned, walking back the way he came. I stepped backwards, matching him step by step until I'd reached the bushes and he'd turned the corner. Back at the car, I couldn't wait to get away from there quick enough. It was a little late to be switching off my cell phone, but I did anyway, then removed the SIM card, while juggling one-handed with the steering wheel. It didn't go as planned, but I learned something. Quite a few things, really. The main thing was that he knew where Mo was, but wouldn't tell me. It didn't take long to get to the Maple Bar. It surprised me that I didn't have to use the map. I parked two blocks away from the bar after scanning the area for cameras. If Granger was a creature of habit, he'd likely go there every day. Have a few beers for him to get the taste of the streets out of his psyche, then go home to sleep. It's what most squad guys did after a hard day's toil, and to maybe shoot some pool. Old habits die hard as they say. It was closed. Didn't open until 11. I doubted he'd arrive by car. Not worth the risk of drinking and driving. Especially when you're a traffic cop. I walked on by. Took in the scene around the bar. Found a coffee bar with a good view of the entrance to the bar. Eased onto the bench near the window. Ordered a coffee from the server. The television was showing some political guy, probably making promises he couldn't keep. Proficient liars, the lot of them. I wondered if that's what I could do when I discharged from the services. It wasn't a big stretch for me to imagine I could pull it off. It would be the having to wear a suit and not being able to avoid cussing that would put me off. Besides, I wasn't a people person. Can't say I hadn't thought what it was I'd do when I left the army. I couldn't think of anything that would mimic the buzz of missions. Granger was trying to get that buzz back with him trying to make detective. That could be his weak spot. It was gone eleven. The guy over at the maple bar changed the closed sign on the door to open. A few diehards entered. None of them Granger. Just about to drain the last of my coffee and I almost choked on the drakes. They're facing me on the television was my mugshot from the license. I advised not to tackle him, but to phone. I didn't need to know the rest. Teased a ten from my wallet. Dropped a bill on the table, then I skedaddled out of there. Pulling my head over my head as I crossed the lanes of traffic. A vehicle tooted long and loud as I zigzagged my way across. A taxi screeched to a halt, almost taking me down from the thigh. To the sound of cussing from the taxi driver, I stepped onto the sidewalk and looked in a store window. Everything looked normal in the coffee bar. No one walked out to see which direction I'd taken. The server was clearing my table. A glance to my left, then I snatched my vision back and walked to the right on past the maple bar, mingling with the other pedestrians. Granger was strutting along the sidewalk, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. There were two options. Wait for him to walk in through the door to the bar, then for me try and strike a meaningful conversation with him to get some answers. The second option was to get the hell away from there and back to the car in case someone recognized me and they'd phone the cops. Chapter 46 The feeling that it was heads I was toast and tails I was fried had me in two minds. Blinkers on. No scratching your asses, I recalled Lone Wolf saying on nearly every occasion before training for a mission at the horror factory. Split-second decisions as to which corridor to take to get to hostages wasn't an option. You had a task mapped out and memorized so you didn't deviate. Not until the crap hit the proverbial fan. There was no crap flying as I pushed the door and entered the maple bar. The first thing I noticed was that all the televisions were tuned to show the same ice hockey game. No chance of a rerun of the news with my mugshot while the game was playing. Granger was sitting on a stool facing the bar. I walked up right behind him. Thought you might be back, he said, 
not even bothering to turn around. You have eyes in the back of your head, I asked him. Saw your reflection in the polished brass on the bar taps. Never seen anyone else with a hood up in here, only you, he said and turned to me. Strike one to you, I said. Can I get you a beer? Granger asked. No. I need to have a clear head, I said, then stepped over to the bar, leaving the distance of an arm length between us. Understandable now that I know who you are. I stepped back another foot. Yeah, and who's that? Oh, I don't know your real name. Just that you're wanted as a suspect for a double homicide back in Fort Bragg and the brass did a deal to have the MPs conduct their own inquiries. The police are expecting you being handed over tomorrow. So, whether you've escaped, or you're here on official business. I'm guessing the latter, or you'd be long gone from here. So do the police know that I'm no longer in the Army's custody? Is that why they're splashing my face all over the news? No. That's in connection with the APB Blake's put out on you here. So, does he or anyone else know about Fort Bragg? Not as far as I know, he said. Why no gun? Guessed you'd be back. Seeing as how you had the balls to talk to me last time without a gun. I thought I'd repay the compliment. For the second time since we met, I wasn't about to put him straight that I did have a gun. So this is man to man, not detective to criminal? For now. Okay, I'll give you something. The cop who arrested me. There's a contract on his head. You need to convince Blake to get him into protective custody. Tell him about the hit someone has on him, and he might just sing to cut a deal. And I have to take your word for that? No, I haven't finished. Check the footage again. You can't see it on the camera footage, but from my vantage point on the sidewalk, he was firing in the air and not at the perp's vehicle. You expect us to take the word of a homicide suspect? That wouldn't work in court. Try listening. I haven't finished. When he arrested me, he said I was worth five grand to take me to his paymaster. He wasn't going to take me back to the station. Hearsay. Yeah, but if you remember, he wasn't so pleased when you showed up. His cell phone isn't hearsay, or the one he took from the corpse of one of the MS-13 guys in the vehicle. You can see that on camera footage in slow motion when he slips it into his pocket. It's just after he'd reached into their car and put a bullet into one of them who probably couldn't fire back. He was on his cell phone the whole time guiding them and until Blake arrived and the shootout started. Granger put his fingers to the wound on his neck. I could see his cogs turning. Whoa there, roll back a minute. We didn't show you the footage. How did you get to see it? I tapped my nose. That's on a need-to-know basis. Why would there be a contract on your head with MS-13, and who put it out on you? That's on a need-to-know basis, too. The cop will have the answers. At the end of the day, he's the one responsible for almost getting you killed. Have Blake rerun the footage a frame at a time, then I'm sure you'll have enough to get a warrant to search the cop's house for the cell phones. What about a statement from you? I'll deal with that when I get back to Fort Bragg with the notary. Doubt you'll need it, though, if you break what's-his-name. Connor. That's him. So you're going back to Fort Bragg. Why should I believe that? Because for one thing I'm innocent, and for the other, I'm sad in front of you when there's an APB out on me. Not forgetting, I'm now your snitch. Play ball with me, and I'll give you enough to bring down a smuggling and trafficking racket, so big, they'll be bound to make you detective. I saw the glint in his eye. You must want something in return. Quite a bit, really. First I need some info on Greg Bell, the ex-army buddy I was supposed to be meeting here. He's gone to ground. Greg Bell. That's one of the reasons we have the APB out on you. We were hoping you'd have some answers. How's that? Because he's dead. What? When did this happen? Found his corpse in the rubble of the address you had for him. The guy who used to live there before the city took it over was in prison. His wife left him but says she didn't empty everything from the house. Someone else had reconnected the energy. The guy was pissed at finding the house down after he was released. He'd left his Harley in the basement, so he says. We didn't find it. All we found was her van. She probably didn't take that because it didn't have an engine. I now knew I'd really been suckered. Maybe his wife took the Harley and sold it on. 
the revelation he was dead stunned me. But then Greg's movement from the cell tower showed he'd returned to the area. Never thought it would mean he'd returned to the house. It sounded as though I'd taken him out in the explosion. Have they found out from the autopsy if he died quickly? Single shot to the back of his head. He wouldn't have seen it coming. Holy crap. That's a relief. A relief? Wouldn't have liked him to have suffered, I lied, after thinking he tried to set me up. So when will I hear from you about these so-called big operations? Give me your cell phone number and I'll be in touch. Just one last thing. Do you know why Blake and Agent Adams shared an interest in Muhammad Ali Hassan? All Blake told me was that the CIA had Hassan under protection, mainly in the evenings, and when he was at his home. Apparently, he had his own security at other times. From what I gather, Adams stumbled onto some illegal activity he was into that was outside their jurisdiction. He should have had a meeting with Blake yesterday to discuss it further, but he's gone away on vacation. Anyway, why don't you give me what you have now on these smuggling and trafficking operations? I wasn't about to tell him that I might not give him anything. What I had was my ace in the hole for if I couldn't prove my innocence. I have a few more loose ends to tie up today. Then I'll let you have it all. Granger pulled out a pen from his pocket, wrote his cell phone number on a drink mat, then slid it along the bar. You'd best not be yanking my chain. And you'd best not phone your detective buddies, I said, forming my fingers into a gun, then pointed at him and snickered. Yeah, right, he said. He turned his back to me, picked up his bottle and took a long swig as I worked my way to the exit. Chapter 47 Parked 200 yards from the depot on Atwater, I had a clear view of Moe's office and the entrance. My mind raced in all directions. With Greg dead, that was three of our original team gone. If whoever targeted Handbag's house had succeeded in taking me out, that would be the majority of us gone. The whys and wherefores were driving me crazy. Looking through my binoculars, I zoomed in on a vehicle as it pulled up and parked outside the office. It was the same customs guy who took the brown paper bag from Mo. He wasn't in there more than two minutes when he exited. I zoomed in some more. He was holding a sheet of paper. Starting my engine, I followed at a respectful distance as he backed out and drove away. He turned at the outdoor adventure center on the corner, drove into the parking lot on Orland Street, then parked. Stopping on Atwater, I watched as he went into the store. I drove on and turned at the corner, then into the parking lot and parked in the next space to his vehicle. Climbing out of my seat, I scanned all four compass points. There were no people around. The sheet of paper was on his passenger seat. It was a letter-headed house and distribution with a list of container numbers. At the bottom was a shipping manifest with details of origin that I recognized right away from what I'd photographed at the hangar. The dates of delivery were all for later that day. Breaking into his vehicle to retrieve the list would set the rats in the barn running. It was annoying, but I had to leave it there. I made a note of his license plate and a few of the container numbers, then headed on back to Atwater to continue with surveillance. Time drifted on by. Too much time. All I needed to know was if Mo was in there. I doubted Handbag would turn up after what Gopher had told me about their feud. The transmission crunched as I selected first gear. I drove just past the trucking entrance, then stopped. The security guard was reading a newspaper and drinking coffee when I tapped on his window. Any jobs going that you know of, bud? You're joshing, right? Not really. I'd heard they might be hiring. Is the boss in, Hassan I think someone said? There ain't no jobs, and he's not here. Haven't seen him for a few days. No problem, I said, relieved I'd saved precious time. At the same time, it had been worth the wait for what I'd seen typed on the letterhead. But now it was time to gather my thoughts. I needed to try and put two and two together and come up with the right answers. The drive back to Maria's apartment was all a blur. It was as if I'd navigated there on autopilot, I thought, as I walked along the stairwell, then trotted up the stairway. The only thing that had caught my attention when I'd arrived was the two dealers sat in the car at the entrance. The landline rang as I entered the apartment. Snatching the handset, I listened to wait for who was at the other end. Ted, Maria said. Yeah, it's me. Thank goodness. I've called four times. 
Just needed to make sure you'd be there to look after Roberto at five. I glanced at my watch. It was just gone four. Yeah, I'll be here, don't worry. Good. I've bought a pork roast and some more of that wine, seeing as it's our last night. Great, see you at five, I said, and closed the call. It was time to gather everything together. Make sense of what had happened. Ideally, I'd have wanted to set off back to Fort Bragg. I had enough to bargain with to cut a deal with the DA and security services for if they intended to charge me. It was the guilt thing. That feeling that I had a debt of honor to Maria not to go until I had to. It was more than that, but I was struggling to admit what was on my mind. All I knew was that I couldn't leave right away. The next hour, I kept my mind occupied by downloading the photos from my cell to Maria's computer, then onto a pen drive. I wrote out a list of all the people I'd been involved with in Detroit, and connected them in a sort of tree with Mo at the top. Then I wrote a separate list of people with no apparent connection. At the bottom of the list I wrote down the cryptic words I'd seen at Craig's apartment. All fell in. Oil rags to riches, barter kings. The more I stared at the words, the less wiser I was to what they meant. Barter Kings was self-explanatory from the cable program of the same name. Oil rags was similar to the term we used for terrorists, but that was about it if it was meant to be a clue. All felon meant nothing other than it suggested a wise guy. The only common connection with Detroit to our team back at Fort Bragg on the list was Greg, but now he was dead, so that avenue was closed. Hustler's phone buzzed on the table. Handbag had sent another message. You have two hours to get the damned statue back to me, or else. It wasn't worth a reply. He was clearly running out of time to put a deadline for its return. I'm back, Maria called out, as I heard the front door open. Along the hallway, I saw Roberto run into his bedroom. Shortly after, I heard the sound of the nursery rhyme singing out the alphabet from his light fitting. Roberto sang along to the tune. Anna was still at the exit when Maria walked into the room. She dumped the groceries on the breakfast bar. Be an angel and put these away for me, will you? Sure. Got to dash. Back in thirty minutes. Here, I said, then handed her the car key. Say hi to your mom for me. Will do. She hurried outside. I kicked my ruck under the table and shuddered, thankful that she hadn't seen I had it out with Roberto around. I stuffed the pen drive, Hustler's phone and the list in a side pocket. No sooner had she closed the door than Roberto ran into the living room. He did two laps, then he slapped a Hulk superhero comic on the table. Read it, he said. Sure, soldier. Come on. Picked him up. Carried him to the sofa and started to read to him. He lost interest halfway through. Airplanes, he said. He hopped off of my knee and tugged at both my hands. Endless rounds of airplane throws did nothing to slake his enthusiasm. Why don't I set your Spider-Man game on the TV, I said, now fully understanding why Maria pandered to his obsession. He stood in front of me, pouting his lips. Glancing at my watch, she'd been gone forty minutes. Don't want, he said. Want more airplane rides. Wait, I think your mom's here. Stepping over to the window, it wasn't Maria's car I'd heard that squealed to a halt. If I wasn't mistaken, it was the dealer's car. Only now there were more of them. Four of them jumped out, leaving their doors open. All had handguns as they ran in the direction of the apartment entrance. I was at the front door right away. Upended the coach stand to jam the door, then ran back to the room and opened the window. Just as I'd slipped a ruck strap over my shoulder, I heard them kicking at the door. I turned the sofa over. Ripped off the lining and grabbed the rope then tossed it through the open window. Listen, we're gonna play Spider-Man. Hold on tight, I said, with only time to put on one leather glove. With Roberto clinging to my front, his arms wrapped tightly around my neck, we rappelled down to the ground. You're Spider-Man? Roberto said, then giggled. Like it was a game. Poor kid didn't understand the danger as I tossed first him, and then the ruck in the back of the dealer's car. Idiots had left the engine running. We sped away and onto Woodward. The thought struck me that Maria would arrive back at the apartment at any time soon. Where does your grand live? I asked Roberto, as I pulled over and stopped a respectful distance from the apartment. 
Roberto shrugged his shoulders. Frantically, I teased out my cell phone and SIM card, fumbling to get open the tray to get in the phone. Finally, I succeeded and made the call. The call rang, then went to voicemail. Maria, if you get this call, don't go home. Phone me back. Turning to look at Roberto, he still didn't look as though he understood the danger. Again? No, you need to concentrate. Which way to your grands? Roberto pushed back in his seat and started to sing the alphabet nursery rhyme. It wasn't his fault, bless him, but frustration boiled inside. Chapter 48 The Seventh and Last Night I couldn't believe the crap I'd brought down on the family. Just how they'd found me, I couldn't work it out. I dragged my ruck over to the front and retrieved my Glock. That was as far as I got. There was no way I could go back there with the kid in the car. Banging my fists on the steering wheel, I stared ahead. Parked around 100 yards along Woodward, I noticed a car with its headlights on under a street light. The driver's door was open. It looked as though it was abandoned in a hurry. My heart sank. I was sure it was a similar make to Maria's car. Foot down, tires screeching, I raced toward the car. There was no mistaking it was her car. It was parked next to a field. It wasn't as if she was loading up outside her mom's to get ready to set off back. Don't open your door. Wait here, I said, and snatching my door open, I hurried over to her car. The keys were in the ignition. Her purse was on the passenger seat. Maria, I called out, and peered over the bushes into the field. I ran back to the car, took a hold of her purse. Her cell phone was in there. I pulled it out, entered her contacts and phoned her mom's number. It's Ted. I'm staying at Maria's. Is she there? I said, and pulled out her key from the ignition, then locked the door. She screamed at me down the connection. They've taken her? What? Who has? Kidnapped. There, there was a note through my door. What's your address? I'll get there right away. Phone the police. I can't. It says she'll. The rest of what she had to say stuck in her throat and she started to wail. Pull yourself together. Where do you live? I have Roberto with me. She stuttered out the address. From her directions it was only two turnings to the left. Racing to her mom's, I decided that it had to be handbags doing. Anna charged out of the door as I hurried down the driveway. Roberto ran through the front door. Anna pounded my chest with her fists. This is your fault, she screeched at me, tears streaming down her cheeks. There wasn't time for a reply. I picked her up bodily and carried her into the house. Have Anna here see to Roberto so we can talk. Anna sent daggers my way through tear-stained eyes. Grand gave her a look. There was no need for her grand to say anything. She took a hold of Roberto's hand and walked out of the room. What's this about a note? Her mom thrust the note at me. To the lodger. We've kidnapped Maria. You have what we want. Let's exchange. Be in touch. Phone the police and she dies. What does it mean, you have what we want? Her mom asked. It means that I accidentally came by something that belongs to them. I'll make the exchange, don't worry. I won't let anything happen to her. Who are them? I think I know who it is. You have to trust me. I'll not wait for them to make contact. Trust you. None of this would have happened if she turned you in like I told her, she said, and collapsed onto an armchair, then held her head in her hands. It was all too much emotion for me. Emotion wouldn't get her back. I picked up a pen from the table and scribbled down my cell phone number and Granger's name and number, then I glanced out of the window and wrote down the license plate number of the car I was driving. Phone me on that number or Maria's cell if they make contact before I contact them to get her back. I'll phone you as soon as she's safe. If I don't make it back or call you and say one hour, phone Granger. He's a cop. Give him the license number I've written down and tell him I've parked it down the road from here and left a note for him in there. Tell him there's a connection with the vehicle. You can trust him. Not waiting for a reply, I set off through the front door. I'd get them into this mess. Doubt surfaced. 
I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do by unwinding the situation on my own. Driving toward Maria's car, I couldn't help but wonder if I wouldn't be better calling the police. But then with an APB out on me, I had to think what good would I be locked up in a slammer? Besides, how many more police did Handbag have in his pocket? I doubted Connor would be the only one on his payroll. Arriving at Maria's car, I swapped cars after leaving a note for Granger. Took out Hustler's phone. Typed a message and pressed send. Okay, scumbag. I have what you want. You have what I want. Let's exchange. It didn't take long for him to reply. Nice move back at the apartment, dick brain. Told you he had a fix on you. You're lucky she's still alive. Let's exchange. No cops. I guessed he was just as lucky that she was alive, and that I hadn't sold the artifact, but it wasn't worth debating as to who was the luckiest. No cops. Just you and me, where and when, I typed, then pressed send. He returned a message. Now, but I need to think. I'll let you know. While he was chewing it over, I set off toward Gopher's house. No way I wanted it to be his time and place for the exchange. I didn't know what sort of welcome I'd get, but I needed local info. He was in his garage with the door open, and working on his indie as I pulled over. What do you want this time? I need your help. What kind of help? You know the area. Where would I find a long stretch of quiet road? One where you could see headlights from a distance. No houses. No one walking their dog. Gopher stroked his chin. There's the ton up road. Just about wide enough for two cars, but only one in some places. We race the bikes over there. Just feels either side. No edges, no corners, so you can see for miles. Why? You don't need to know. Where is it? Gopher gave me the directions. He chewed on his bottom lip. Inspected his boots. Then lifted his vision and looked me right in the eyes. Seeing your mug shot on the TV. What is it you're up to? Nothing you need to know. It's a sort of debt of honor. The cops have got me all wrong. Cops, he said, and honked Flem, then spat it out on the driveway. Don't talk to me about cops. Sons of bitches. One more thing. You said you could magic up anything. Like what? Like a level 3 army vest. I have the plates. It's the vest I need. What's it worth? Whatever it costs to replace and something for your trouble. He did that stroking his chin thing again. Cash? Yeah, cash. Okay. I'll lock up. You wait outside when we get there. On the drive over, Hustler's phone buzzed. I pulled up the message from Handbag. One hour. The old Packard Motor Plant on Grand Boulevard. We're here, Gopher said, and slapped the dash. Pull over. Gopher eased off of his seat and walked down a driveway. If the Packard Motor Plant was anything like the Fisher Body Plant, there was no way I'd risk a meeting there to make an exchange. Too many nooks and crannies inside for him to ambush me. I checked what I had left in my money belt having a good idea of the retail price for the vest. I pulled out what I thought it was worth. Gopher returned and leaned through the window. Eight hundred dollars. I waved my wad at him. Come on. Ask him to do better. He can buy one off of eBay for four hundred. Anyways, that's all I have. Six hundred. That's one each for your trouble. Gopher took the wad. We'll see. Gopher wasn't away more than a minute, when he strutted back down the driveway with an ear-to-ear -ear smirk, and carrying the vest. I pressed send on a message I typed out on Hustler's cell phone as he took a seat. It was time to prepare for the exchange, but on my terms. My choice of location. Chapter 49 Gopher climbed out of my car back at his house. I rolled down the window. Thanks. He leaned in through the window. I wished he hadn't, with a smell akin to dog breath bathing me as he spoke. Listen. I know you're a brother vet and all. I was thinking. You're obviously up to your neck in some serious crap. Are you sure that's all I can help with? Do you need backup? No thanks. This is something I have to take care of myself. 
Unless... Unless what? Look, there could be a family with two young kids in trouble if I haven't mind girls belly up. Their mother's a vet. She was a nurse. Patched up Navy SEALs after combat. Could I trust you to watch their house from a distance until I get back? Maybe two hours. Do you have a weapon? Do birds fly? Of course I have a freaking weapon. Look, don't get involved at the house. I know it'll go against your better judgment, but phone the police if anything looks amiss. You've got it bro, write down your cell number and the address. I'll call you if I see anything suspicious. The phone buzzed as I set off. I picked up the message. Okay. Got it. No cops, or I'll put one in her skull, it read. It was pretty obvious that getting the statue back was worth more to him than getting revenge. Even more obvious that he wouldn't harm her as long as he got what he wanted. The problem was if he would make her a target after the event that worried me. I'd arrived a good thirty minutes before the time I'd given him. It was enough time to have reconnoitered the area, and to prepare for our exchange. I sent her mom a message that all was going well and to give me another thirty minutes in case she got jumpy and phoned Ranger. With my Glock on the passenger seat, and Betsy on my lap, I was as ready as I could be. It was dark with no lighting, but the clear sky and a full moon gave me good visibility. Gopher had been right. I saw a car approaching a distance away. I flashed my headlights when his car was around 150 yards from my position. He slowed then stopped a good 50 yards away. Handbag turned off his headlights, then flashed them to acknowledge my signal. Switching on my vanity light, he followed suit, then we both turned them off. It wasn't perfect. Neither of us could have someone hidden on the back seat as backup. It was all I could think to tell him we needed to do at the time. Climbing out of the car, I held up the box. I set it on the grass with deliberate slow movements, then stepped back to my car. When I glanced over at him, he was at his trunk. Only it wasn't handbag, unless he'd shorn his locks. The coward had sent one of his gang. That wasn't part of my plan. There was no mistaking that whoever it was, he was carrying a bundle the size of a body, wrapped up in a white cloth. He set down the bundle. There was movement inside the cloth as he got back into his car. We both flashed our headlights, leaving them on full, and set off toward each other. With one hand on the steering wheel, and one on Betsy, with a finger stroking the trigger, I was as prepared as I could be. I'd worked out scenarios of what could go wrong. It would be down to who could pull the trigger first and with the most accuracy. Our heads turned as if on pivots and our eyes locked as we passed by. I accelerated, then jammed on the brake pedal as I drew up alongside the bundle. There wasn't time to unravel the duct tape. Picking up Maria bodily, I tossed her onto the back seat, slammed the door closed, then jumped onto my seat and sped away. With my eyes flicking between the rear view and the road ahead, I could see the other guy had the same idea as the distance increased between us at a pace. The marker I'd set down loomed large. I turned off my lights. I'll have you out of there in no time, Maria. Hang on, it'll get bumpy, I said, and swung the steering wheel to turn onto a tractor path. I reached over to the passenger seat and put the transmitter on safety. If it had been handbag, I'd have blown into kingdom come. The kingdom of hell. He wouldn't have been able to exact revenge on Maria or me from there. Now he was a loose end I had to tie up before I went back to base. They must have gagged her. All I could hear was muffled cries as we bounced along the track until we came to a barn. I pulled around back and parked, then leapt from the car and opened up the back door. Stop kicking. You're safe now. Pulling out my penknife, I cut away at the duct tape, then pulled down the cloth from over her head. You! I backed out of the doorway, paced around, and cussed. I'd been suckered. Leaning back inside, I pulled the duct tape from around her mouth. Big mistake. Hustler greeted me with a torrent of abuse. Shut your foul mouth. Where's the woman they kidnapped? I don't know nothing about no kidnap. Where's Handbag? Is he at the hangar? Who the hell knows? I sure as crap don't. You'd better answer me and start being civil, or I'll put the duct tape back and throw you in the river. Now where is he? If I tells you, will you take me to Crackalandia? I needs a fix. Yeah, I'll take you. Now where is he? 
The hangar. And what about the woman he kidnapped earlier tonight? Hell, I knows nothing about no woman. Been there all the time alone locked in a room. Next thing I knows, he got your message. He reckons you must be my pimp to be worth something to you. No way I's gonna put him right. I just want it out of there. Now get this damn tape off of me. Not after the stunt you pulled last time. I'll unfasten you when we get there. Which hangar were you locked in? The one with some choppers. Back in the driver's seat, I set off for Crackalandia. What I should have done was retaped her mouth. She did nothing but cuss at me all the way there. I stopped just short of the viaduct. Slung my arm over the seat. How many men does he have at the hangar? Gotta be worth a twenty. I don't have any money, but I've got this, I said, reaching over for my glock. I pointed it at her temple. Oh, man, no needs to be nasty. How the hell do I know? Maybe ten, or so. Ten or so probably armed gang members would be too long on the odds to tackle alone, I thought, as I worked my way to the back door, then pulled her out and cut her loose. She was shaking from head to toe, but at least she was alive. Here, I said, and tossed Hustler a twenty. It landed three feet away from her, leaving her scrambling on all fours for her fixed money. Handbag and me had a big problem. Neither of us had gotten what we wanted. It would call for drastic action if I was to save Maria once he found out I'd swapped the statue for a garden gnome and put an explosive charge inside the box. It would be a big risk to go after him alone. I retrieved my satellite phone, typed a detailed message to Lone Wolf and pressed send, then pushed my back into the seat to await his reply. A message came back. No way. Can't have use of a private army. Stand down. Do not get involved. We'll arrange an extraction at six in the morning. Coordinates to follow. I rolled the satellite phone over my shoulder and picked up my cell phone, scrolled through my contacts and pressed the button to call Granger. Who is it? He said. Your army, buddy. We met at the Maple Bar earlier. I need to meet up with you urgently. Run something by you right away. You've got some nerve. What is it you want? Make it quick. My cell phone battery is dying, he said. Chapter 50 I sent another message to Maria's mom, telling her to hold off contacting Granger as I'd contacted him myself, and that we'd likely be another hour in getting her released. She replied with a thumbs-up emoji. I looked on from my position at seeing headlights. What I hoped was Granger's vehicle came into view along the street. It was definitely him, I decided when the vehicle parked exactly where I had asked him to pull over. Granger climbed out of his seat, stretched his legs, scanned the area. He wasn't the only one scanning the area. From the top level of a disused building, I scoped the surrounding area. With the roads clear for some distance, I pressed the call button on Hustler's cell phone. Granger turned around in a 360, then walked over to the wall. He reached out and picked up my cell phone from the hole in the wall. Did you get Blake to check out the footage? I asked. Yeah. Blake got the warrant. He found the MS-13 guy's cell phone, but not Connor's own cell phone. Blake sent for his phone records. There's an arrest warrant out for him. He's gone to ground. So we're buddies now, right? I'll reserve judgment on that. What's this all about? You mentioned you wanted help with a kidnap that had gone down. It's about my lady friend being kidnapped. They'll kill her if I officially call in the cops. Leroy Gibson has her. We need to mount a rescue. Make you a hero. Maybe get you that detective's badge, I said and heard him scoff. More likely discharged in disgrace. So let's get this right. You want me to team up with you? A homicide suspect on the run. Go against one of the most ruthless gangs in Detroit. I don't think so. Granger looked around, seeing if he could get a fix on where I was at. What if I could get more men? What? More criminals? I'd suggest a SWAT team in the FBI for a kidnapping. You're out of your depth. Yeah, and what they gonna do? Send in a negotiator. Call them on a megaphone and announce their arrival. Maybe they'll have a tunnel and they can escape. What if they put a bullet in the back of her head before they leave? 
No thanks. We need to surprise them. Take the fight to them. Catch them with their pants down. Of course, if you've got no balls for this, I'll understand. I mean, let's face it, you transferred out of the Marines to a desk job in CID. And what are you doing now? Driving around in a Mickey Mouse cop car for less money than before the bankruptcy. Give me a break, I said, and hope that would motivate him. Don't be a smartass. I've seen plenty of action in Iraq. That was then. This is a different time and place. There's been a lot of water pissed over the bridge since then. Well, what's it to be? Where are you getting these men from? How do I know they'll be up to the task? He was warming to the idea. Granger just needed a push. I'll be there in a minute. Take you to see them. Did you bring your kid like I asked? It's in the trunk. Wait there. I gave the area a scan one last time to make sure he didn't have the cavalry on the way. Climbing out of the window, I made my way down the fire escape on the far side of the building. Whoa there, he said, as I approached. I'm not armed. I pulled the mag out of Betsy. Neither am I now. You've really got to start trusting me, I said. Where are you parked? Granger asked. Behind the outdoor center on Atwater. My vehicle or yours? We'll take yours. I've only just bought mine. Don't want it getting damaged if bullets start flying. Just one thing. You're not wearing a wire, are you? He shook his head. Come on, less of the dramatics. Let's meet these buddies of yours. It was only a short drive to the outdoor center. We exchanged cars. Threw his kid in the trunk. Where are we going? You'll see. Listen. Let's say I agree to this. And I ain't saying I will until I've met these guys, and I know exactly what it is you want to do and where. Just so you know, I'll have to phone Blake. He's arranging for SWAT as backup after you mentioned a kidnap when you first phoned. I slammed on the brake pedal. What? You told him? Calm down. I know him, you don't. That's not the freaking point. The letter said no cops. So... I'm not a cop in your eyes, he said. Cops can moonlight as security, right? That's all you're doing, acting as security. Riding shotgun. Your pay's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The trafficking, remember, I said. It doesn't work like that. It'll be a crime scene when we've finished. It'll need to be made official. I'm assuming you're just going to make the exchange you talked about and we'll be watching his backup. Something like that. I said, and drove on, thankful I hadn't told him where I thought they were holding Maria. I was seething inside that he'd told Blake. He must have seen the expression on my face. Listen, it's not a big deal. Your guys can melt away when Blake and the SWAT team arrive. Hustler's cell phone buzzed. I teased it from my vest pocket. Pulled up the message. You scum piece of dog dirt, I want that statue. You're toast. What was that? Granger asked. Just a dissatisfied customer. We arrived just short of our destination, and I parked. We'll walk from here. Granger climbed out of the car. I typed a message. Don't do anything stupid. We can still exchange. I'll make new arrangements in, say, two hours. Turning off phone. Low battery. Hopefully, I just bought us some more time. I pressed send, then switched off the power. Give me your phone. I'll let you make the call as soon as she's safe, or it goes belly up, I said, as I joined Granger. No, no point. My phone's phone is dead. Left my charger in my car. We'd better not be going where I think you want us to go. Like I said, as long as you're not carrying a wire, you'll be sound. We walked past the fence at an industrial building. Granger stopped. Tell me these are not your buddies? They're not my buddies. Now grow a pair. You'll be fine. It was busier at night time. I reckon there were a good fifty bikes outside the Stingray Club. We strolled over to the entrance. I took a deep breath, then pushed open the door. It didn't look like the clientele was pleased to see me return. Either that, or they wondered what the hell someone was doing in the doorway with a full combat vest and a Glock in their hand. The music stopped along with the banter. 
To the scraping of chair legs, everyone stood. Through the throng, I recognized the stars and striped bandana working its way through the crowd. You've got some nerve, the general said. Funny, that's exactly what my friend here said. Stepping to one side, I swept an open palm in Granger's direction. Granger! What the hell are you doing here? I keep asking myself that same question, Granger said. It's not official business, I know that much. Maybe Joyce here can explain, cause I sure as hell don't know. Chapter 51 The general roared with laughter. The sycophants that they were all joined in, but I couldn't see the joke. Joyce! That's a girl's name. What are you doing dressed up as G.I. Joe? Come to take us all on? Boo-hoo, we're all pissing our pants, he said, while holding up his arms and waving his fingers as if playing an imaginary keyboard. I need your help, I said, digging a hand in my pocket and pulling out his bullets, then dropped them on the table near the door. Go for as your gun. I know he had it. He returned it earlier, he said, and patted his waistband. At least we know you're not a thief. Just a vandal that owes us for some scratches. Yeah, well I can't say I'm sorry. It was my only way to get out of here. You're probably right about that. So what's this help you need? We don't help no cops. Granger here is off duty. He's laying his job on the line to help a fellow vet. And why should we help you? It's not me that needs help. I'm not a vet yet. Still active. It's a friend of mine that's been kidnapped. What's this guy done to get kidnapped? It's not a guy, it's a she. The general shook his head. Yeah, well I don't count women as vets. You don't see them on the front line, only as cot blankets. Yet more laughter from his crowd of hangers-on. You miserable ass. Where do you get off? She's more courage than a lot of you. Come on, Granger, let's leave these cowards to their beer. Freaking rednecks. Who the hell are you calling cowards? What's so special about this woman? I'll tell you what's special. She saved more Navy SEALs' lives than all of you put together. She was a trauma nurse in the services. Poor woman has two kids at home waiting for her. Navy SEALs! There was a rumble around the room. Plenty of exchanged glances. The general showed me his palms. Okay, I'll give you that one. So, what's she done to get kidnapped and who's holding her? It was my fault. I crossed paths with Handbag. I have something of his he once returned in exchange. We tried it once, but I guess we both tried to dupe one another, I said. You can forget it if it involves Narcos. No, it's an artifact stolen from Syria. Long story, but I came by the statue by accident. That's your problem then. Simple, do the swap. It's not that simple. He's somehow involved in smuggling artifacts from Syria. Probably from ISIS. The way I see it, he's helping to fund them by bringing them over and selling them on the black market. How do we know you're telling the truth? If you come out to my car, I'll show you the statue. Well, not a statue exactly, more of a figurine. No thanks, not yet. Listen, wait outside. We need to discuss it. Take a vote. There's no love lost between me and Handbag. Especially after his clown disrespected the club the other day. But it's down to the members. Granger stepped forward and said, Before you do that, let's have a quiet word in private. Granger hustled the general to one side. Whispered in his ear. The general's cheeks flushed. While you're out there, get this statue thingy, the general said. We backed out into the lot, then headed back to the car. You know these guys are mean sons of bitches. They wouldn't think twice about slitting your throat. They know all about death. Some real psychos in there, Granger said. Yeah, maybe that's what we need. Fight fire with fire as far as handbags concerned. Over at the car, I leaned inside and pulled the artifact from under the seat. Is that it? It's a piece of junk. A million dollar piece of junk if you don't mind. Imagine what a container full would be worth. Anyway, what was all that about with the general? You mean Taffy, the cook? What's that mean? Locked him up in a rock. He was the base cook. 
bastard was watering down the stews until it was like dishing out soup, then selling the meat to the locals. A freaking cook? Yeah. He lost his eye in the stockade when he got in a fight. All that I'd hoped for had been shattered. There I was thinking these were all hardened ex-army with combat experience. So what did you say? Just reminded him, that's all. I'm guessing that's not the line he strung them all along with for him to be in charge. You might just push the vote your way for me to keep quiet. I was reminded of Gopher's tales. Maybe they were all a bunch of misfits living in a dream world. The clubhouse door opened. One of the bikers hurried out, climbed on his bike, and roared out of the lot. I didn't like it that one of them had left. For all I knew, he could be going to warn Handbag. Are you sure you don't want me to make the call and leave it to the experts, said Granger. I can't. Not with someone like Handbag. Not after what the note said. Granger stroked his chin. How do you think he found you in this Maria? he asked. Don't have a clue. Chance maybe. I thought you could be involved at first, I said. How come? I shook my head. Doesn't matter. I'll tell you when this is all over. The clubhouse door opened. The general filled the frame, silhouetted with the light behind him. He signaled us over to the club. I walked over and showed him the artifact. Don't look like anything but junk to me. Anyway, rest easy, we're on board. What's the plan? Where did that guy go? For some comms. We'll get our kit later. First the plan. He turned to the bartender. Jack, close the bar, don't want anyone drunk. We walked over to a central table. Tables, really. They'd pushed three together. I pulled my map from a vest pocket. Spread it out on the tables. Anyone got a marker? The bartender tossed a red felt marker over to me. That's where they're holding her, I said, and circled the hangers. The old flying school, the general said. That's the one. There are woods around back, but it's open fields to the road where there are bushes. They also have a control tower, but I'm not sure if it's manned with a lookout. I need a perimeter set up tighter than a duck's ass. Once that's done, I need two of you to take the tower. I'll take the tower with Jim. We've done crap like that together before when we worked our way through Fallujah. The guy looked to be in his fifties. Hands like shovels. Biceps like they were pumped up with air until they were fit to burst. Good. I turned to the general. What sort of kit do you have? Rifles, scopes, and the like? Ain't saying in front of Granger. Trust me when I say that we have all that's required. Anyways, what then? Granger and me will go in first. Then we'll wait in the woods until you confirm the perimeter is sealed. I think she's locked up in the second hangar next to the control tower. I scouted it last night. All the action seems to be in the first hangar. I'll try and get in and get her out. Granger can cover me at the rear window while I enter. You said you had comms. The general was quick to reply. He'll be back shortly. We'll do two clicks over the radio to confirm we're set up, he replied. Good. I don't want chatter. Only the clicks to confirm that you're in position. They could have a scanner, so I'll keep any orders short and sweet. Listen for instructions, I said. What are the rules of engagement? asked the general. Granger butted in. Self-defense. Only fire if fired on. The exception to that would be to lay down covering fire over their heads as a distraction if ordered, unless they fire first. As soon as she's out, leave and rendezvous back here. How many are in there? the general asked. I've been told they're around ten or so. Are you sure you're up for this? I asked him. Piece of cake. We have war games on the weekends. Trust us, we're battle ready. We can muster maybe thirty of us. The rest of them here are either disabled or they've had too much to drink, he said. You good with that? I said, and glanced at Granger, aiming the question at him. Sort of. What about the racket thirty bikes are going to make? Granger said, and stroked his chin. Simple, said the general. He stabbed a finger at areas left and right of the hangars. We'll split into two groups. Park there. Take some passengers with us to guard the bikes. 
Then we'll hump it to our position. All heads turned to face the door at the sound of a bike pulling up outside. The door opened. Here you are. That's the comm sorted, the guy said, as he stepped inside and placed a large backpack on the table. All fully charged and tested. That's it then. I'll set off with Granger now. We'll set up a hide in the woods and wait for you. We each scooped up a set of comms and headed out the door. No sooner had we reached the car than it was like a roll of thunder as bikes rolled out of the lot. Cook or not, he and his bunch were all we had. Since when did you decide to volunteer me to come with you? I thought I was meant to guard a position with the rest of them, said Granger. Yeah, and how would you know if I got her out or not so you could phone Blake? Good point. But why is it I get the feeling I've been hoodwinked? I couldn't help but grin at him. Think of it this way, I'd rather you watched my back than a freaking cook, I said. Okay, don't lay it on. I'm with you. So is the place stuffed with artifacts, he asked. No, drugs. Mostly hidden in chassis. There are stacks of manifests in the office listing shipments for a trail back to the source. They're probably shipping stolen cars from Europe and forging the docks as well. You'll see when we get there and this is over. The artifacts are another story. For now we'll concentrate on Handbag's operation at the flying school and rescuing her. All I ask is that you let me get away and take Maria home to her mom's before you have to phone Blake. I pulled over at a 7-Eleven store. Wait here, won't be two minutes, I said. I returned and threw the plastic bag with my purchase on the back seat. Granger tugged at my sleeve. You were saying before, this Maria woman. That'll be the woman whose kid dialed 911. My mind raced. I took one hand off of the steering wheel and rested it on the butt of my gun. Don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. I know you were hiding. Couldn't miss that sweatshirt on the coat stand. I only called the apartment the next day to make sure my mind wasn't running away with itself. When I phoned, you didn't exactly have a local accent. Did you tell Blake? I asked him. No, he replied. Then why keep it a secret? I'm wondering that. Maybe it was that cheesy grin you gave me in the interview room. Seriously. I sort of guessed you were on official duty. All of a sudden, I felt I was the one being hoodwinked. How else would Handbag know where to find me and Maria? Chapter 52 Granger guessing that I was on official duty didn't cut it in my eyes. That shouldn't have stopped him calling Blake once he suspected I was living at Maria's. We pulled over at the designated area where half the contingent of the bikers would park. My mind wandered. If he'd arrested me for what they suspected me of, it could have put him one step closer to his detective badge. Facing bullets from the front I could handle. Worrying about a bullet in the head from behind was more problematic. What's on your mind? he asked. He must have seen from my expression that my cogs were in overdrive. What I was thinking was that I should neutralize him, then go it alone to be on the safe side. Those weren't the sentiments that came out of my mouth. So you're saying I owe my freedom to you? Why is that? Sort of. I was going to turn you in. Made those inquiries first for some background, but it took a while for them to get back to me. That's when I discovered you were wanted back in Fort Bragg. So I asked myself, how come he was arrested as a murder suspect, then they handed him over to Sockham for them to keep him in protective custody for a week? I then had to work out that if that was the case, how come you were here? You'd either escaped, or you were ordered to come here. I know both sides of the law from inside and outside the army. The homicides took place outside the base, so that put it firmly in civilian territory. But regardless of that, any service personnel, CIA, army, navy, whatever, comes under civilian law and jurisdiction as a priority, unless it's strictly services business for discipline or court-martial. No self-respecting detective would have handed you over. I wasn't about to point out that the national security angle could be a trump card. So why did that stop you turning me in? If you'd escaped, it wouldn't have been kept a secret, that's why. You had to be on official business. I knew where you were. Slept on it and decided that I had to turn you in. Then you turned up at the bar those two times. That changed everything. He'd sounded plausible, but could have been lying. 
It was the sort of thing I'd have concocted if I knew how the law stood. The first of the bikes arrived. I looked at the dash clock. Wasn't expecting them arriving so soon. He pulled up alongside, tapped on my window, so I pressed the control to wind it down. Gopher! What are you doing here? He took off his helmet. Keep your shirt on, man. Everything is fine. I got a call from the clubhouse. I've had one of the disabled guys watch the house. Didn't want to miss the action. Chance of a lifetime. I sighed, but then him turning up handed me a plan. What equipment have you got? Full combat gear, a sidearm, an AR-15, and comms, he said, as he climbed off of his bike, then unloaded his rub to the grass. Good, you can come with us. Get changed quickly. Granger tugged on my sleeve. You sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. I'd prefer four of us as a team, but three is better than two. We climbed out of our seats, opened up the trunk, then retrieved what kit and weapons we would need. Ready for inspection, sir, said Gopher, then saluted, his features displaying a stupid grin. Where the hell did you get the grenades? Gopher tapped his nose. While Granger was suiting up, I pulled Gopher to one side. Gave him his instructions out of earshot of Granger. Another bike appeared. It was Taffy, the general. Where are the rest of them? I asked him. En route, he replied. Seeing as you're here, why don't you come with us? Gopher can take the left flank, you can take the right, and I'll have Granger cover our rear for when I go in. Sounds like a plan, let's rock and roll. The general was already in full combat gear, and wearing a Kevlar helmet over his bandana. How's that gonna work when he's only got one eye? Granger said. The general huffed. Set up a target at 100 yards and I'll beat you any day, whatever the weather, he replied, as he assembled his scoped rifle. He'll be fine, I said, then opened the back door of my vehicle. Leaned inside. Retrieved the plastic bag. I cut my purchase into four, then cut up the plastic bag to wrap up the portions. Here, catch, I said, and tossed each one a chunk. What's that? Gopher asked. I forgot to mention, there could be an Alsatian dog on the prowl with a guard. If he lets it loose and it spots you, throw it a piece of meat. Don't shoot it if it attacks, or you'll give your position away. I'll leave it to you how you defend yourself. They all exchanged glances, but said nothing. Just one thing before we go, are all your phones switched off? I asked. Yeah, they replied in unison. Can I see your phone? I asked Granger. The battery is dead, remember? All the same, let's have a look. Don't want calls sending out too early, or one ringing and giving away our position. What? You don't trust me? I held out my hand. Granger dug deep into his pocket, then tossed me his phone. Okay. Just being cautious, I said, then tossed it back to him. Let's see everyone's phone, mine included. We took out our phones. Hopefully. I thought seeing them all switched off would satisfy Granger that it wasn't a question of trust. I still thought he might not be on the level. Okay, we're all good. Let's go. At least I had Gopher to keep an eye on him. Didn't think I could trust the general with my thoughts. Not when I considered their history. He could have decided to stick a knife in Granger's back. End of problem for him. We followed the hedgerow to the woods, then spread out in formation until we reached the tree line. I signaled for them to take up their positions. There was a light from the back window of the first hangar, but nothing in the second hangar. If it was the second hangar where they were holding Maria, I couldn't imagine the terror she must have felt at being kept in the dark. I scanned the tower with my scope. There was no heat signal to show anyone was there. What surprised me were the twelve or so cars in the parking lot. They were all giving off heat signatures, except for the Mustang, so they must have arrived recently. Apart from Handbag's car and the old Chevy, they were all modern SUVs. All I could do was to hunker down and wait for everyone to confirm their positions. I lifted an earphone, pushed the listening device into my ear, then switched on the receiver for the bug I'd planted. It was nothing but static, so I turned down the volume to a low buzz. The clicks from the bikers started to come over the earphones. Then I heard two-tone clicks as the signal that one of the teams was in position. 
A few minutes later there was a second burst of clicks from the other team. That was everyone in position. My attention turned to the tree line to our left. I picked up the images of two of ours working their way to the tower. My heart sank when I saw the Alsatian with the guard. He opened the door at the bottom of the control tower, then closed it behind them. Considering that dogs have sensitive hearing it was too late to call them while the sound could give them away. I watched the bikers open the door to the tower, then disappear inside. I dropped the scope, and covered my eyes with my hands, then shook my head. The next thing I expected was gunfire and all hell breaking loose. Chapter 53 30 seconds would have been enough time for Mayhem to break the silence. Lifting my head, I picked up Betsy and trained my sight on the tower. Shadows appeared, moving about through the windows at the top of the control tower. It was as quick a takedown as I'd seen. Those guys were good. Clinical even. Seeing them had confirmed we now held the high ground from the tower. We had the area sealed. A twig broke behind me. I rolled over. Took aim. It's me. Who the hell's me? I said, but I'd recognized the voice. The general was lucky. Taffy, he said. I told you to cover the right flank. Why didn't you go in alone? Have you seen the parking lot? Yeah, I've seen, I said. Looks as though there's more than ten in there, he replied. That's not where I'm going. I'm taking the second hangar. Why don't we pin them down in the first hangar then, while you get her out, he asked me. Because she might not be in there. She could be in the first hangar. What then, I said and rolled my eyes. Oh, yeah, he said, then spat on the ground. I wasn't used to this. Each member of our team always stuck to the plan. You could guarantee that. Our lives depended on each other. No deviation unless the situation dictated. Even eventualities were planned for. Lone Wolf drilled that into us. The wise one we called him. He could pick out scenarios we'd never have dreamed of. Then he drilled us hard to neutralize the situation. Craig idolized him. Said the sun shone out of his ass so bright, his farts could kill, and never mind his prowess with a combat knife. There hadn't been time to go into detail at the club. No blueprints. No mock-up of the hangars at the horror factory to practice on the extraction of a hostage. I just expected everyone to stay on station as ordered. Look, while you're here, I'm going in now. Come with me and cover the gap between the hangars just in case any of them leaves. Do not fire if you see someone. Click your tongue twice over the comms to warn me if anyone approaches. If I get her out, back off from your position following us, but keep your eyes out front until you hit the tree line. Even then, only fire if fired on. Those are specific orders. Do you understand? He took off his helmet. Wiped his brow. I'll tell you what. Why don't I stay here while you get her out? You can take her to safety with Granger and leave us to sort out what happens here. How's about that for a freaking order? What I wanted to say to him was that if he insisted, I'd gouge out his good eye with my knife and leave it dangling on his cheek. Going a second round with him there and then wasn't an option. No problem. But understand this. As soon as she's out, you need to give the order to get everyone back to the clubhouse. There's a SWAT team standing by to come in ten times your numbers to mop up immediately after the mission is over. They've agreed to let you pass through their cordon, I said, adding some motivation to what Granger had said so they'd get the hell away from there. You never said that. We have a score to settle with Handbag. No one mentioned SWAT. Why'd you need us? Because the kidnap note said no cops. Besides, you never said you wanted a war, so that evens things out. Anyway, that's not what we agreed to. We had a plan, now stick to it, and likely no one will get hurt. He glared at me. I glared back. He was a sore loser. So was I. He grinded his teeth. I deadpanned him with a look. Okay. Have it your way, he said. Get going. Crawl into the back window of the second hangar. I hoped and prayed that Maria was in there where Hustler said they'd had her locked up. The wooden frame was rotten. Easy to pry open with my knife. Once inside, I set a crouch. 
pulled down the night visions on my helmet. Turned the volume down on my comms. I heard voices in my head. Pushed the earpiece further into my ear. The receiver was picking up a conversation from the bug next door. Word from our spotter. The containers are passing Monroe and Convoy on the Detroit-Toledo Expressway. They're turning into a services area. Tell the guys to get going. Remember, it's container HB312876 we want. Use your vehicles to cut it loose at the intersection like we planned, then get it back here. Mo can stick his business right up his ass. The nerve. Trying to take me out over one little statue. See what he tries when he loses a container full of them. Once we have that, we're in the driving seat. It was time to move fast. Lone Wolf would have spotted that there was a possibility someone would leave. He have given instructions to let them pass before the event at a prearranged signal. I'd never thought of it. I'd been too personally involved wanting to get her out. Caught up in the moment. Not thought things through. It reminded me why I was better off solo. No emotion. Strictly business. Instead I'd been burdened with feelings. With my night visions in situ, I hurried to where Crack Hustler said they'd held her. The door was open. Just a chair inside and a mattress. I came to a second door. It was locked. There was no mistaking the sound of multiple engines firing up more or less at the same time. Not enough time to try and pick the lock before some trigger-happy biker might take a pot shot. Hoping the engines would mask the noise, I charged it with my shoulder. There was a loud crack as the door partly opened. A kick with my boot and it flew open. It was full of cleaning materials and equipment. Maria wasn't in there. My mind did that thing again. Flashing images and thoughts at the speed of light. There were no other rooms in that hangar. The only thing missing from when I'd last looked in there was the light aircraft. Maria had to be in the first hangar. Let them pass, I said over the comms, I repeat, let the vehicles pass. Tower, any sign of them taking our target out via the parking lot? Negative. All I could do was to hope that handbag's crew didn't have a scanner as I worked my way back to Taffy. Why let them go? We could still take them. She's not in there. Besides, it reduces the numbers, but they'll be back. I've got the place bugged. How long will it take them to get north of Monroe? About one hour. Why? If they'd pulled into the rest area for a refreshment break, by the time Handbag's crew returned, I figured that would give us more than enough time to sort out the situation at the hangars. They're doing a round trip to Monroe. Plenty of time for what we have to do. We need to regroup. Follow me. Taffy surprised me. I backed off five yards while he kept covering the area to the front. I stopped to cover him, backing off another five yards. We rinsed and repeated all the way to the tree line. Huddled together, I took hustlers and my cell phone from my pocket. I need to switch them on to see if Handbag or her mom has messaged. I passed Granger Hustler's phone while I checked my own phone and turned off the sound. There were no calls, no messages. What are you doing with the tracker app on your phone? Granger asked. Scared of getting lost? You've received a message he said. Let's see, I said, and snatched the phone back. I was more concerned with the tracker app, I can't see one. Scroll the screen. Second page. Damn. Why the damnation? Thought you'd have known you'd installed it? Not my phone. I rolled my eyes, then pulled up the message. Not smart. All bets are off. You can't hide. You are now officially dead, it read. Now I had to wonder if it wasn't Granger who had given up my position to handbag. The tracker app could have been his way of keeping tabs on his sister. I remembered the political canvasser at the door. Then seeing her at the car, and her pointing in the direction of the apartment. It wasn't long after that that the dealers appeared. He could have been monitoring the signal right then and there. That would be our position screwed. I need to contact Handbag before he puts a bullet in her head. If he hasn't already. Gopher, pass me the bag with the statue. I might have to make the trade for real this time. Chapter 54 There were three vehicles left in the parking lot. 
Handbags Mustang. The dealer's Chevy and an SUV. I need to get a closer look at the vehicles and do a license plate search, Granger said. The SUV looks like Connor's. If it is, that would be a bonus. Yeah, well I've already gotten my bonus. The Chevy belongs to the punk who tried to trash the clubhouse, Taffy said. We have them all marked then. The Mustang is handbags. I have the address for the Chevy, I said. I'm not so sure about the SUV, Granger said. I'll go and get the plate number. Run it through registrations. While Granger went to check the tag number, we discussed the situation. Really, I should have said they listened to my ideas. Granger returned. Give me a cell phone, Granger said. Now's not the time to call Blake, I said. Don't worry, I won't. I need that registration check. Granger made the call. His eyes sparkled. His lips curled into a smile. I guess you were right, I said. You guessed right. Connor must be in there. Listen, I took a look around front. The sliding hangar door is open six inches or so. That gives us two entry possibilities, I said. The back window opens onto a bench. Trouble is, all the lights are glaring, and I've not heard them talking in the office since the others left. I'd spoken too soon. Take a look at the computer screen, someone said. He's here. I looked up to the stars. They know I'm here. They're tracking the phone signal. Well, that's blown the surprise. What now? Taffy asked. Might as well message him. See if I can cut a deal. I need to get them out of the office. They can lay down a kill zone from up there. I pressed the earpiece with my finger. Showed them my palm to keep quiet. A voice booked in my ear. Bastard. How's he found us? Give me the radio. It was definitely Handbag's voice I'd heard buzzing in my ear. Doug, get the dog to sniff around. We've got an intruder. No, wait. Go to the tower and cover the entrance to our hangar. Don't let the dog loose. There was a lull in the conversation, then Handbag said, Doug's already in the tower. Now we have him. Time to send him a message. Flush him out. You go with Connor. I want you both to cover the entrance. I'll go down and try to get him inside. I typed my own message. I still have the statue. We can trade. This time I want what I came for. I pressed send. What's been said? Granger asked. I relayed what I'd heard. How do we get them outside? Gopher asked. I doubt that we can get them all out, but we might get handbag outside. They think that they have the outside covered thanks to your guys in the tower. We need to take out the lights. Taffy chewed on his bottom lip, then said, So you're saying we have to go in? I can't force you, but I'm going in. Here's what I have in mind. I relayed a plan. I can take out the energy at the transformer, said Taffy. Then we can all go in. Hustler's cell phone buzzed. I pulled up the message. Sure, we can jaw. What do you want? I know you're here. Come on in. He's asking what I want. He must know what I want. His message had me confused. I couldn't work out his tactic. Granger folded his arms and sighed. What if he doesn't have her? He must have her. Who the hell else would kidnap her and direct the kidnap note to me? She might not be on the table anymore. He could have killed her. Why don't you ask him? Granger said. I typed another message. The woman had better be alive, or no deal. I sent the message. The reply came back quick enough. What woman? We exchanged messages thick and fast. Don't be a smartass. The woman you kidnapped. Give me a break. You got Queenie. It's you who duped me. It's not Queenie I wanted. You know who I mean. This time I want a clean exchange. The woman for the statue. He replied right away. You work for Mo? What's that got to do with it? I asked him. He paid you to take me out, didn't he? No. You're lying, he messaged. You're lying about the woman. He ignored what I'd said and I received a new message. I bet he asked her to make sure you finished the job. 
I passed the phone to Granger. You'd better read the messages. Tell me what you think. The three of them hunched together and read the messages. He's lying, said Gopher. He has her. Maybe the statue's not worth deadly now. He has a container full on its way. She's dead, said Taffy. He can't exchange what he doesn't have. Make the exchange for money and we can divide it out. I think he's telling the truth, said Granger. Did Mole hire you to take out handbag? Is that why we're here? To finish the job for you. I stiffened up. To hell with you all. Give the damn phone back. I'll go in on my own. He yes, sir, I spat at them. The phone buzzed again. Cat got your tongue. I'm ready now. Ask him what the statue is worth in cash dollars, Taffy said. He thinks he has the front door covered. Get him to step outside to exchange. Our guys in the tower can take him out. Then Granger can call in the heavy armor. I ignored him and typed, if I was sent to kill you, I could have done it in the container, then I pressed send. The more I thought about the messages, as I scrolled through them all, the more of what Handbag had said made sense. It became understandable that he could have thought I had meant I wanted to exchange for Queenie. I'd never mentioned Maria by name. Just assumed, and so had he. What's all that about? Granger asked. I'll tell you when I get a reply. He'll need to chew over what I've just said. I received another message. I'll give you that about the container. Ten thousand dollars for the statue and that's us done, his message read. I typed out another message and pressed send. Make it twenty. Have you got cash? I replied for the sake of the game you wanted to play. Yeah, how do we do this? Front door. Man to man outside. Make the exchange. Hands in the air. When? Fifteen minutes. Be ready. I passed the phone to Granger. What's all this about a container? You don't need to know. Only that he's acknowledged I could have taken him out. So you weren't given a contract on his head. But why would Mo want to kidnap her? What dealings have you had with him? Granger asked. None. Granger shook his head. Taffy took the phone and read the messages. You sure we'll find drugs in there? Granger asked. Sure. Right then. That changes nothing, plus Connor's in there. I snatched a look over at Taffy. General to tower. There's gonna be an exchange. When the guy steps out the hangar door, take him down. Affirmative. Whoa there. Who said you can give orders to start shooting, I said. The next thing I knew, I was staring down the barrel of Taffy's rifle. Taffy said, I'll make the exchange. Gopher, cover them both. Pass the statue here. Chapter 55 Taffy was gone. Gopher set a position partly behind a tree stump. His eyes danced between the both of us. He had his orders, but he looked unsure of himself. You ever killed someone? I asked him. No. But don't think I won't pull the trigger. Oh, I forgot. You've never seen action. You might get one of us, but you won't get both. You know Taffy was only a cook in the army? Dishonorably discharged. Had his eye taken out in a prison fight. No, he wasn't. He was a captain. He was wounded in a fight with the Taliban. That's what he told you. He's as big a liar as you. Do yourself a favor and put the gun down before someone gets hurt. I jammed my finger on my earpiece. Put your hand down, Gopher said. Shush. Handbag's talking. I listened intently. Give me twenty grand out of the safe. Then both of you get down the stairs and hide behind the Chrysler after you've rolled down the windows. I'll hit the lights. When I swing the doors open and step outside, I'll duck and shout now. If Doug doesn't get him, take him down. What's he saying? asked Gopher. He's saying, Taffy is a dick. Chances are both handbag and him will get theirs from what he's planning. I gave him chapter and verse of what had been said. Damn it, man. I can't go against orders. Okay, we'll wait until he's down, then no one will know the orders he gave you, or... Or, what? said Gopher. 
where you could save his sorry ass and end up the hero down at the club. He looked to be chewing it over. And do what? he asked. Pull the pin on this smoke grenade and toss it between the tower and taffy when I give the signal, so it'll drift across the doors, I said, and pointed to the grenade on my vest. I'll give Granger here a stun grenade to toss between the two of them. Then I'll get him the hell out of harm's way. I have a better idea, Granger said. Let go for toss them both to get them synchronized. I'll get through the back window, flank them, and keep the other two busy. Good idea. Well, what's it to be, Gopher? This is your chance for active duty. Gopher lowered his AR-15. Give me the grenades. Let's do this. Just make sure you remember which grenade is which, I said, as we charged to the back of the hangar. We left Granger at the back window with the length of metal at the ready. Gopher peeled off to the left. I peeled off to the right. Taffy was standing fifteen yards from the hangar door, his hands in the air, and clutching the statue. I crawled behind a stack of aviation fuel barrels to the rear and to my left of Taffy. Improvising, I pulled out a receiver detonator and the last of my C4 from one of my vest pockets. Stuck it on the barrels. Hung the transmitter around my neck. Taffy crouched, then lay on the grass. The lights were still glaring, then they went out. I see you, Handbag said. Stand up and keep your hands high. You do the same when you come out, Taffy said. The door grated open, and Handbag stepped out, his hands in the air. Come on, Gopher, now. Tower, don't shoot. He's unarmed, I said. Taffy rose to his feet. Hey, who the hell are you? Handbag said, and glanced up at the tower. At last Gopher acted. Smoke billowed. I closed my eyes to the explosion of the stun grenade, then darted at Taffy, taking him down at the legs. A staccato of gunfire erupted from inside the hangar. Rounds zipped over our heads. Smoke drifted across the hangar door. I couldn't get a fix on handbag. I pressed the transmitter. To a loud flash and an explosion, the barrels took flight. To my surprise, I also saw the flash of an explosion inside. They must not have removed the detonator that I'd placed under the plastic gnome. What the, Taffy said, before I slammed my hand over his mouth. Shut the hell up. I saved your sorry ass. Keep your head down. The gunfire stopped. I heard crackling over my headphone, then Granger's voice. They're disarmed. All clear in here. Taffy pulled away from me. Staggered around like a zombie, catching hundred dollar bills that were floating around in the air. An engine spluttered to life. Tower, you see anything? I said over the comms. Can't see nothing but smoke. Wait. There's a light aircraft taxiing down the runway. Damn, can't get a clear shot with the smoke. Don't shoot. The cops will take care of him. Get back here and help us search the hangar. As the aircraft rose above the smoke, it suddenly exploded in a ball of flames. Then it was gone. Tower, I told you not to shoot. We didn't. The smoke started to clear. I looked over at Gopher. He shrugged his shoulders. Wasn't me. Taffy was on his hands and knees still collecting bills. It wasn't him who'd taken down the aircraft. The two bikers from the tower appeared, pushing the guard in front of them. The dog walked at the side of them, wagging its tail. I wasn't about to ask them how in hell's name they'd done it. Let me smell your barrels, I said. They obliged. Neither of them had been fired. Anyone on the perimeter. Only answer if you took the aircraft down. Combs remained silent. Can I have the phone now to phone Blake? Granger asked, and prodded the rifle at Connor's back. Did you have to take down the aircraft? What was left of it was scattered down the runway, some of it still burning. It wasn't me, and no one here is owning up to shooting it down. Maybe there was a fault on the fuel lines. Granger had the two of his prisoners lay face down on the grass. Give me a chance to search the hangar first. Then you can make the call. Passing by Taffy, I kicked his ass sending him sprawling on the ground. Hand the money over to Granger, asswipe, where you can stay here and wait for SWAT. I picked up his rifle and relieved him of his sidearm, then ripped his comms from his head. 
Come on, gopher, let's check out the hangars. The two bikers handed over their prisoner. Granger tossed the dog a chunk of meat. Nice doggy. With the lights now on, Maria was nowhere to be found. We all headed for the second hangar. A thorough search found nothing. I walked over to Granger. Tossed him my cell phone. You can make the call now. Pointing Betsy at Taffy, he dropped the bills. And the rest you've tucked into your vest, smartass. Gopher, call your guys on the perimeter. Have them vacate the area. Tell them we'll all rendezvous at the clubhouse for debriefing. He tipped me a salute. Grinned at me like the cat that had the cream. Granger tossed me my phone. Maria's mom called. The kidnappers have just made contact. I'll phone you as soon as Blake arrives with SWAT. Better get going. Handbag was telling the truth after all. Not finding Maria had proved to be a disaster. The only consolation I took from the mission was that someone out there still had her. There was that, and Handbag was no longer around with a score to settle. I stooped and picked up the artifact, then set off back to my car. One thing was for sure, I'd soon find out what it was they wanted, and why they took her. Chapter 56 Maria's mom had been beside herself with emotion. It was difficult to work out what she had said in between her stuttering and weeping. At least Roberto was oblivious to what had happened. She said he was sleeping. Anna acted to type. I had to admire her spunk. Grabbed the phone and gave me a tongue lashing. For a twelve-year-old, she didn't mince her words. Once I had a handle on the terms of exchange and the contact number, I had plenty to think about on the drive over to the clubhouse. One thing they made clear, no cops where she would be dead. All they wanted was that damned statue. It had to be Mo behind all this. Handbag had stolen it from him. Now he wanted it back. The thing that bugged me was how he knew I had it, unless Handbag had told him. There was a possibility he'd told him I had it, for him to try and stop the feud. Damn thing was cursed. He was welcome to it before it had a chance to see me added to its death toll. I almost missed the turning. Jammed hard on the pedal, then swung into the parking lot. Glancing at my watch, it was time to make the call. Taking out my cell phone, I dialed the number. You asked me to call. I have the statue. A guy answered. He spoke with a heavy accent which gave away he was more used to speaking Arabic. I guessed it was Mo, or one of his crew. He was short and sweet with what he said. To the point, but with a hint of nervousness. The call cut mid-sentence as if he'd been timing the call. Sensible, really. Probably making sure the call couldn't be traced. Regardless, I knew exactly how he wanted the exchange to go down. Once I'd had time to consider his plan, I could always phone back if I didn't like it. His choice of venue made sense, and yet it didn't, unless he'd managed to shake his CIA handlers. I climbed out of my seat. Headed for the clubhouse door. It was different this time when I entered. I was one of them. Back slapping and handshakes all the way to the bar. No one pulled the plug on the jukebox. Gopher was at the bar, everyone milling around him. The center of attention. Where's Taffy? I asked him. Blackballed. Won't see him in here again. So who's in charge? I am. I had to smile. He wouldn't need to concoct any more stories. He had bragging rights for being in the thick of what went down. Before any of you have another beer, we have another mission to plan. The kidnapper has been in touch. Kill the music, Gopher called out. Some of the guys rearranged the tables, pulling them together in the center of the room. I spread my map on the tables. Stabbed a finger at the location of the exchange. My cell phone rang. Sorry about this, I said, and took the call. Granger was on the line. Man, that's some bust. The amount of drugs they've found is staggering. What about the container? Has it arrived? No, not yet. SWAT has set up a perimeter. They'll take them down when they arrive. Blake needs statements to... Yeah, well he'll have to wait. Let me finish. I haven't told him the kidnapper has been in touch. He said I could go to the clubhouse to take statements. I'm five minutes away. 
I doubt you'll get any of these to admit they were there, I said. To hell with the statements. I only suggested it to Blake so I could get to help a brother. Well, there's that, and I want to give Taffy a slap, he said. He's not here. They've blackballed him. Serves the sucker right. He'd gotten his timing wrong. The call cut. Tires crunched the gravel on the lot. From what he'd said, it was looking as though we'd made a real connection. The door swung open. Granger strutted inside. The vets gave him the same back-slapping welcome. Tell everyone how you took the guys down in the hangar, Gopher said. I sighed. Not wanting to pull rank, but we have more pressing things to arrange, I said. Oh, yeah, right, said Gopher. I looked over at the two who worked the tower. When this is over, we'll meet back here. Then we can all toast to death before dishonor and swap stories. Gotta say, I want to know what Granger has to say. I also want to know how you two worked the number on the garden and dog in the tower. Here, here, rolled around the room. Back to business, guys, I said. We're on Harper Avenue. Gopher asked. The derelict Fisher body plant. He wants the exchange on the first level at midnight. He says if he even smells that I'm not alone, he'll kill her. I met one of his CIA babysitters over there the other day. I'm guessing they took him there to hide after someone tried to blow him up, while they sorted out a safe house. CIA, Gopher said, his eyes popping like they were on stocks. Yeah, he's under their protection, but he's not with them 24-7. Saying that, the CIA are onto his criminal activities. So what do you want us to do? Granger asked, emphasizing thus as though he was part of the club. I don't think I need you to do anything as far as action is concerned, only to pray for Maria and me. The stakes are too high. I'll have to go in solo. What you could do is mark out a perimeter. See what's happening and keep me posted over the comms. We've got two hours before the exchange goes down. If he goes onto the roof, he can see in all directions for a distance, so we can't set up a close perimeter. Besides, he'd hear your bikes arriving from some distance away. He says he'll be alone, but I doubt it, knowing his background and intelligence. Get him on the roof if you can, said the guy at the opposite and end of the tables. If I take up a sniper position on the building further along, he'd be dead meat. I could pick up my rifle on the way there. What's the distance? I asked. Quarter of a mile at most. No way. At night, I said. Everyone laughed. What's so funny? I asked. He held the record for distance kills at night in Afghanistan, until that Brit did the mile and a half, Gopher said. Yeah, but how will he know who's who? He'd have to be using a night scope. Keep your fingers crossed, the guy said. You'd not have time to feel the bullet. That vest you're wearing with the plates won't help you. Trust me. I'll be able to work it out. Besides, looking at the map, there's a building a lot nearer. It's him I'm worried about. He pointed to Granger. Don't worry about me. I'm not a cop tonight. Your plan is what SWAT would set up in a life or death hostage situation. It's what happens if there are any bodies after the event I'm worried about. One of the tower guys with a long white bushy beard snickered, then said, they'd never find his body, trust me. We know how to wash the dishes and put them away after a meal. I didn't doubt the sincerity of what he had said. Right, I'm going. Whatever you do, don't get too close. Just keep me posted if it looks like they're flanking me. Chapter 57 I'd been in the vicinity of the Fisher body plant for some time. No one on the roof was giving off a heat signature, and I'd stalked the full perimeter. Same with all the windows at the different levels. No signs of life. The fire exit stairway on the outside wall at the rear was intact. On Harper Avenue, I skinned the roof again. There was a silo on the roof, with a stainless steel chute snaking from it down the wall to a lower level. The plant was vast. I would not seen any vehicles parked in the area. He was either in the building with Maria, or he'd not yet arrived. With one hour to go, I wondered if I'd be better off entering the building. Take a look around. See what cover I could find. Gain an advantage. There again. I had to factor in that if he was in there, he could have an ambush set, 
with a bunch of hired thugs waiting. Back at the apartment, before my first visit, Google Maps had only given me a view of the outside. The idea of going in there blind before the allotted time was now screwing with my mind. You would have had time to find out about the storm water and sewage drains. It's what we would have done. That could be how he would enter and exit. A chopper wasn't out of the equation for someone of his wealth. A guy who'd worked for intelligence wouldn't be so stupid as to not have planned a failsafe exit. He didn't know me. For all he knew I could have said, to hell with it, and called the cops. SWAT and the FBI could be surrounding the place and he didn't seem to have any lookouts. It didn't feel right, or I was wrong and he was stupid. If he spotted me sneaking up to the building, he'd see I was alone. He'd expect me to be cautious. I decided to go in early. Worked my way around to the back. Vehicle heading your way. Two occupants. Male and a female, I heard over the comms. Looking over my shoulder, a vehicle was driving along the road toward me. I stepped back behind some bushes. This was going to be too easy. If it was him, I could take him before he even set foot in the building. The vehicle slowed. Pulled up and parked under the fire exit ladders. It was looking as though the fire exit was going to be his way inside. The only thing that baffled me was that they were both sitting in the front. He turned off his car lights. The vanity light lit up the inside. The woman's head disappeared. It only took a minute and she sat upright. He turned on the lights, fired up his engine and drove on. False alarm. It was probably only a hooker and her john. Rolling an empty oil barrel into place, I climbed onto it, then pulled on the ladder. Damn thing had seized from a lack of maintenance. It took a few grunts and groans and a bucket of sweat to pull my body up onto the ladder. Then it freed and it screeched as it dropped. I'd gone soft after missing only a week's training after taking that stupid bullet. I had to take a minute. Thought back to Maria injecting the morphine. Sawing up the wound. Her caressing me in bed. If he'd abused her in any way, I knew I'd be back to make sure he was dead. Maybe it was those thoughts that got the adrenaline bubbling. Whatever, with a renewed sense of purpose and energy. I scaled the ladder two steps at a time. Nearing the top, I unshouldered Betsy's strap, pulled down my night visions, and crept the rest of the way to the top. If they were out there waiting, I gave them a fleeting target, then ducked. Nothing. I bobbed up again, marking left and right in a sweep. Elbows over the brickwork at the top, I levered, then rolled over the wall and onto the roof. Over at the silo, to the right of it there was a doorway under a water tower with a stairway down to the next level. I'd counted six levels, not including a basement. That meant I had to sweep to the second level, knowing I'd be clear from the top when I arrived. That was our exit sorted. I see you on the roof. Clear as a daisy, I heard over the comms, from who I assumed was my sniper friend. There was one vantage point high enough for a clear view that I could see. It was only 200 yards from the building. He'd learned his craft well. There wasn't even the hint of a heat signal. As much as the fire exit was a good escape route with anyone in pursuit, we'd be sitting targets on the way down. The message from Sniper was a relief. Even if he missed, the rounds would likely keep their heads down. The place had a musky smell all the way down to the second floor. There was graffiti sprayed on a peeling blue painted wall that simply said save us. I thought it ironic. It was probably a message from the workers when they closed the plant. It now took on a different meaning. That's when I notice a pungent smell of urine over the stench of the damp. The odor stopped me in my tracks. I edged behind a column, then crouched. It could have been left there by a vagrant, or maybe vandals. Goodness knows there were enough signs of vandalism besides the decay. But this was strong. Fresh. Not from years past. The danger signal that the stench posed wasn't from something we'd been taught. It came from experience. On missions, especially on long stakeouts the maxim, don't crap on your own doorstep had a different significance as to how it was used colloquially. Hygiene apart, you'd never leak where you were hiding, only into a bottle that you could seal. Otherwise you might give away your position. Besides, if there was a lack of water, you might have a need for it later. But it wasn't just the smell of urine that troubled me. 
I'd probably experienced every stage of bodies decaying on the battlefield. The smell of death hung in the air. As I stalked along the rows of columns, the smell increased in intensity until I came to some tarps. I lifted the first tarp at the corner and revealed the polished shoe. Tossing the tarp to one side unleashed the stink from hell. It was the corpse of CIA agent Adams. There was a bullet hole in his temple. He'd seen it coming. Poor guy. He was bound. Rigor mortis was advanced. Probably been there since around the day of the explosion at Moe's house. I lifted the second tarp to reveal another body. Took a step back. This one was a more recent kill. His face had all the signs of a serious beating. Who it was left me perplexed. Reached forward and lifted a leg. His limbs were flexible. The pool of blood from the gash across his neck hadn't congealed. The scene explained the smell of urine. First thing the body does when anyone dies is to relax and expel body fluids. I knew that much. What I didn't know was how it was possible. Especially when considering who the second body was. All I knew for certain was that the killer was around. Not only that, but he had Maria. I patted the bag holding the statue that was held by a cord over my shoulder. All I wanted to do was to get the exchange over with before its curse turned on me. I felt my phone vibrating against my leg. Snatched it out of my pocket. The clock on the face showed it was one minute to twelve. I answered the call. Where are you? I have your woman here. Chapter 58 There was nothing about the accent on the other end of the line that suggested they were from the Middle East. I knew exactly who it was. No mistaking the Bostonian twang. With Mo and CIA agent Adams now dead, he was the only one left with a connection to the Fisher plant. He was the only one left on my tree. The only one with a connection to my unit that I'd not considered. So how is this going down, Joe? Is that what I call you? I said, at remembering the name he'd given us on our mission in Somalia. Call me whatever you like. What do I call you? Joyce isn't it now? Or do I use your call sign? Oh, yeah, I remember. Red Dog, one of my memory serves me well. The banter was getting us nowhere. Whatever, let's get this over with. Put Maria on the phone so I know she's alive. I could hear muffled cries, then Maria's voice. Ted, please, do as he says. Hi. That's enough, said CIA agent Joe Carter. Mr. Trigger happy himself. Pity the statue can't speak to give you answers that must be burning a hole in your brain. I take it you have the statue with you? Yeah, I have it, I said. I can't see you. Where are you, he said. You don't need to see me. Where are you? I replied. Where I said I'd be. There were stairways to the left and right of me down to the first level, but they were both some distance away. With the crap on the floor, stealth would be difficult. Why the statue? I asked. It's a loose end. You mean like Hassan and Adams? Not much of a payday for your handiwork with this piece of junk. He laughed like a jackass down the line, his voice carrying up the stairway to the right of me. I was already at the stairway to the left. At least I now had their position. The artifact wasn't the only loose end. Maria and me were obvious loose ends. You don't know the half of it, he said. Go on then enlighten me, I said, knowing that whilst ever we had what each other wanted, it was worth a shot at discovering what was behind it all. You don't need to know. Now let's make the trade. Okay, I'll leave the statue at the top of the stairway to the second level. The one on the left if you were standing on Harper Avenue and facing the building. You bring Maria up the right-hand stairway and leave her there to walk back down. Give your phone to Maria, so she can talk to me all the way through the trade. You can walk over to collect the statue and I'll go down to level one and walk over to Maria. Then that's us all getting what we want, I said. So you're on the second floor? Who else is with you? I'm alone. You sure you don't have your biker friends with you? This question had me thinking how in hell he knew about the bikers. What biker friends? Don't take me for a fool. The ones that were with you at the flying school. The punks who almost let Leroy escape. Good thing I set up a remote charge on the aircraft. So you were there? 
Go figure. Anyway, they're not here. I'm alone. Was it you who tried to take out Mo at his home? I saw the red logo on your heel when you dropped the file. Oh, the dog crap on my shoe. I wondered what that was about, he said. I'm also guessing you were the one who had Greg set me up at Leroy's house, and he was another of your loose ends, same as Craig and Hank? Only I'm thinking Craig and Hank wouldn't play ball. Greg, yeah, not the others, he said, leaving me wondering who had taken them out. You won't get away with any of it. That was all bullcrap there back in Somalia. You've been duped. The million dollars you took that was meant for the hostages only bought you the statue. I doubt you'll get ten grand on the black market, I said. Like I said, I'm no fool. I know what it's worth. With the hostage money, I bought blood diamonds in Kenya. Had forged authentication arranged in Syria and swapped them for more than the statue you have there. I've had containers full of the crap shipped already. That was just a sample. Now I'm retired. I have the pension that I deserve, a new identity, and a life of luxury waiting, he said, and laughed. He'd given too much away. That told me that he didn't plan on either of us leaving there alive. I had a need to keep him running off at the mouth. And then Leroy stole the artifact from Hassan. So you were in business with Hassan? Now he's gone there is no one to share the ill-gotten gains with. I hope you're not expecting the latest container to turn up at the docks. How do you know about the container? Well now, if I tell you, it will depend on if Maria and me lives. It's not at the docks. It's sort of been rerouted to somewhere safe. There was silence as I hit the bottom of the stairway, the cell phone pressed to my ear. Listen, I've a better idea, he said. You walk down the stairway to the right. Hold up the statue so I can see it, then place it on the floor. I'll send you Maria. Then you can tell me where the container is, and you can both walk off to your left and live happily ever after. I had him in my sights, but he was holding Maria, with most of his body obscured by a column. I turned off my cell phone. Went to a place in my mind that's hard to explain. Did you get that? He called out. He broke cover. Dragged Maria to the bottom of the stairway. Put your phone back on her, I swear she's dead, he shouted, pressing a pistol to her head. Maria had her hands bound behind her back. She struggled to break free at his threat. Kicked him in his privates, then she fell. I squeezed Betsy's trigger. Expected him to crumble. Instead he dropped to his knee, then returned fire. The concrete splintered as the bullet struck the column next to me. When I glanced back out he was gone. Maria was in the open. I laid down automatic rounds, charging from column to column. Changed a clip, then fired some more. Grabbed a hold of Maria as rounds zipped by and dragged her behind cover. Sliced the duct tape on her wrists, then removed the tape from her mouth. Where did he go? Her mind wouldn't engage with her mouth. She looked up and stabbed her fingers at the stairway. I adjusted the comms mic. Need an extraction. Corner of Harper Avenue at the parking lot. Shots fired. Hostage released. Do not drive along Harper Avenue. Shooter on the loose. Could need cover fire. Prepare to exchange rounds. Two for extraction. I repeat, two for extraction. Affirmative. Maria was still whimpering. Tried to put her arms around me. I pulled them away. Put a finger to my lips. Signaled for her to stay behind me. Backed off away from column to column. I doubted he'd just run and hide. We were two loose ends. Three counting the artifact. The brickwork was open to the parking lot. We arrived at the last column. I heard his footsteps running over our position on the floor above. That was our exit flanked. He have a clear shot as we exited. Tossed the statue to the bottom of the stairway. That's all I want, he called out. There was no way he wanted us to escape. I turned to Maria. Her eyes were looking at me. Bulging from their sockets. I doubted they saw me. They were dancing in fear, looking inward to her worst nightmares. I took a hold of her by the shoulders. Gave her a shake, then whispered. I need you to be brave. You have to trust me. At my command, I want you to run through that hole in the wall. 
Head for the corner of the chain link fence. There's a hole in the wire. Someone will pick you up and get you to safety. I'll be right behind you. She nodded. Well, is that a yes? Joe shouted. I'm thinking about it, I called out. Yeah, well don't think too long, he called back. We're in position, I heard over the comms. I pulled a grenade from my vest. Showed it to her. She nodded. I pulled the pin. Here's your damn statue, I called out, and tossed the grenade to the top of the stairway. Maria tried to go early. I stopped her mid-step. Pulled her back behind the column. Covered her ears as the grenade exploded. Go, 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 I said, stepping out and laying down covering rounds at the stairway until she was gone. Just you and me, I said, and stepped back behind the column. A crescendo of rounds rang out from up the stairway, but they weren't directed downstairs. The sound intensified, with return fire from outside. I could only hope that she had made it to safety. Chapter 59 The rounds of gunfire echoing from inside stopped, but continued pinging on the brickwork outside. The bottom of the stairway would be a kill zone if I tried to exit. He was probably training his sight on the only way out. The top three steps had been blown away. At least he wouldn't be able to get down to me that way. I checked my ammo. I'd emptied the mag laying down cover. Clicked another one in place, then. Backed off toward the opposite stairway. A burst of muzzle flashes from the top of the stairway that had me diving for cover. Lost my footing and crashed to the floor, then scrambled behind a column. Did she make it out? I said over the comms. The faint buzz from the headphone speakers had stopped. I twisted the battery transmitter around to my front. A bullet had taken it out, but saved my ass, literally. I heard footsteps crunching on the floor above, but they hadn't reached me. There were gaping holes in the ceiling. He was working his way along, spraying rounds through the holes as he approached. I sprinted to the stairway to cut him off. That was when I noticed a stairway down to a basement area. I guessed that was where he'd entered. There was probably a labyrinth of service tunnels down there, leading to an exit away from the building. I ran up the stairway, put Betsy over the top and fired off a few rounds. If that wouldn't have him scurrying up to the next level, nothing would. All thoughts of getting the hell out of there vanished. For all I knew he could have killed Maria in a hail of bullets. He could have been lying when he said his dad worked there. Nonetheless, he knew it well enough to have arranged the trade there. He'd know about the fire exit. I doubted my sniper friend would have stood down. Not while he knew I was still in there. The mission had changed. I needed to flush him up to the roof. Give my guy a clear shot to take out the murdering traitor that he was. I poked my head over the top at the stairway just in time to see his heat signature scampering up the opposite stairway to the next level. I followed him up the stairs at my end of the plant until I reached the sixth level. From there, there was only the central stairway to the roof under the water tower. I stepped out on the sixth floor in time to see him scurry up the last set of stairs to the roof. For all Sniper knew, it could be me on the roof. I'd have to take him out on his way down the fire exit ladder. Hugging the wall under the tower, I stepped out as he was about to climb over onto the ladder. Stop right there, don't move. Okay, you got me. What now? he said. I waved one arm in the hope that Sniper would get it as a signal as to who was who. As Joe turned and lifted his rifle, his head exploded before my eyes. Took his skull right from his shoulders. Instinctively I ducked. Just as well I did. A second round smashed through the brickwork, leaving a gaping hole above my head. That was some serious Sniper bullet. It left me wondering what the hell had just happened. I wasn't going to hang around to give the sniper a second chance, and scrambled down to the first level. I could see bodies piling through the hole in the wall, then spreading out. They must have spotted me as I ran for cover behind a column. Ted, is that you? Yeah, is that you, Gopher? Who else? What the hell happened up there on the roof? Never mind that. My comms were down. Did Maria make it out alive? Chapter 60 I drove back to the clubhouse alone. Maria was sitting at the bar, nursing a brandy with one hand, 
and holding a cell phone to her ear. Tears were streaming down her cheeks, but she wasn't whimpering. Ted! Thank God you made it out alive. I'm talking to Mom, she said, then continued talking on the cell phone. He's here. We'll be back soon. Tell Anna I'm fine. She closed the call and ran up to me. Threw her arms around my neck. It's all over, I said. Nothing will come back to haunt you and the kids, I lied, considering what the sniper had told me. Said he didn't take the shot at Joe. Saw a muzzle flash 500 yards to his right when the second round hit. He said I'd guessed his position around 100 yards away. I was inclined to believe him that there was a second sniper. He wouldn't have hit the wall from his vantage point. There again, he could just as easy have been covering his ass when he said it wasn't him. Couldn't blame him for not wanting to admit to the hit. Not with Granger involved. I turned to Gopher. I've not seen Granger. Where is he? I said and looked around. Tied up in the john. Didn't want a cop as a witness. Good thing we did, considering we need to clean up at the Fisher plant. Well, don't just leave him there. Go and get him, but first radio your guys to leave everything as is at the plant. Gopher eased off of his stool. Strutted to the john with his cell at his ear to make the call. Holy crap! I heard him call out. I rushed to the john. What's wrong? He's gone, he said, and pushed the stall door wide open. The rope they'd used was on the floor. How he'd gotten his frame through the window defied belief. A boot print on the seat suggested that was his way out. Guess he didn't want to stay where he wasn't wanted. Maybe you'd gotten him wrong. He didn't bring the cops down on us at the Fisher plant, I said. At the same time, it concerned me, but I thought it best to keep my thoughts to myself as to where Granger could have gone. There was a deafening sound in the parking lot as I ambled back into the bar. The rest of the bikers walked inside. Maria was standing at the door, giving each one a hug and a kiss on the cheek as they entered. The last one enclosed the door. Gopher sat at a table. He was the center of attention. Relayed his bravado at going into the Fisher plant at the head of his team. I can't thank you all enough, I said. Maria needs to get back to her family now. We'll be going. Gopher rose to his feet. Thrust a bottle of beer at me, then handed Maria her brandy. Let's have that toast now, he said. Here's to death before dishonor. Death before dishonor echoed around the room. The vets had come through. Luckily with no injuries. I wasn't one for ceremony. The jukebox fired up. There were tales to tell. Embellishments to add. Come on, let's go, I said, and took her by the hand. Driving over to her mom's house, she confirmed that they entered through tunnels that led to the basement. Said Mo had been with them, all buddy-buddy. The CIA got tighter to some pipes. Disappeared with Mo. Returned alone. That must have been when Mo had phoned me. He must have slit his throat right after the call closed. Did he take any calls beside the ones he made with me? Yeah. He took a call. All I heard him say was something like not to worry. It'll be over soon. Her saying that really concerned me. He could have been talking to whoever the second sniper was. I pulled up short of her mom's house. What's wrong? Maria said. That's Granger's car parked outside. Stay here. No way. I'll come with you. It was understandable, really especially as there was likely still someone else out there at the top of the chain. Stay behind me. I edged over to the living room window. Granger was sitting on the sofa with her mom. Anna was sitting at her grandma's feet. All of them were relaxed, chatting. Smiling even. I nodded to Maria. Gave her the thumbs up sign. Maria opened the door. We're home, she called out. I stepped in front of Maria. Anna charged into the hallway, brushed me aside, launched herself at her mom, hugged her tight. Maria's mom was close behind. The tears were embarrassing. I sidestepped Maria's mom. Congratulations, said Granger. How long have you been here? Just arrived. Bastards tied me up. Had to climb out the window. Yeah, I saw. 
Did you come straight here? No. I went back to the hangar. The container didn't arrive, but the gang returned. They're all in custody. No one is talking. All eleven regards to the artifact smuggling is the manifests and that statue of yours. At least the manifests give an idea as to how they're shipping them in, together with the drugs, and the stolen cars. Do you still have it, or did you have to use it for the exchange? I cleared my throat. Someone had tipped off the gang escorting the trailer, and that got me to thinking. If you were me, I'd have asked if whoever had kidnapped her had gotten clean away, or if we'd made a citizen's arrest, or if we'd taken him out. I have it hidden. Why? I'll need to take it in as evidence. Can't do that. I'll have to hand it over to the police in Fort Bragg. I'll need to add some authenticity to what I have to say as to how it's connected to the two homicides. Have you told Blake about where the exchange took place? No. Considering what the note said, I decided to give you a clear run at making the exchange. Did the kidnapper get away? Does it matter? Blake doesn't know about the kidnap exchange at the Fisher plant. She's safe. It's all over. You have your bust. Probably get your promotion now. There's no need for you to know. Besides, after my briefing at base, they'll likely send Blake all the details. They'll want to interview Maria, he said. She won't talk. I've told her not to say anything to anyone. The family walked back into the living room. I'll make everyone a coffee, Maria said. I'll come with you, I said. I followed her to the kitchen. Stopped off at Roberto's bedroom and stepped inside. He was fast asleep with a smile on his face. Angelic looking. I stroked his cheek and leaned down to give him a kiss on the top of his head, then tiptoed out of the room and into the kitchen. Maria turned to face me. Threw her arms around me and we locked our lips together. We broke apart. She slapped my face with such force it stung. Hey, what was that for? I asked her, then stroked my cheek. The kiss was for rescuing me. The slap was for putting my kids and my life in danger. Not to mention what Mom went through. I want you to tell me everything. The truth and nothing but the truth. You owe my family that. I will, but not yet. I'm going to get Granger away from here. I need you and all your family to get away for a few days, I said. Why? I have work. I rolled my eyes. Work? After what you've been through? She stood back. I'll get fired if I take time off. Then phone in sick. Do you have anywhere you can go? My mom's sister. But why? You said it was all over. Okay, the truth. It isn't over, but it will be within 24 hours. I'll explain after I've sent someone a message. I took out my satellite phone. Needed to buy more time and typed a message. Sorry. Delayed. Make it 0900 hours for the extraction. Send coordinates. The time on my watch clicked over to 0230 hours. A message arrived. Okay, it read, followed by the coordinates. So, is that it? Will I see you again? Maria asked. It was time to suck it up and tell the truth. Chapter 61 Maria carried the coffees through to the living room. I called out for Granger to join me in the kitchen. It was times like these that I wished I'd taken a degree in psychology. I wasn't sure how to play him. Listen, they need to get some sleep. You should go. I'll stay up all night and guard them, I said, and swung Betsy to my front, then stroked the stock a few times. Although thinking about it, there's no one left to cause them any danger, I added on the fly. Are you going to tell me who the kidnapper was? A retired CIA agent. When you say retired, I take it he's no longer around? He'd answered his own question. Looked as though it was a habit of his. True to form, I didn't answer him, only with a shrug of the shoulders. I'll be giving a full statement back at Fort Bragg. No doubt you'll get a copy to clear things up here like I said before, I said. So that's it? You're definitely going back to Fort Bragg? Yeah, I'm going back. I pulled out my map, spread it on the kitchen table, picked up my satellite phone and opened the last message. How are you getting there? 
I'm getting picked up from these coordinates, I said, then stabbed a finger at the position. That's in the middle of a field. Probably a chopper extraction, I said. What time? Nine. I'll get there at 8.45, just in case they have a headwind. So, I guess this is goodbye, he said. Guess so. Thanks for your help. You're welcome, I replied. While we're on amicable terms, I thought it was worth one last shot. I know everyone will probably be asleep right now, but could you try and get me some info before I go back? You can text me the results. Sure. The last thing I wanted him to think was that I didn't trust him. I relayed the details. I'll get going, he said, and we shook hands. I followed him to the door. Back in the living room, I walked over to Maria. Where's your mom? Tucking Anna into bed. Ever used a gun? Yeah. I handed her my Glock. Squeeze the trigger once to release the safety, then all the way to fire it if necessary. I'll be back soon. She didn't comment. She steadied the gun. Her eyes popped and her mouth gaped, which threw a question my way. Don't worry. Just a precaution. Do you have an overnight bag back at your apartment? Yeah, it's in the closet. Good. I'll get some of yours in the kids' clothes. Have your mom pack an overnight bag and be ready to leave when I get back. Lock everything down here. Don't answer the door, even to Granger. Only me. Change of plan. Forget your auntie. I'll book you all into a motel. I leaned over, kissed her on the cheek, then exited. On the drive over to the apartment, the assailant's car had gone. All there was where I'd parked it was glass in the road. They'd probably hotwired it and were long gone. There was no sign of them at the turning as I drove on into the apartment. The rope was still dangling from the window. As easy as it was rappelling down to the parking lot, I didn't care to try and get in that way. At the top of the stairway, the door was ajar. If anyone had reported them breaking the door down to the police, they would have at least had the door secured and taped. I slipped inside. Hauled up the rope. Closed the window, then turned on the light. The place was a mess. The punks had pulled everything out of the cupboards, probably looking for the statue. I packed a couple of bags of clothes, then lifted the clothes stand. Screwed back the barrel lock on the door with my penknife. It wasn't secure, but it was the best I could do. Foot down, it didn't take long to return to her mom's. Maria opened the door. Thank God you're back. My nerves are shot. Everything ready, I asked her. Yeah, she replied and looked nervous. Okay, let's go. Maria scuttled off, then returned carrying Roberto. Anna had lost coordination of her legs with tiredness. She stumbled out to the car with her grandma guiding her. Poor Anna was barely able to open her eyes. Following Maria's instructions, we arrived and pulled into the motel parking lot. I dug into my money belt and handed her some bills. Best you go in. I don't think they take kindly to me being weaponed up and wearing a vest. Maria returned with a key. We settled into the room. I hunkered down in an armchair. Closed my eyes. Tried to pull all the strings together of what had happened. Mo clearly had the knowledge to smuggle goods out of Iraq and Syria. He'd still have had his contacts from his days as a senior intelligence officer in Saddam's Ba'ath party. That would give him access to senior ISIS officials who were involved in monetizing stolen goods. Joe, the CIA guy had been instrumental in pulling Mo out of Iraq, so that gave them an initial connection. He would have been the go-between on the ground. The hostage money from Somalia would be his way of buying into the scheme. They were both motivated by greed, and in Joe's case, having a substantial retirement pot. Handbag had been the muscle behind Mo's distribution on home soil. He too suffered from greed, to the extent that he broke away from Mo, using goods he stole from him to set up his own operation. That would be enough for them to want to take Handbag and his crew out. To do that they needed a patsy. Someone to keep their hands clean. That patsy ended up as me. Joe had a connection to our team. He could have tried to turn Craig and Hank to take out Handbag. When that failed, he took them out, back at Fort Bragg. But then he said he took no part in their homicides. He obviously succeeded in recruiting Greg. 
In turn, Greg had drawn me into the web. The missing container and the second sniper scenario had me thinking that Granger was involved. The last man standing and no witnesses. Except he wasn't the last man standing. There was me. And I had the artifact. And I was alive to tell the tale. My eyelids felt heavy. Ted! Ted! Maria called out. I jumped up from the armchair. It's 7.15. You said to wake you. Just phone the diner. He said if I didn't turn up, I could forget it. Told me to find another job. Says I'm not due any payment for notice and vacation time. He did, did he? Look, I'm sorry, but you can't leave here. Not yet. You and the kids are still in danger. She dropped her backside onto the mattress. Held her head in her hands. I didn't think there was anything I could say to make things better. I'm going now. I'll call you when it's all clear. Picking up Betsy, I slung the strap over my shoulder. I couldn't look at her. I'd ruined her life. I stepped outside. Climbed into the car and drove away. It was time to settle this, one way or another. That is, unless the sniper was waiting at the extraction point. Chapter 62 I hadn't had a call from Granger. I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or not, I thought, as I pulled into the diner parking lot. I parked and climbed out of my seat. Stepping inside, I headed straight behind the counter. Picked up the baseball bat from the shelf. Walked into the kitchen. What the hell are you doing in here? The owner asked. I smacked the bat down on a tray of eggs. Come to give notice that Maria's leaving, I said, then swiped a tray of bacon onto the floor. You got a problem with that? Hell, no. She's fired anyways. Plenty more in the gutter where she came from. Now put the bat down, or I'll call the police. He'd stepped over the line with his remark. It took all my willpower not to set about him. You do that. Then instead of criminal damages, we can turn it into serious bodily harm before they get here. Or... Or what? Or you can work out what she's due for two weeks' notice, and four weeks' paid vacation, then I'll play nicely. In your dreams, soldier boy. You had your chance. I stepped toward him, and raised the bat. Crashed it down, crunching some spare ribs on the table. Wait, okay, okay. Back at the till, he scribbled out some calculations, then walked back into the kitchen. Emptied his wallet and handed me some bills with a wages chit. The cheapskate bent down, picking up some of the rashers of bacon, blowing off the dust, then tossed them back in the tray. Try contacting her, or the police, and I'll be back. Oh, and a word of advice. Try arranging transport, or giving your staff a ride home in future when they work the late shift, asshole. Walking past the fryer, I dumped the bat in the oil. It was too much to resist as he presented his butt, while still picking up rashers. A swift kick sent him sprawling on the floor, then I exited. Driving to the pickup point, my cell phone buzzed. Pulling up the message, it was from Granger. Much as I was pleased with the reply, it could have been bullcrap. Regardless, I pulled over. Typed out a message. Pressed send. If Granger needed the statue that badly, and me dead, he'd have to move fast before my transport arrived. Someone had to have tipped off whoever was still at the top of the crap heap for them to divert the container from the ambush. Granger was the only one I could think of, despite my thoughts moving in a different direction after the text message. The rest of the journey, I fixated on Craig's cryptic message. It was times like those I wish I'd gone to college. Okay, so the shrinks calculated that I had an IQ of 130, but it wasn't helping me. Then I had a flash of inspiration and I had it worked out. It was time to stop deliberating and to go with the flow. I pulled over and stopped half a mile from the pickup point. Out of the car, I lifted my ruck straps over my shoulders and set off humping over the fields. I kept to the tree line. Every now and then, I stopped and scanned the area with Betsy's scope until I arrived at a stone wall. I was on time with fifteen minutes to spare. No sign of Granger. The position was a kill zone from behind the wall. Out front it was 100 yards to where the chopper would land. That would give anyone hiding a clear shot. 
I took out my satellite phone. Check the coordinates. A message flashed on the screen. I have you in my sights. I'm coming over to your position. I rolled over. Didn't need the scope. I watched the familiar stature amble my way. Chopper will be here soon. Thought I'd drive over for debrief before it arrived, he said. More like you drove over to make sure I turned up. Your ass was on the line if I didn't. Very wise of you. You needn't have bothered. As you can see, I'm here, I said. So what's happened? Any insights to the homicides back at base? Lone Wolf asked. You really want to know? Not really. You can save it for the police. Let's have a look at that statue that caused all the problems. I don't have it. What? Where is it? Safe. I'm hardly going to hand it over to a homicidal maniac, am I? I'm guessing you took the shot that took out Joe last night, I said, pointing the barrel of Betsy at him. You're talking crap. Put the rifle down, he said as if it was an order. No, it's you who's talking crap. There was no change in his straight-faced demeanor considering the accusation. So go on then. What makes you think it was me? Took some working out. Can't say I'm one for crosswords, but I got there in the end. Craig left a cryptic clue, remember. Worked up the second part. Oil rags to riches. That would be Isis. Oil rags is our pet name for the terrorists. Barter Kings was your CIA buddy bartering with Isis for the artifacts. He used the hostage money to buy blood diamonds, then traded them for the artifacts. But then you already know that. It was the Alphelon that dumbfounded me for a while. You always boasted that you were a sniper in the Rangers. That got me to thinking, I said. So, what does that prove, he said. Ability. That's all. Then there's the connection to Joe. You never said you were with him in the Rangers before you went your separate ways. Only found that out half an hour ago. Then there's your satellite phone. It'll have your movements marked as being here all along. That's how you probably followed my movements. I had you checked out. You're supposed to be on vacation. So I'm guessing you had the hangars bugged. Likely you diverted the container full of artifacts when you heard about the ambush. What I don't get is why you need the statue, I said. I don't need it. So what now? Well, if you don't need it, it's me you really wanted, dead. No loose ends that you wish you'd taken me out back at Leroy's house. What I want to know is why you killed Hank and Craig. There's no one here. You can tell me. Who will believe me, an escaped suspect, I said. Guess you're right. Yeah, I killed them. Can't believe Greg missed the shot to take you out at Leroy's house. So you killed Greg too. But why, I asked him. Why, you ask. Ever wondered how much they'd pay contractors to plan and carry out missions like ours off the books on Dark Ops? Not really. I'm happy with what Uncle Sam pays me. Hell, I'd do it for nothing. He shook his head. I used to think that. I'll tell you what they'd get. One million each, two million, maybe more. That's a lot of bread for the time I've been at Sockham and the missions I've taken part in or planned. And what do I get? A letter saying they want to put me out to pasture after all I've done. Pushing a pen to my retirement. For what? Putting my ass on the line more times than I can recall. Anyways, none of that matters now. You still haven't told me the significance of all felon, have you? He said. Simple if you stare at it long enough. All felon is an anagram for lone wolf. The wise one is the unit used to call you. Get it? Wise is an owl. Only you weren't so wise this time. Thought you could turn their loyalty to the flag for money, but you were wrong. And there's me always thinking you had crap for brains. Surprised you worked it all out. He bent over and snickered. I didn't see it coming as he straightened up. His boot smashed into Betsy's barrel. Carrying the weight of the ruck, I lost balance. Staggered back against the wall. He screamed through gritted teeth as he came into close quarters. We're about to find out what it means, he said, snarling the words, then growled. His knee landed in my privates. Pounded my head with a headbutt, both of us wrestling for control of Betsy. 
The weight of my rucksack was too much of a burden, and twisting the rifle in a sweep with his boot on my ankle, he had me down. I dropped the mag. Let go of Betsy and rolled, slipping out of the straps in the time it took for him to pull the trigger and realize his mistake. He charged again, this time ready to smash the butt of the rifle in my face. Grabbing a hold of Betsy, I pulled him onto me as he charged, his momentum taking us to the ground. Lifting a foot to his gut, I launched him over my head, his momentum carrying him onward, his head smashing into the wall. Roberto would have been proud of that move. I reached for my Glock only to find an empty holster, so I drew my knife, and cursed inside that I'd left my pistol with Maria. He was struggling to locate his gun. I kicked out, sending it flying as he withdrew it from its holster. Two hands on the handle of the knife, I lunged on top of him. The knife embedded in the soil as he rolled out of the way and drew his own knife. He sprang to his feet. Rising to my feet likewise, we circled. I'm guessing there's no chopper, I said. Guess that right. Only one of us is leaving. A voice boomed out. That's enough of that. Both of you, drop your weapons, Granger called out swinging the aim of his service pistol from one to the other. What is it you were saying before we were interrupted, Lone Wolf said. Death before dishonor, he said tossing his knife to one side, then went down on one knee. Lone Wolf was fast. Too fast for Granger. He rolled, picked up his gun, rammed the barrel into his mouth, and then, bang. I shook my head as Lone Wolf's body crumpled lifeless to the grass. You took your time, I said. Oh, I was there behind the wall all the time. Thought you were doing just fine. Couldn't hear all of what was said, though. I tugged at the GoPro mini camera on my vest. Tossed it to Granger. Guess I won't be going back to Fort Bragg today. It's all on there. There's someone I need to say my goodbyes to properly. I'll let you contact the authorities in Fort Bragg to explain. Does that mean I'll get to know your real name? Just tell them Red Dog One is helping with inquiries. They'll know who I am. That's all you need to know. Epilogue Six months later Somewhere on the Afghanistan and Pakistan border The mosquitoes were out in force. No amount of slathering repellent on our arms and necks could keep the damn things from drawing blood. If it wasn't them, it was the leeches we'd picked up from wading through the swollen streams to our position. The heat was intense, made worse by the sheet rain thundering down on our position during their rainy season. No one in their right mind would attack us in that weather, never mind our enemy thinking we'd attack. More fool them. That was the plan. The days hold up their waiting could pay off. Luck didn't come into it. We knew exactly what we were doing. That's not saying something couldn't go wrong. That's the buzz. The unexpected only heightened the high. That kept the adrenaline bubbling. Who dares wins, as the Brits' special forces say. The senior Al-Qaeda dude we had as a target was camped with local natives. They were 100 yards away in a gully. It was times like this that I wondered if maybe I should have accepted the commission to take over Lone Wolf's command. Somehow, sitting on my ass, watching the screens from the satellite camera feed, and fretting over something going wrong, didn't seem like a great career move. I think my head would have exploded along with my ass if I was powerless to act to save the situation from behind a desk. That killed the idea. It's not who I am. I know that now. Not got a clue what happened back in Detroit. The news media went absent without leave on the reporting. At the time, a real attorney said to keep it buttoned and to leave it to the agencies to work out. I did hear that Granger made detective. He told me before I left Detroit that they found a container in Monroe at a service area, hidden around back. No one ever asked about the statue again since the day that Lone Wolf did everyone a favor. I have it on the nightstand at my apartment. I figured that as much as a curse as it was for some, it had protected me. I guess I'll hand it over at some time, maybe. But then I always bring back a trophy for missions. Like some serial killer, I guess. Never bargained on gaining a family, though. Maria, she's fine. Living with her mother and the kids back in Fort Bragg. She's working in a local hospital. Managed to break into the medical department and whittle down the job applications for a trauma nurse. As for us, we didn't have a future. 
But then deep down Maria knew that from what I'd said before I left, despite the candle burning. I can still see it in her eyes when we meet. No doubt she can sense it in mine. Those are the only times I'm reminded of Lone Wolf, when he'd said, You don't mess with a brother's woman. That's what the Latin under our insignia means. She's engaged to a sergeant now. Good guy. Works behind a desk. She deserves the stability of a good man. I'm just happy to be a friend. Part of the family, but no third will to her and her guy. Uncle Ted to Anna and Roberto. They both think I'm some kind of superhero. Especially Roberto when I take him fishing. Well, not exactly all fishing. We throw in a little tree climbing. Not too high, though. God help Anna when she's old enough to start dating. I'll probably scare her suitors to death. My comms earpiece crackled. Red dog one. Target's on the move. Heading your way to the kill zone, over, I heard over the comms from red dog too. Copy that. I pulled Betsy from under my cape. Lined up the pathway with my scope. It was time to make the kill. Listen, sorry, but you'll have to excuse me. You don't need to know what happens next. Things to do. Talk later. Dear listener, if you've enjoyed the story as much as the author enjoyed writing it, don't forget to like and to subscribe to the channel, on which you'll find many more free original story audiobooks from Declan Connor. Better still, set up notifications to be advised of new story uploads.